Hello, my name is Charles Hart. And on behalf of UCSF and the UCSF Catalyst Program, I wanna welcome you to the Rare Disease Symposium today that we are hosting with the Foundation Ipsen. We thank you very much for joining. The Catalyst Program is UCSF's translational accelerator. We help uh, advance UCSF discoveries with the potential for commercialization and patient benefit. Catalyst is in the Innovation Ventures Group, which also includes our Tech Transfer Office, our Industry Alliances Office, uh, entrepreneurship programs, and a venture philanthropy fund. Over 7,000 rare diseases have been described and they affect over 350 million people around um, the world. And today's symposium is touching on the medical and the scientific and the social advances that have been made in rare diseases and a particular focus on new therapeutics, new diagnostics, and new advances for patients and their families and caregivers dealing with rare disease. This symposium is actually a reprise of one that the Catalyst Program um, hosted five years ago, exactly. And um, Dr. Emil Kakas, who's speaking today, also spoke at our symposium five years ago. We we're hoping for a lot of discussion and questions and answers today. So please take advantage of the Q&A button on the Zoom to ask any questions or make any comments. All the speakers have carved out time in their presentation for um, discussion. I especially wanna thank Rupa and Jenny and Nate of the Catalyst Program. You'll be meeting them later. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Levine, who's the president of Foundation Ipsen, who is co-hosting today's symposium. So thank you, Jim. Thanks, Charles. Uh, welcome to absolutely everybody around the world on behalf of Foundation Ipsen. Um, and this is a tremendous pleasure and honor for those of us working in rare disease. Dr. Irv is a leader. She's a heroic advocate for patient and an innovator. Dr. Irv is the program director for the Rare Diseases Clinical Research Network a multidisciplinary international program in the Office of Rare Diseases Research at NIH. Prior to coming to NIH, Dr. Irv worked with children experiencing a variety of intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. Her research career extensive focused on the behavioral aspects of aging and Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome and developmental disabilities. It is a tremendous privilege and pleasure to invite Dr. Irv to step onto the UCSF international stage. Her opening address is Rare Disease Therapeutics, Soup to Nuts. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And, um, as you pointed out that this is an international group that's listening, um, I will share a funny anecdote that I just had earlier when I was speaking to a colleague who's from New Zealand who said, Tina, what is soup to nuts? And that is just an American phrase for the beginning of the meal. You start with soup and you have all the courses and the last thing that they give you is nuts. So what I'm gonna cover today is a lot about rare disease from the beginning of the, the process of getting diagnosed to getting a treatment. So thank you very much. So imagine an illness that affects 30 million Americans. That's as many people as there are in the US that have diabetes. That's more than have cancer or HIV or Alzheimer's and actually, it's more than have cancer, HIV, and Alzheimer's added together. We're talking about rare diseases. There are 30 million people in the US with one of 7,000 diseases. That's one in 10 Americans. So if you know 10 people, one of these people is likely to have a rare disease. Half of the rare diseases, half of the 30 million people are children and most rare diseases are serious, life-threatening, and 95% have no treatment or cure. 
Becoming an individual with a diagnosis of rare disease is an ordeal in and of itself. Doctors are often taught, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras. The rare disease patients think of themselves as zebras and want people to be thinking zebra. The National Organization of Rare, Dis rare Disorders, NORD, reports that about one in 13 people are currently living with an undiagnosed condition and it usually takes five years or longer for someone with a suspected rare disease to receive a correct diagnosis with patient visiting numerous physicians along the way. The diagnostic odyssey is very real and it's prolonged and it results oftentimes in irreversible complications of the disorder. It is difficult to find a rare disease patient within a healthcare system since the majority of rare diseases lack specific diagnostic code. Incidence and prevalence rates for many rare diseases is just often a guessing game. The direct medical costs of rare diseases are very high. It's been reported to be three to five times higher than in individuals without rare disease. So I was part of an HHS project with my colleague Ann Pariser. We interviewed various people who worked in the field that were in some way involved with rare disease treatment development. And I'm speaking of a wide variety of people. So if you look at these people listed, we talked to people at FDA, parents, patients, advocates. Um, you know, we, we talked to investors and economists and entrepreneurs, hospital administrators, payers. And we interviewed these people. And what we found was that they all, ex they all have wanted the same thing. They all wanted people with rare diseases to, to have a treatment, but they all had their own priorities, they had their own responsibilities, and they had their obligations to other people. And what we found was it was like they were speaking a different language, but they all wanted the same thing, and we, we found that to be very important. So what we did was we, we got the impressions from these various people, and we mapped out where the challenges that were described and we had a little bit of fun doing this. You'll see some dragons out in the water and some cliffs um, that are very scary. But um, people talked about silos. They talked about data, data silos. They talked about disease silos. But it was very much more complicated than just silos. It was more like all these different groups were on islands unto themselves. They described great work that were happening on the islands, but they didn't talk about communication and transit between the islands themselves, which we found to be a major problem. Interestingly, when they described a positive situation, it almost always related to strong communication and collaboration across an island. For example, we spoke to a colleague, an academic individual who was developing a treatment, but they had no experience working with industry. And they said how they got that drug into an IND enabling situation was, they found a colleague who had worked in industry in the past who could give them advice as to what, what to have in place before they even approach the FDA. So how is this rare disease world different than the world where drugs are developed for common diseases? The major difference is that for common diseases, the bridges and the majority of the infrastructure have largely been built. The people doing the common disease development are mainly large pharma companies and have well-established routes and know how to navigate. Whereas the rare disease world, we're often the trailblazers. So if this map seems a little familiar, it's very similar to this translational science um, medallion, as I call it, that comes from, the, um, from NCATS, where I work, uh, where you really look at the basic science, the preclinical science, the clinical research, clinical implementation, and public health. And, and what's important are these lines in between are just as important as the individual circles themselves. So what is it that we need to do? We need to start developing bridges. We need to establish routes of communication that are regular. And we need translators, especially across the over to the regulatory realm. What was interesting when I was working with Ann Perry, had spent 16 years working at the FDA, whereas I had spent at that time about 12 years 
working at the NIH. And I kept saying, well, the challenges are on the left side of the map. And Anne kept saying, no, it's the right side. It's the regulatory side. That's where all the challenges are. So everyone has a different vision, but what we all need to do is come together. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of the challenges we face in rare disease. One current estimate is it takes 10 to 15 years to get a drug to market. It can cost $2.6 billion to develop a drug from initial discovery to completion and less than 12% of drugs are approved once they've entered development. And you know, the issue is we're too, things move too slowly, it's too expensive, and we're just not ready for the trial sometimes. So what do we need to do? We need to work faster. We need to work in a, in a more cost-effective manner. And we need to produce high-quality data. And data was one thing that we heard from most of the people that we talked to, is that the quality of the data that people develop in going into a clinical trial um, is not high quality or is not um, developed in a manner that's easy to, for, for other people to reuse. So instead of just giving you the hard parts of things, I, I will give some suggestions as well. So another issue, another challenge is, is risk. And we need to lessen the risk of drug development. And so remember only 5% of rare diseases have FDA approved treatments. And how can we be ready for that? We need to be prepared. And one of the focuses we have in the Office of Rare Disease Research right now is clinical trial readiness. And what do we mean by that? It's understanding who we're going to treat, who, who's the most appropriate patient to have in a trial? When is the best time to treat that patient? Where are the, where are the experts and where are the patients? So if we do set up a trial, it can run effectively. What is the best of potential treatment and what is the desired outcome? And why, why is this the way to go forward? Show us the data, we need to know. And how should the trial be conducted? Some of the strategies we have for moving faster are having established networks with clinical researchers and patient advocacy groups in place and natural history studies that have outcome measures. So when it's time to go to a clinical trial, you have the outcome measure you need. You have a biomarker and you have common data elements that can be used. So it's not that you're scrambling at the time a treatment is being developed to develop these other tools. They should be, they should be developed in parallel to developing potential drugs. So what we have at NCATS is the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. It was established by the Rare Disease Act of 2002. And the, by the end of this current cycle, we will we'll have 20 years of funding and we will have supported over 33 different consortia studying a variety of rare diseases. And I'll make these slides available in case anybody wants to see the list. Right now we have 20 consortia, 20 different consortia, and they are funded by 10 different NIH institutes. We have 166 patient advocacy groups working with the consortia. Each consortia needs to study three or more disorders, and that's something that I can't emphasize enough. We can't, we don't have the time or the money to go one disease at a time. It's important to, to try to find ways, look for commonalities, to work on multiple disorders together. You have to have multiple sites. You need to, they have three or more clinical trials. They have a career enhancement core. They work collaboratively with our data management and coordinating center, and they're fully integrated with the patient advocacy groups. And so what we're trying to do is turn many consortia into a research community. So the patient advocacy groups who work with us are learning and sharing across rare diseases from each other. Because many of the issues and challenges we face are the same. It doesn't matter what rare disease you're looking at. It's hard to recruit patients. It's hard for the families to find treatment. Um, so, so work on those commonalities together is something we recommend. Um, we really emphasize data standards and clinical trial readiness.
So the sites what we have right now, we currently have 358 active sites, 197 are unique, and we're co-located with the NCAT CTSA program. We're in a variety of countries. And as I, when I say we're, we're, we have a difference in number of, of active sites and unique sites, um, uh, my best example is you see University of California, San Francisco, where we have five of our consortia have sites. And Dr. Jennifer Puck and Dr. Helen Kim have led these wonderful consortia that have had great findings and are really leaders in the network. We also have three consortia that have clinical sites that are here that are also gathering their data from this site. So hats off to, to your, your faculty here. Um, so let's look at some of the strategies we have for, for working in a cheaper or, or more cost-effective manner. And what we look at a lot is economies of scale, having shared work environment, shared tools, or innovative models for trials like basket trials and umbrella trials. What we're doing in the RDCRN right now is we have all of the different 20 consortia have their data in the RDCRN's operational environment. And what we're doing is we're providing a variety of tools that are necessary across the different research consortia, uh, such as Ombra or um, Box, RedCap, Twilio, and NCATS provides all of the licenses. So each individual consortia doesn't have to buy individual licenses. The licenses and the ability to use these tools are all in a single environment. And it's more cost effective to get licenses for software in, in such a manner, and they can share data and a variety of things. We're also going to have a same type of model for the RDCRN data repository, which will be where the data will be shared because it's very important for the rare disease data to be available to the community. Um, other models that we have right now are the PAVE GP program, which is an NCATS led platform vector gene therapy program. It's a pilot project that seeks to increase the efficiency in clinical trial startup by using the same gene delivery system and manufacturing methods for multiple rare disease gene therapies. So again, you're, you're looking at multiple disorders at a time. PAVE GP will make program results and regulatory documents publicly available with the intention of benefiting future gene therapy and clinical trials for very rare diseases. And again, it's multiple diseases at a time and that sharing that is very important. Another pro project that is happening right now is a bespoke gene therapy consortium. And this is part of the Accelerating Medicines Partnership Program. And it's a public-private partnership between the National Institutes of Health, the US FDA, um, the and multiple public and private organizations. And it's managed through the foundation for the NIH, which is FNIH. This program aims to improve our understanding of therapeutically relevant biological pathways and validate information that could be relevant for the development of multiple therapeutics. It aims to develop platforms and standards that will speed the development and delivery of customized or bespoke gene therapies that could treat millions of people affected by rare disease. And this was launched in October, 2021. So that's a, a very exciting initiative. Um, some strategies. So I can't emphasize data standards and scientific rigor enough. Um, that is really where the focus is. And as many of you know, um, the NIH is establishing new NIH data sharing and data management policy. So it's important to remember the management part of it. So the NIH expects that data be made widely and freely available as possible while safeguarding the privacy and participants and protecting confidential and proprietary data. So this is new starting in um, 2023, actually. This, I think I might have pulled up the wrong data. So um, the data sharing in the, um, NIH is having the, the FAIR principles, which is the data needs to be findable, accessible, 
and reusable. And so those are the things that we've been focusing on a lot. I'm sorry about the, the wrong slide here. And um, I thank you for your time and I'm open for any questions you may have. Tina? Yes. Hi, this is Jane. Hi. Absolutely huge thank you. That was a, a fantastic, I'm just switching on my video, absolutely wonderful talk. We actually have sort of a whole load of questions coming in. So I apologize to those who've sent them if we don't get to your question, but let me start without any uh, ceremony um, getting to these. I, I think they're actually sort of quite, quite uh, interesting and relevant. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I, we will not be able to get to all the questions. Okay, so the first question in no particular. Um, James, if you if you want to send them to me, also if we don't get to them all, I'll I will answer do. them and send lovely. them to you, and you can. I mean, I mean, I think the first thing again, by the way, is people, I, myself included, would absolutely love if you're comfortable sharing your slide deck. I think I I, I was quite mesmerized. So if if you're comfortable with that, we we we. That would be fantastic. But let me get absolutely, to and I'll and I'll fix that last slide. Which <laughs> 20, 2003. It's like no, it's supposed to be twenty twenty three. Well, well, none <laughs> of us would have commented, Tina. So thank you for pointing that out. So okay, Too so let polite. me jump right in here. Let me jump right in here. All right. So the first question is, I think, is 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 probably on the tip of many people's tongues. Is how directly integrated with the FDA are you in in this incredible transdisciplinary program? Are they are they listening or are they receptors? They are very much listening. And actually into the chat box later, I'll put what we are having is on May 16th and 17th, we have a, a meeting that was co-planned by the FDA and NCAT's Office of Rare Disease, specifically for academic investigators mm. and the challenges they face and how they're different. And a lot of the questions that, that we have and they're presenting are ones that you know I share. Um, I, I listen in on 20 consortia calls a month and I listen to what the challenges and what problems people are having. And we have regular calls with, you know, at least several times a month, we have calls with the FDA partners in their rare disease area. And we share back and forth what the challenges are. And they're very interested in hearing you know, what the challenges the academic investigators are having or, you know, what they don't understand or what they need that extra help with. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do with them is develop some of those bridges that we talked about related to communication. So there is there's regular communication between us. I mean, actually, along the theme of bridges, let me come straight to the next question then, because I think this is I find this absolutely fascinating and important. How close I think it, uh, the question is really, how close is the NIH to listening to the voices of real patients and their problems? I, I would like to think we have hundreds, uh, I can speak from my experience. Mm. So in the Office of Rare Disease, we are often on calls with patient advocacy group. If somebody calls us, we talk to them. If they write to us, we write back, you know, we, we talk to them. But for the RDCRN, how that consortium or how that network is set up. When I say that the patient advocacy groups are part of the network, they don't just write a letter when you write the grant and send it in mm. and say, yes, I support this. I think it's a great idea. They have their own steering committee. They have representatives who sit in on the principal investigator steering committee. We have lots of work groups and there's there's representation from the patient advocacy groups on every group that we have working. So we're, you know, they're, they're partners, they're, they're part of it. We don't see them as any different than anyone else. So I think that might be a little bit different than how it's been in the past. Yeah, I mean, it sounds, it sounds absolutely fantastic. I've got my own burning questions on this, but I'm not going to, uh, let me say, I don't want to get through as many of these as I can. Several sure. questions speak to geography. And I'm going to bunch these together. And the first one, which I think is, I, I personally think is also very important, is if rare diseases are so common, for, for example, in the United States and, and Europe, there must be a, a 
quote unquote, huge pool of undiagnosed patients across Africa. A, part A is what, obviously this isn't the, within the scope of NIH per se, but, but, what, but where, where are you in terms of advancing diagnostics in Africa? And B is how are new therapies going to be integrated in those patients so identified? I, I think there should be opportunities for everyone. I think one of the challenges in some countries, um, I used to work in the area of newborn screening quite a bit, so I'll take mm -hmm. my example from that, that if you have a country where people are dying from a lot of infectious diseases, that's going to be that country's primary concern and their greatest worry and their biggest effort is going to, to save lives in that way. Um, it can be challenging to, to test a child for a rare disease, say, for example, PKU. Um, it, it's not just testing and identifying the individual, but you want, you want them to get the treatment. You want that equity of, you know, yes, you're diagnosed, but you should, everyone should have that fair chance to treatment. And it, it's, it's also a challenge in the U.S. as well. And you, you might be identified as having having a, a rare disease, but does everyone really have the same chance at the same treatment that everyone else has? So I think that's an international problem. I, I think it's bigger issue in, in other countries, but it, it's an issue. And, and I think everyone's doing what they so, so, can. So your, so your answer is superb. And, and again, just because we're so limited on time, sure. I, I had a very similar question about Mexico. So I think your map perhaps showed very little activity there, but may I please assume just for time that you have a similar answer in that with respect to Mexico, unless there are specific programs? Um, I, I think that the map I showed right now showed groups that were related to our consortium. Mm -hmm. Our consortium are very open to partnering pe with people around the world. Mm -hmm. And if there are doctors, physicians, rare disease groups that are interesting in partnering, they can reach out to our consortium and become part of this network in mm -hmm. a sense. Um, so, so quickly, on the same theme, and then we come to something else. Um, there is, and, and this is wearing my uh, European hat, there is tremendous relationship between your, your organizations and the European Union and organizations like Eurodis, Rare Disease International, and so on. Would you perhaps please speak to, to that just to educate this international audience? I do not sit on those, those panels, but I knew, know that there's a huge representation from the NIH that participate. Um, one of the groups I worked in on at NIH is the Undiagnosed Disease Network, and I've gone to, I've participated in the Undiagnosed Disease International meetings and group mm -hmm. activities. But there, uh, there's large representation of the US almost to the point that people are like, oh, there are too many people from the NIH already. We don't need any more. But the, a lot of back and forth, a lot of committee work, a lot of discussions of how to have data standards, how to share data, how to have information flow freely back and forth. So, so, so th thank you so much for that. And now, and now to really uh, the issue that we're seeing the greatest traffic on, namely uh, underserved communities. Um, I, I think, I think, I'm sure you can inf inform all of us much more than than the person sending me this question. But it, but along the lines of um, how do we approach the poverty gap um, in the United States? First of all, second of all, how do we address issues in underserved communities? Are there is there um, equal engagement to clinical trials in the Native American community, which I think is a particularly interesting question. Right. Um, and um, I've got another question on clinical trials right in front of me, but, but let's start there. Speak to please the, I know, unlimited efforts you put into underserved communities in the United States and then into, into, in, into, into the, different communities in the United States, such as Native American community, the Latino community, and so on. Thank you. 
Um, one thing I will hop on really quickly is the Native American community Please. and Jennifer Puck, who's at UCSF, has worked extensively with the Navajo Nation um, with primary immune deficiencies. So she she is a wealth of information on on how she approached and how she worked with the community. Um, I, I think the same is to be said for, for other communities um, within the Native American group. I think that there is a huge effort going on right now, well, across the country, uh, across the NIH and across our consortium, the network that I'm in, of, of how can we reach out, how can we have better equity and of, of not just participating in a trial, but getting your treatment, getting your medication. One of the, one of the challenges is always that the uh, clinical trials are at big university hospitals. You know, you're, it's great if you live in Boston or San Francisco or New York City, you have those opportunities to get that expertise. But how can we build roads and bridges to allow that expertise to move to other parts of the country. And I think the Undiagnosed Disease Network was a program that started and has been trying to do that. Um, I think that the NCATS has a Center for a CTSA program, the Center for Translational Science Awards program, where each of these centers has to have a community outreach program. And I think there just needs to be more effort and more energy put into those areas. But also, you, you, you can't tell a group of people to come and, and, and be part of your science. Come be part of our science. What we're doing is good for you. You have to build relationships. You have to develop trust. You know, who, who's going to put their kid into a clinical trial if you don't trust the people who are doing it to understand and respect your your culture and your community. So there's there's a lot of building that needs to be going on, a good foundation, which is more social than it is scientific. Mm. But if you don't do that, you're never going to be able to build the science on top of it. And that that's my personal opinion. So I mean it, it links directly to to another question we had about access to diagnosis, um, quote unquote, um, a, a problem um, we see, I don't know what this is, it's in the United States, the problem we see is the issue of uh, patients going to doctors who will, not, who will not conduct the DNA sequencing testing. If you conduct the test, you have to provide the treatment. Health insurance packages don't necessarily cover this and so on. Could you talk to some of those barriers to diagnosis in, the health, in this space? Uh, I think you're going to have Stephen Kingsmore uh, talking a while, in a little while, and Stephen, Stephen can speak to that really well. Part of it is, um, I, I think we need to get everyone onto the same page um, in that the science is moving forward, the cost for whole genome sequencing is becoming less, mm -hmm. it should become more of the norm rather than a special test. I think that's where like I had that whole long list of different people that you need to talk to. Agreed. It's, you can't have just the doctors say, this is how it should be. And the payers just saying no. It's you have to have everybody at a table and, and bringing up, this is what we need and this is why we need it. And then the other group saying, well, you know, we would love to do this, except this is how it will impact payers, or this is how it will impact um, the hospital, or this is how it's going to impact this other part of, of the translational process that gets the medication to where it needs to, to the patients. But until, if you just have the patients and the doctors talking, it's not going to happen. You need to get all the players around the table together, working together to implement change. Mm. Uh, speaking about getting the players around tables, um, the one of the, the, the most frequent, again, a lot of people have basically the same question, which is when are we going to build the sort of the international data sharing services that includes phenotype, um, genotype, um, and also uh, sociological characteristics relevant to treatment. So in other words, will, will can you foresee 
a true international integration of the, of the relevant data, the phenotypic data, and therefore ultimately therapeutic options. We had a meeting last year, last June, about gene targeted therapies, equity, and, and early delivery of these treatments. And we had experts from various different areas come together. And every working group we had, the recommendation they had at the end of the day was, we need a centralized data place because this is the most important aspect of it. And I, I think this is something that people need to continue calling for. So I don't know that the NIH is going to just build it and say, oh, here you go, this is what we need. It's you need people from both sides of the pond and you know from different hemispheres than we're in to come together and agree upon different ways of working together. And I, I think that's the, ch it's almost a social part of it is a challenge. People think it's a great idea, but making it happen and bringing the right players together is, is what the challenge is. And the data doesn't all have to sit in one place. The data just needs to be interoperable. Mm -hmm. You need to have it in, in good shape. And that's one of the reasons we really are emphasizing good quality data and metadata and data standards and common data elements and such. So you can bring together what you need to bring together. Well, if there's ever a, a great way to end a great talk, that was it, a grand challenge to all of us. <laughs> So a massive thank you on behalf of the entire rare disease community and all, and all of us watching you today. A massive thank you. And on that note, uh, more power to you, first of all. And second of all, now I'll hand over to Charles. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Jim. And thanks, Tina, as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rupa Ramamurthy, who's the Senior Associate Director of both the Catalyst Program at UCSF and as well the Innovation Ventures Philanthropy Fund um, that I mentioned. Rupa holds a, a PhD in Caltech in bioengineering and did postdocs at both University of Washington uh, and at MIT. And she holds both a project management and a patent agent certification. And when she was working, Rupa spent many years at Bayer doing um, biologics, drug discovery. And then right before she was at UCSF, she worked for the WIPO um, Research Consortium where she worked on rare diseases and neglected diseases uh, around the world. And Rupa has been at UCSF for the past uh, six plus years. And so it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague Rupa. So take it away, Rupa. Uh, thank you, Charles. And it is my great pleasure to- You're muted, Rup. Oh, I'm not. Is there a problem? No, you're okay. Okay. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Julie Saba. Uh, Dr. Saba has both an MD and a PhD, is a pediatric oncologist, and is the professor of pediatrics at UCSF and holds the John and Edna Beck chair of cancer research. Uh, currently, her focus is on this ultra rare disease that affects children. It's splice or sphingosine phosphate lyase insufficiency syndrome. And it's been my great pleasure interacting with her over Catalyst. And we both discovered that we are both published poets. So take it away, Julie. And it follows nicely with Tina's talk because of the gene therapy and the AAV platform. So Julie. Yours. Thank you so much, Rupa, for the kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for uh, allowing me to share my work today in this symposium. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I am going to share my slides and um, just put them into presentation mode. Hopefully, you can all see this. I'm going to be talking about an enzyme you've probably never heard about called sphingosine phosphate lyase. And I'll be talk, uh, call it different names, the lyase, S1P lyase, and SPL, but it's all the same thing. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking about the gene discovery, um, the gene encoding this enzyme, um, all the way to uh, our ongoing efforts to develop gene therapy for a rare disease called SPLIS uh, that is um, caused by mutations in the human gene encoding this enzyme. 
Um, this work was pioneered by uh, a wonderful scientist named Piming Zhao. Uh, Piming was a former postdoctoral fellow in my lab. He's now moved on to China where he's co-founded a company, a new company focused on gene therapy uh, for rare diseases, and I'm very proud of him. He conducted his work um, with the help of a very talented veterinarian named Gazachu Tasu, who is still part of our group. And I'm also going to be sharing some information about a patient with SPLIS uh, that um, was brought to my attention by Dr. Edisham Khalid, whose presentation will follow mine. Um, but I want to just mention that um, this work is inspired and um, made purposeful um, by uh, individuals with this disease, SPLIS. And uh, I'm showing a picture of a young man named Chase who uh, has this condition. Uh, and he inspires me every day, uh, despite the kind of obstacles that he faces day to day in his life with contractures of his hands and being in a wheelchair. Um, he nonetheless has an incredible optimistic attitude um, and, and really um, is in uh, top of mind as I do my work. I have one disclosure to mention. And um, I thought that I would share a little bit about my own personal career journey, uh, because this is really the opposite of where I thought I would be in my life. This is a picture of me uh, in my laboratory as I started my independent career at Children's Hospital Oakland, which is now part of UCSF. Uh, I'm 36 years old here. Um, after many years of education, I'm starting my career surrounded by uh, test tubes and bottles filled with noxious materials and um, doing yeast genetics, a place that I never thought I would be. And there's a little backstory there. The reason that I never thought that I would be a scientist is I knew science fairly well. Um, I had a father who had an MD, PhD, and actually surprisingly or coincidentally was studying uh, rare diseases of muscle, skeletal muscle. Um, and my dad, this is a picture of my dad surrounded by the, the, the tools and the instruments that he loved to operate in his lab. Uh, and I was encouraged by my father to spend time in his lab in the summers to learn a little bit about science, um, both to inspire me and, uh, and to give me a skill that I could use uh, in summer jobs to help pay for school. Um, but my dad's lab was built during the Cold War. It was built uh, during, in, and it is in the, really the heart of Washington, D.C., and it was built to withstand a direct nuclear hit, um, kind of reminiscent of days to, that we're dealing with right now. Um, but this building had no windows. It was made of concrete, and it was very oppressive, and there were smells and sounds that really did not call me to the field of science. Uh, and despite my dad's passion for his work um, and his efforts to inspire me into research, um, I was not um, enthralled by the field of science. Um, I did, however, want to become a physician. I, I had the idea of um, being a physician and, and helping people, and I went to medical school, and I actually intended to spend my career working on a Navajo reservation where I had spent time as a medical student. It's interesting that this was this topic was brought up earlier today. Uh, and that was my plan. And I uh, started my residency at Duke. And um, that was my intention until accidentally I fell in love with little girls and little boys like this with bald heads, little children who were fighting leukemia and, and other forms of cancer. And I decided I uh, just just it was a very amazing field. It was changing rapidly because of understanding the genetics of, of the disease and uh, offering of new treatments uh, that came, became possible through clinical trials. Um, but I still didn't wanna work in a laboratory, which is part of oncology training uh, until, uh, until I experienced the death of several of my patients. And at that point, I had an epiphany that um, made me understand something that probably most everybody else knew at the time, which is that until we understood the genetic underpinnings of every child's cancer, we would not be able to offer personalized treatment uh, that is safe 
and effective for every child with cancer. And upon that realization, I realized that I needed to do research and I needed to be in a laboratory and I needed to get a PhD to equip me for a life in research to understand the genetics of cancer. So this is a picture of me uh, in my laboratory um, as I was getting started. Uh, and I'm actually showing cancer cells to a famous uh, actress, Juliette Binoche, who visited my laboratory some years ago. Now I uh, was looking for new pathways that could be involved in cancer. And I uh, decided to study a family of lipids called sphingolipids. They're an obscure family of lipids, but they control cell growth and I theorized that these lipids might be involved in cancer. And um, because many of the genes that control cell growth are uh, highly conserved in humans and mice and organisms as simple as yeast, I decided to use a yeast genetic approach to identify genes in this pathway with the theory that genes controlling these lipids could be involved in cancer as well. And I won't go into the details of this strategy, but I ended up using a yeast genetic approach to identify a gene in the pathway. And that gene was sphingosine phosphate lyase, the enzyme I'm gonna tell you about today. And I identified the yeast gene. And from that, I was able to find the gene, the similar gene from fruit flies and C. elegans, worms, mouse, and eventually the gene in man, which is called SGPL1. Now, I'm not going to go into biochemical details. I just want to show you that this is the pathway that I was interested in. And the enzyme uh, whose gene I identified, SGPL1, sits at the very bottom of this pathway. And using yeast genetics, I cloned that first gene. And then the beauty of yeast genetics is that you can use that mutation or that mutant enzyme uh, that mutant strain to identify other genes in the pathway. And so very quickly, the whole pathway was uh, opened up to genetic manipulation. And it turns out that these lipids and the genes that, um, uh, that, um, that are encoding the enzymes that control their, their metabolism are involved in a whole family of rare diseases. Uh, they're also involved in cancer but they're also responsible for a variety of rare diseases that we're now beginning to study. So I focused on this enzyme S1P lyase and I studied it in many different model organisms. And over the years, we became uh, um, knowledgeable about its role in human development and well, animal development and muscle function and neurologic function and various other uh, uh, conditions. Um, and over the years, uh, some uh, other people in our field contributed to the study uh, and understanding of this enzyme. The crystal structure of the protein was determined and it was found to be a homodimer, two different copies of the same gene uh, make two subunits that come together to form the enzyme. A knockout mouse was generated that doesn't have the enzyme activity. And this mouse only lives for three weeks, demonstrating the critical nature of this enzyme in survival. And then uh, uh, more astonishingly in 2017, um, we were involved in the discovery of a rare disease caused by mutations, inactivating mutations in the human gene, SGPL1. Um, now two different groups uh, arrived at the same discovery at the same time using both, both of us using next generation sequencing of um, uh, kindred uh, families um, in which one or more uh, children were affected by this disorder. And what was discovered is that it was inactivating mutations in this gene, SGPL1, that tracked with the patients who had the disease. All of the children who had the disease had the mutations and all of the family members who were healthy did not have the mutations. And so this gene and the disease was discovered. And um, this disease is called, now we've named it SPL, insufficiency syndrome or SPLIS. And it's caused by a whole variety of different mutations in the, the gene encoding this enzyme. Uh, the mutations fall all along the different uh, parts of the, of the protein, um, but they all cause inactivation. So what are the features of the disease? Um, 
almost all of the patients have lymphopenia, which means that the lymphocytes that are part of our immune system are not circulating in the bloodstream. And the reason for that is that the substrate of the enzyme, that uh, the function of the enzyme is to break down a molecule called S1P. And that molecule uh, is a signaling molecule that is required for lymphocytes to come out of the lymph nodes. And so when the enzyme isn't working, the S1P builds up, it causes abnormal signals and the lymphocytes get trapped in the lymph nodes. This often doesn't cause a lot of problems for the patient, but it can. Um, most of the patients also have something called steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. And this occurs when the kidney fails to do its one of its main functions, which is to filter the blood, to let small proteins spill out into the urine, but to hold on to uh, large proteins such as albumins and uh, albumin and immunoglobulins, antibodies, clotting factors, and various other proteins needs to hold on to, um, to do its work. And um, this is a very serious problem. And in SLIS children, um, this can lead to kidney failure. Um, the, the high molecular weight proteins just damage the kidney um, as on their way out. And um, this is a rapidly progressive disease that uh, leads to end-stage kidney disease and requiring kidney transplant or um, dialysis um, for survival. Many of the children also have adrenal insufficiency, and that's when their adrenal gland doesn't make the hormones that it's supposed to make. One of these being cortisol, our stress hormone that helps us deal with infections and um, other, other stressful conditions. Some of the children have neurologic defects, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment and they can have skin manifestations, including ichthyosis, which is a thickening of the skin, and um, uh, uh, acanthosis or, or darkening spots in the skin. And then a number of um, metabolic and, um, and other abnormalities that can be detected in the blood. Importantly, there's no cure for this disease. And uh, the disease was only discovered five years ago we're working very hard on solving that problem, but right now there is no cure. And the outcome, especially in children who present very early in life is, is quite poor. Now, most, most of the focus has been on the kidney disease, but the neurologic aspects of this can be quite debilitating. Children can have cranial nerve defects, which involve um, hearing loss, um, ptosis of the eye, and a peripheral neuropathy. And this neuropathy is an axonopathy. It means that the long processes that lead from the body of the nerve all the way out to the, to the fingers and the toes um, are damaged and, and then the nerve doesn't work. Um, and this is not a demyelinating disorder, but it's an axonopathy. It can involve pain, uh, painful stimuli, painful uh, signals in the nerves, uh, tingling, numbness, and inability to move. The, the hands, which can lead to contractures. Uh, this can be measured by nerve conduction study, and we'll see an example of that later. And then some of the patients have a progressive neuropathy, uh, neurodegenerative disease, and um, that's shown by the MRI brain scan on the right. And this is one patient um, with several different views, um, but showing you uh, an increase in white signal, which is very abnormal. And this can be quite progressive and lead to death. Now, one of the main uh, areas of interest in our laboratory that we are focusing on is trying to understand really why these patients have all these symptoms. What is it about SLIS, about the loss of this enzyme that is causing all of these problems? And uh, we can think about that in, from a biochemical point of view um, uh, in this way. Um, the, the enzyme breaks down the molecule S1P at the very bottom of this pathway. And when the enzyme isn't working, um, S1P can build up and it can cause aberrant signaling in ways that affect inflammation, uh, blood vessel development, lymphocyte trafficking, and many other things. The breakdown of S1P normally produces two products, hexadecinol and ethanolamine phosphate, and these also have important functions. So when the enzyme isn't working, there is a loss of the products. And then uh, because this enzyme guards the only exit point of this pathway, 
uh, there's a traffic jam when the enzyme doesn't work and you get buildup of all these other uh, um, molecules that can cause toxicity to cells. So all of these different pathways are possible routes for causing uh, tissue and organ damage. And I'm gonna just move quickly on from this um, because we don't need to know all of the biochemistry in order to be able to help the patients. And we realized that our expertise with this gene and this enzyme put us in a very good position to be able to do just that. And so um, even without knowing all of the causes, we moved ahead to therapeutics. And uh, so addressing the root cause of this disease by either replacing the gene or the enzyme or making the enzyme work better are ways that we are exploring to, to treat and hopefully cure this disease. And the first strategy I'm gonna tell you about is cofactor supplementation. From the time that this enzyme was first described by a, a German scientist in the late 1960s, it was known that this enzyme requires vitamin B6 to work. Vitamin B6, the, the active form of vitamin B6 is called pyridoxal phosphate. And uh, you can see from these uh, very simple enzyme studies that when you add vitamin B6 to the extracts, the enzyme works better. But if you add deoxypyridoxine, which is an inhibitor of vitamin B6 activity, you can see that we suppress the enzyme activity. So this is a B6 dependent enzyme. And we also know that of the many different mutations that children with spliss have, if both copies of their gene are mutated in regions, affecting regions of the um, lyase protein uh, that involve vitamin B6 binding in the, in the very conserved B6 binding domain of the protein, that they have a much higher risk of lethality. Their outcome is poor. And that just reflects the importance of vitamin B6 to the activity of the enzyme. Now, why do these mutations cause inactivation of the enzyme? There are probably many reasons, but we looked into the mechanisms in one particular mutation that is, um, accounts for about 30% of spliss patients. And this is the R222Q substitution in which a single amino acid is switched out for another. And what we see on the left is that the two subunits of the lyase, um, one shown in green and one shown in yellow, both have a, a, a helix, which is in, uh, colored in orange. And, and that helix binds to the vitamin B6. It coordinates the molecule of vitamin B6. And when we have that single substitution, that helix is displaced. And this leads to a poor binding affinity to B6. So the vitamin can't bind to the, to the enzyme, reducing its activity. On the other hand, on the right, what I'm showing you is a gel of the lyase protein. And you can see that the mutant protein, the R222Q and another mutation, S346I, both are um, much at much lower levels in cells, meaning that when we express them, they are unstable and the cell recognizes them as probably being misfolded and the cell clears them away. So there's not enough protein to do the work that it needs to do. Now, uh, vitamin B6 is required for over 160 reactions, bi uh, biochemical reactions in the human body. And not surprisingly, there are many rare diseases in which vitamin B6 dependent enzymes are affected. And it's known that some patients with vitamin B6 dependent enzyme deficiencies respond to treatment with high dose vitamin B6. And that can occur for two different reasons. One is that if uh, a mutant enzyme, a variant of a protein that needs vitamin B6 doesn't bind it very well, like our R222Q mutation, if you give the patient enough vitamin B6 and all of their cells are replete with vitamin B6, then every which way that mutant enzyme turns, it's gonna run into a vitamin B6 molecule. And so even if it doesn't bind very well, it will find its way to its cofactor and work better. The other way that vitamin B6 works is that it can function as a chaperone. When, when proteins are synthesized, they come out as a straight chain of polypeptide uh, amino acid chain, and then it has to fold up into the right conformation to work. 
and mutant proteins often don't fold properly. But vitamin B6 dependent enzymes uh, in the mutant form can be encouraged to find the right conformation and work better when there's a lot of vitamin B6 around. Now, there are many different forms of vitamin B6, and the one that's used most commonly in medicine is pyridoxine. So we employed pyridoxine uh, in a model of SPLIS in, in which we treated uh, skin fibroblasts derived from children with SPLIS uh, with, with different amounts of pyridoxine. And on the left side, the first graph I'm showing you is what happens when we treat cells with vitamin B6. We can see that the S1P level, the substrate of the enzyme, is very high in the black bar in cells that have are, they're grown in media with very little B6. But if you start adding pyridoxine at higher and higher doses, the S1P disappears. And that's because the enzyme starts working better. Um, when we uh, use different versions of vitamin B6, the different uh, isoforms of vitamin, not isoforms, but uh, different vitamins of B6, you can see that they all work to very varying degrees as well in the middle graph. And on the right, I'm showing you just the, the actual enzyme activity in the cells is improved. So that's the goal is to improve the enzyme activity. Um, now that's great and encouraging, but we don't wanna cure fibroblasts. We actually wanna cure patients. And so we decided to then treat patients with SPLIS um, with vitamin B6. And this is an example of the um, blood lymphocyte counts from a patient that responded to vitamin B6. The ALC is the absolute lymphocyte count, and that's a measure of the circulating lymphocytes. And when the lyase isn't working, the lymphocytes are trapped in the lymph nodes, and the absolute lymphocyte count is abnormally low, less than one. But when we treated this patient with vitamin B6, you can see that those levels rose. And when we looked at the T cell subsets, which is the type of lymphocytes that are affected in this disorder, we saw they also came up very nicely after B6 treatment. In another patient treated with vitamin B6, we also monitored the plasma S1P levels, the substrate of the enzyme that builds up in the blood uh, and in the tissues when the enzyme isn't working. And you can see um, that the plasma S1P levels in the proband in the patient are, are about twice as high as the controls. And that after treatment, um, these levels came down. The pretreatment levels are shown in the blue dots and the graph to the right and the black dots are after treatment. So this was also very encouraging that two biomarkers of the disease uh, improved with vitamin B6 treatment. But again, we don't wanna just cure biomarkers. We wanna actually make the patients feel better and, and, and have their organs work better. And very recently in the last few months, um, we have had a couple of stories that have been extremely encouraging. And uh, you will hear more about this from Dr. Edisham Khalid, who's presentation will follow mine, but I'm just giving you a, a teaser here that um, this is a patient uh, who uh, is a young lady who had a very severe peripheral neuropathy um, and uh, she was treated with vitamin B6. And these are nerve conduction studies uh, demonstrating that the function of her nerves improved after treatment as shown by the increased amplitude, the depth of the signal um, be both before and after uh, treatment, you can see the increase in the depth of that signal, which is an indication of nerve health. This is very exciting uh, for us and for the patient whom you will also hear from later. Um, and we also know now that we have one patient um, with a very severe kidney disease whose uh, disease was um, improved markedly with treatment. And we're very optimistic that if we can intervene early enough um, that we may be able to um, treat many of these patients with vitamin B6. However, not all patients are going to respond to vitamin B6. You need to have the lyase protein produced in a mutant form for it to even respond. And many of these patients with SPLIS don't even make the lyase protein at all. And for that, and for those individuals, and to create a universal treatment, we are embarking on a treat development of gene therapy. And in particular, we're using adeno-associated virus, which you heard about earlier from Dr. Irv. Um, this is probably the most uh, promising vector that is being used to deliver healthy genes to children with rare diseases. And we have used two different vectors 
uh, in which the human lyase gene is driven by either the CMV promoter or a synthetic promoter called CAG. Now we have um, tested our theory uh, by delivering a human lyase gene, the SGPL1 gene, to the lyase knockout mice. And as I mentioned earlier, these mice uh, are very sick. They only live about three weeks. So we have to intervene very early. The mice uh, are born at normal rates and they look relatively indistinguishable from their litter mates when they're first born, but they, over the first two weeks of life, they start accumulating sphingolipids and they become runted and they die within three weeks. Um, and part of the reason for that, or probably the main reason, is that they have a very similar kidney disorder uh, as the individuals with spliss. Uh, and this is a protein spilling nephropathy, and it can be measured by the urine albumin creatinine ratio, or ACR. And you can see that the knockout um, has a very extraordinarily high ACR compared to a wild type mouse. And this leads to the loss of many proteins in the blood, including the serum albumin, which falls and, and begins to cause uh, edema and other problems. And the reason why these kidneys aren't working um, is that the glomerulus of the kidney, which is a little blood vessel tuft that is the, really what's responsible in the cortex of the kidney for filtering the blood, and there are thousands of these in our kidneys, um, the, court, the uh, glomerulus becomes scarred uh, with scar tissue, with collagen tissue. And so unlike the wild type glomerulus, which is very, uh, very small and, and compact, the, the knockout of glomerulus is enlarged and abnormal and filled with scar tissue. So the way we conducted our initial experiments was to treat newborn mice uh, that have this disease with a single dose of um, AEV SPL, which is our gene therapy. We cross heterozygous mice because the knockout mice don't live long enough to survive and mate. So we have to use heterozygous mice. We cross them together. We genotype them on the very first day of life. And when we identify the knockout that has both copies affected and, and has no lyase activity, um, my staff, um, which is, it's still kind of amazing to me how they do this, but they are able to see in these little mice on the first days of life, they, they don't have any hair and you can see their little facial vein um, and they, they inject 20 microliters of uh, virus solution with a little bit of green food coloring uh, so that when they cannulate the vessel properly and, the, and the, uh, the drug goes systemically, the whole mice turn green uh, and then they, they pee it out in 24 hours, the dye doesn't hurt them. And so um, we have uh, done an initial study uh, with 10 mice, um, we either euthanize the mice and, and do various studies on them, or we wait and watch to see what happens. And this is the most important part of my talk um, because it shows you uh, that our very first study uh, gave us a, a quite promising result. Um, the knockout mice that are not treated are shown in the red line, and you can see they only live about three weeks. But if we treat those mice uh, in the first days of life with a human gene, which is about 85% similar to the mouse gene and should work very well. We can see that the survival is markedly extended almost to a year, not in all mice, and there's work to be done to make this more effective, but um, this is showing us a, a quite prominent uh, effect. And in contrast, if we introduce instead a virus carrying a lyase gene that is mutated and has no catalytic activity, as shown by the black line, um, there is no improvement. So this is quite promising. And with catalyst funds, we have now uh, recapitulated this study, uh, doing a dose response. And our most recent findings um, are shown here. And I'm gonna just give you a little snippet of, of uh, a view of um, both a wild type mouse and a lies knockout mouse that was treated with gene therapy on day of life one. And basically these mice are indistinguishable. They're almost the same size and they're quite healthy. Um, and these are nine months old at this time and still growing. So we're very excited about that. Um, not only do the mice survive, but they are protected from 
uh, development of kidney disease. And you can see that the albumin creatinine ratio in these mice um, are uh, normalized. Their serum albumin is normalized and the tuft area, which is an indication of the size of the glomerulus and its defect um, are also improved. Now the knockout mice didn't, um, were not known to have any neurological defects. Um, they only lived three weeks. They didn't have seizures or anything else that was quite you know, obvious, um, but we decided to perform a battery of uh, tests uh, assessing the day at which these mice acquired a nor normal neurodevelopmental milestones. And you can see that uh, the days at which these mice open their eyes, uh, can hear, um, can figure out how to uh, position themselves better when they're put on a cliff, um, their walking pattern, all of these things are abnormal in the knockout mouse and are corrected uh, by gene therapy or prevented from delay. Uh, with gene therapy and the grip strength also an indication of their motor function is improved markedly with treatment. Their uh, metabolism of sphingolipids goes hand in hand with the outcome. Uh, we can see that the sphingolipids in these mouse tissues, the knockout, untreated knockout, are very, very high, hundreds of fold higher than a normal mouse, and that these have been markedly improved, the, the restoration of sphingolipid metabolism has been achieved uh, with our gene therapy. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about all the other features that we see that are abnormal in the knockout mouse that are um, corrected by gene therapy, but um, there are many, many um, uh, inflammatory and other markers that uh, are also improved by our treatment. And we're very, very excited to be taking this forward now with um, a, a new grant from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine that is gonna help us uh, develop um, hopefully more effective uh, and safer uh, ways to achieve a more consistent result. Um, I will mention that um, we are developing biomarkers because this is a disease that has variable uh, presentations and in order to be able to uh, make a uniform outcome, uh, in clinical trials, biomarkers, as Dr. Irv mentioned, um, are extremely important. And we are exploring and validating um, plasma sphingolipids, um, of which there are many species as shown on the left. We use uh, mass spectrometry to measure these in the plasma of the patients. Um, and um, we are also uh, characterizing the peripheral blood lymphocytes. Um, and I'm hoping that we will have a, um, an NCATS uh, funded uh, study on this um, in, in the coming days. Uh, and lastly, I just want to mention that um, our work is, is part of a, a complex machine that is focused on cure, um, that academic science um, must work together with patients and families and industry. Um, it is a very big uh, a process, and um, you heard a little bit about that, and we'll hear more about this uh, later today. Um, these are not strictly separate, and there are many areas of overlap in which communication uh, and working together is, is absolutely critical. Um, we have a new patient registry for SPLIS, and we are designing a natural history study now. So if you know of any patients with SPLIS, please let me know. And I just want to end with um, this poem. Uh, this is written by um, my own um, poetry teacher. Uh, and I'm just gonna read it. This is my praise, this is my proclamation. This is the apple I place on the white plate before you. This is my metaphysics of possibility. And this poem, I think, um, uh, shares the kind of joy and optimism that I and hopefully many of you feel um, being as we are in this genomic era uh, in which we can finally uh, understand at the molecular and genetic level uh, the causes of many of these rare diseases and, and um, be able to be in a position to develop personalized treatments for children, whether they have sickle cell disease or spliss or, um, or cancer. Uh, and I think that um, this is very befitting of the fact that, um, that we're dealing with children, uh, whether they're healthy children or whether they're children facing difficult, uh, life-altering uh, diseases. All children, um, all children are utterly unique and, and beautiful 
and rare creations of nature. And with that, I would just thank the people in my lab who uh, conducted this work and uh, the funders that I've listed here. And I'm going to stop sharing my slide. And now I'm going to, um, with great pleasure, introduce my colleague, Dr. Edisham Khalid. Uh, Dr. Khalid is um, the neuromuscular section chair in the Pakistan Society of Neurology. He is the consultant neurophysician at Ideal Medicare in Multan, Pakistan, and he uh, uh, identified um, the cause of uh, a patient's neuropathy that he will tell you about now. Dr. Khalid, you can take over. Thank you very much. I hope everyone can see my slides. Uh, hey, uh, thank you very much, Julie. And it's an honor to be on this platform. And I really appreciate the organizing committee of this symposium for this invited um, uh, invitation for my presentation. And thank you, Julie. Um, so it was a very interesting case. And because I learned a lot from this case, so I call it knowing the unknown. Uh, as you can see from my first slide, I am a neurologist and a neuromuscular subspecialist by my background. I was part of the undiagnosed disease network while I was working in Vanderbilt. And that was the time when I uh, developed more interest in rare disorders, especially genetic neurological disorders. I have no financial disclosures to make regarding my presentation. Starting with my case, who was a 17-year-old female who presented with numbness and burning sensation in her right hand and foot for the past three months. It started with the left hand four years ago, and it improved over the next two years with some medication, mainly it was steroids. There was a decreased strength in returning and a discoloration of her left hand during that time. She also had numbness and weakness of the left foot up to her ankle due to which she needed some assistance in mobility. She had a similar episode in August of 2020, which again got better with some supplementation and medication. In terms of her developmental milestones, she developed normally, she was getting good grades in school, so there was no issues with respect to that. But her family history was significant. She had two sisters who suffered from some serious illness early in the age and died. And the older one developed hyperpigmentation and her milestones were delayed and she died after developing high grade fever. The younger one had kidney. She was on prednisone and she was hospitalized for meningitis. During the hospital stay, she developed a documented proteinuria and she died later at the age of two years. This was her initial motor examination in my clinic. And as you can see through the slide on the left-hand side, which is the upper extremity examination, on the right-hand side is the lower extremity examination. And she was less weaker in the shoulder and more weak distally in her hand. In the lower extremity, she was symmetrically weak in her uh, right leg. But on the left side, there was no weakness. Her sensory exam showed some vibratory sensory uh, loss in her toes, and there was decreased pinprick sensation up to mid feet. As this patient was having evidence of sensory motor neuropathy, so to understand the case better, she was referred for nerve conduction study. So this study was done before what we started her on. So in the initial study, which if you look at the left-hand side, especially the upper part is the sensory study, from mid below is the motor study. So in the right median uh, sensory examination, there was no response on nerve conduction study. In the right ulnar, there was a response. On the motor study examination, in the right median nerve, you can see the amplitude was reduced and the latency was not uh, very much prolonged. In the right ulnar nerve, again, the latency was okay, but the amplitude was reduced, which goes more with the axonal variant of polyneuropathy. So it was reported as 
moderate asymmetric sensory-motor axonal polyneuropathy with denervation changes. And for people in the audience, because I'm a neuromuscular subspecialist and there are people from different backgrounds, this type of neuropathy is mainly seen in mononeuritis multiplex or autoimmune or vascular polyneuropathy. Thinking of that, she autoimmune. So NTCCT, rheumatoid arthritis vector, ANCA, ANA, ENA profile was done, including CCP, and all of those were normal. Her basic uh, inflammatory markers, talking about ESR, C-reactive protein, were normal as well. Her TSH was normal. Thinking of her kidney moment, the Ben Jones proteins was done, and it was normal as well. Same goes for serum immunofixation levels. Because her symptoms were unilateral on the right side, so MRI brain was done as well, and it was normal. As this case had some significant family history, so she was subjected to next generation sequencing, and it came back positive for homozygous mutation for SGPL1. This this mutation, as Dr. Saba elaborated in her, in her presentation, is mainly seen with autosomal recessive nephrotic syndrome. This case shows what happens with the clinicians in the clinic uh, and next generation sequencing. Many a times we do see uh, a variant of unknown significance. So it becomes really hard to understand the genetic results. And that's the time you consult your genetics team and I had the opportunity to talk to one of my colleagues who is Mayo Clinic trained and uh, Dr. Salman Kermani and his team. And that was the time they got me linked with Dr. Saba. And it was very, very helpful link. And as Dr. Erb nicely mentioned in her presentation, that was a bridge that we developed to help our patient. So uh, after my discussion and extensive workout, I finally started this patient on vitamin B6 supplementation tuber. Then we increased her dose in January. And at that time, she had a repeat nerve conduction study and clinical assessment to see what's going on. So if you see, compared to the previous slide, so I put down the initial exam, which is pre, and the follow-up exam, which is post. And again, if you see in this case, she improved in her uh, pre compared to the post exam. So initially her strength was four and now it was five, which is normal. Distally in her hand, she was initially two, but now it was four plus, which again shows that she has improvement in her motor strength. In the lower extremity, her strength also improved to normal. To confirm our findings on the clinical exam, she had a repeat nerve conduction study and the same way, I put down the pre and post treatment uh, nerve conduction study numbers for the uh, ease of the audience. So the right median sensory study, which was initially no response, there was a response and it was a good amplitude in the sensory study. In the ulnar study, the latency remained the same or changed a little bit, but amplitude improved on the motor study. If you look at that in the right median uh, latency, it did prolong a little bit, but the amplitude, almost 50%, it improved. And same goes for the ulnar study, and there was some improvement in the amplitude. Again, for the audience, as a neuromuscular subspecialist, when we are documenting improvement or recovery, what we are more in interested in is the motor exam and the motor part of the nerve conduction study. And this nerve conduction study on follow-up confirms our improvement, which was also seen clinically in our patient. These are the graphs which Dr. Julie also shared uh, in her presentation. So these are shown in a much bigger format for the audience. So in the pre-treatment, you can see the amplitude was small. In the post-treatment with vitamin B6, the, uh, the amplitude improvement quite a bit. And at the end, this is a brief interview of my patient who shared her feelings and answered few questions for the audience. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to thank you 
to, to the organizing committee, and especially Dr. Julie, who has been a great sport during the care of my patient. And I really believe it really helps developing bridges in providing quality care internationally. Thank you very much, Dr. Sabat, for this opportunity to uh, work with you. My name is Dr. Edesham Khalid. I'm a neurologist and a neuromuscular subspecialist, and I have a successful time with me. And we're going to have some questions for the audience, and she will share her experience through the disease process that she is going through. So, Aksar, just let us know that what brought you to the doctor for the first place. I felt numbness in my right hand and right foot, so I was worried what was going on, so it brought me to the doctor. It was yes. And how does it uh, day look like in your routine life? So what you do in a routine day? I play with my nephew. I use my mobile, watch TV, and I just... Do you study? Yes. Okay. How this disease is affecting your life? It affects my mental health so much. <clears throat> it makes me disabled, and that affects very much in my life. So, so are you able to do your routine chores at home? Are you able to study? What is affecting you in any way? I am trying to do, but I'm not doing that very well, like I was before I was used to do. So uh, how have your symptoms, our ability to function changed over time? So since you have been diagnosed or even before the diagnosis, what changes has been there like in the start, before the diagnosis and after the diagnosis? In the start, I was, it was like uh, my hand was not working any, anymore and uh, I felt like I am, I am disabled. But after diagnosis, after the treatment, I feel like my hand is now start working somewhere and I am uh, able to walk before I was not able to walk. Nice. And what about the, the numbness you were feeling? Is it still there? It's it, but not like the before. It is better now. Nice. So uh, how difficult was it to obtain a diagnosis for your condition? <clears throat> because uh, move to do whatever I want. But now there's a big change in my life. But it's not impossible. I can do that. How did you get to the diagnosis? Before, um, since four years, we were uh, work, we were <clears throat> turning, visiting to the doctors, uh, different doctors, and they were like, uh, "It's such you are doing a trauma, and there's nothing like that in our career. We don't did not see that." But after four years, we met a doctor, a doctor at the Sham, and he used to say that I think she has a scientific problem. So after that, uh, we diagnosis with it. And now I am satisfied with the treatment. Good to know that. So, and how has the treatment changed your life? <clears throat> treatment changed my life. Like, it makes me positive and uh, I am now able to work and move my hands. So it has really changed my life. Nice. And what treatment you have been given over the period of time? Firstly, I used uh, steroids that are very heavy for me. But after now, afterward, now I am using beta six and uh, neuro Dulan and new gap, and it makes me feel good. And also, let me know uh, what would you like to tell the world about living with a very rare condition? Because you know you have a rare condition; it's not very common. So, would you like to tell the world about it? It makes you a special person because the person who is sitting in front of you is not feeling the same what are you feeling. So firstly, it was not so good, but it is also like you are a special. And I hope other persons who is behind the camera are not uh, have to not feel what I am feeling. Uh, what do you wish for? I wish the person who is facing the same uh, fear problems have been cured and it has treatment for the people. Uh, thank you very much, Atsa. Um, and I know and I wish you and all the people who are suffering from similar condition uh, can get the proper treatment and they can improve. 
I really appreciate for your time today. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. And I can say that these are really special patients and they deserve special attention and support. I will end my presentation with that. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Saman Kamani, who is the chair of Women and Child Health Division at Alfam University and a geneticist. Fiza Akbar, who is the genetic counselor at Alfam University, and especially Dr. Julie, who has been very helpful through the process. I'm happy to take any questions. I will be bringing on the panel right now. Uh, Julie, Birin, and Etisham. Hi, can we, here and Shah is here. He's here. Can you just stop sharing your screen? Dr. Khalid? Uh, sure. Let me. And let's begin with the questions while we have everyone here. One of the questions was, how, how common is bliss in a place like Sri Lanka? Uh, well, we, uh, we only know of about less than 100 patients around the world. And this is kind of typical of what happens when a new inborn error of metabolism is discovered, is that it takes uh, quite a while for people to recognize the condition and do what Dr. Khalid did, which is to probe uh, the family history and find out if there is a genetic basis for disease and, um, and to do the genetic sequencing. So we don't know of any patients in Sri Lanka. We know of patients um, in pretty much every continent except Antarctica. Uh, so they're, they're everywhere. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more um, frequent, or at least we're hearing about them more often in areas of the world where there is greater consanguinity. Not surprisingly, many rare diseases are more prevalent there. And we're in the process of doing uh, calculations based on allele frequency to figure out the prevalence in different um, populations. But I'm not aware of any case in Sri Lanka at this time. That does not mean that they're not there. Thank you. And I just wanted to introduce Birin uh, Shah as we've brought him on the panel. And he's currently the head of Alliance Management at EQRX, a clinical stage oncology biotech. And previously he held leadership roles, commercial leadership roles at Biomarin, where he had direct responsibilities for patient finding, especially for patients with ultra rare inborn errors of metabolism, specifically lysosome storage disorder diseases. And so, Mr. Shah, I have a question for you. How did you use AI, like uh, uh, AI data mining, like for example, with Komodo Health to identify patients, if you could speak to that? Sure. And also um, if you could quickly mention what rare diseases you were looking sure. for patients. So the, the franchise that I was responsible for at Biomarin was in LSD, lysosomal storage disorders, and there were two ultra-rare diseases that there were therapies, uh, enzyme replacement therapies that Biomarin marketed. Um, one was Morchio syndrome um, and uh, mucopolysaccharidosis, four and six. Were, those were the two, two diseases that I had direct experience in patient finding. Now, Julie mentioned it, like consanguinity is that something that you look for in familial history. That's exactly what we did at Biomarin. Um, and then it's the needle in the haystack. You hear about a patient in a medical center somewhere in the country, you start to investigate. So, you know, it was very manual labor, let's call it, in patient finding and trying to connect the dots. Then um, about halfway, halfway through my time at Biomarin, I was approached by, you know, these AI-centric big data mining type companies. Um, all the technological buzzwords you could think of were being thrown at me. And what could these technological advances in um, data mining, uh, investigating data lakes, what could they do as far as patient finding? So in a nutshell, these companies take um, payer data in the US and they start to look for patterns of ITD-10 diagnoses in different areas of the country. And what we're trying to uncover is misdiagnosis, not even like a definitive diagnosis, but a misdiagnosis to start with. So a lot of these errors of inborn metabolism 
they have a common catchphrase called skeletal dysplasia. And the patients, they start seeing specialists. And the first specialist they often tend to see is not a geneticist, but an orthopedic surgeon because of all the things that they go through in their disease progression and patient journey. So our job was to find the, the errors of errors of inborn metabolism, the misdiagnoses, and try to connect an orthopedic surgeon at a big medical center with a geneticist and try to get that orthopedic surgeon to refer and do genetic panel um, screening for, for uh, newborn screening type tests if they're very young kids, or you know, some of these unfortunately were kids in adolescence and even teenage years. So we use these companies in data mining, um, employing their proprietary AI algorithms to look for patterns of misdiagnoses and then connect the people internally within the medical centers to do a genetic screen to definitively diagnose, is it mucopolysaccharidosis? Is it achondroplasia? Is it FED? What is it? And then we have certain treatments to go from there and not have the patient go through surgical options, which is usually sometimes their first intervention versus a genetic test, which should be the other way around, genetic test first, and then potentially other options for uh, ERT or, or um, surgery down the road. So let me pause there because I know I threw a lot at the audience and see if Julie also has comments and Dr. Khalid has comments. Uh, thank you, thank you. And I just want to thank both Dr. Saba and Dr. Khalid for your great presentations. And it's great to see the collaboration. And Dr. Khalid, are there other patients like other rare diseases that you're diagnosing besides bliss in your know, neurological, neuromuscular and Anything that you can talk sure. about that briefly? Sure. So since I came back to Pakistan, because I think being in a developing country gives me the opportunity to see a lot of rare genetic disorders. So, and I think um, it has been a real opportunity for me and Nvidia Laboratory has been very helpful and collaborative in, in that case, beside AKU, the Aga Khan University. So um, uh, we are publishing our data of more than 70 patients and it will be coming up soon. I did come across a lot of rare cases, like this patient has been moving around for almost four years before she gets a definitive diagnosis. We actually presented our data in Asian Oceanic uh, Myology Conference last year, that on average, patients take 7.9 years to get a definitive diagnosis, uh, especially with the, and you can understand that it was also uh, presented in Dr. Er's uh, presentation as well. So it takes a lot of intensive uh, timing with the patient, knowing the right resources, which gets you, you to the definitive diagnosis. That's why I mentioned having the bridges, knowing the resources is the key. And when we talk about the rare genetic disorders, and Dr. Julie very nicely mentioned with respect to uh, a, a lot of intensive research um, and lab work is required, especially when we talk about, and, the, and in neuromuscular, a lot of uh, gene therapies are coming into, uh, into the uh, practice, which, which I think is a very hopeful thing. I hope that because those are very expensive at this cost will come down. So um, I, uh, there are a lot of patients uh, which I came across and uh, I, I think there are uh, some rare ones as well. Some even I was not even uh, able to understand. Uh, if, if I was part of the undiagnosed disease network in the US as well. But uh, I think it's a much bigger patient pool uh, in, in developing countries. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khalid. And Dr. Saba, there are two questions from the audience that I want to ask you, uh, transitioning now to the AAVs. How do you test for safety and immunogenicity of AAVs? So the immunogenicity can be measured uh, based on antibodies to the virus or to the serotype of the virus. We have done that in our knockout mice that have been treated with gene therapy. We do see an immune response to the virus, um, which of course is one of the main uh, drawbacks and, and challenges that we face as a field, um, which is that you can only give a single dose because 
um, because of the immune response and later detection, um, which would create an anamnestic immune response to a second dose. Um, there are ways around it um, and people are investigating that. Um, one of the things that we are exploring is um, a modified capsid that actually uh, has some residues changed on the outer surface of the virus so that it can uh, evade detection by the patient's T cells. Um, and this is something that holds a lot of promise um, in terms of both uh, reducing the dose um, and, and the clearance of the virus. Um, um, and um, what was the other question was? Oh yeah, uh, the other question oh, the is- safe, Safety, right? Safety. Safety. And there's one more question after that. Yeah, so safety is a big issue and it's become even more um, uh, concerning um, because of the death of certain uh, a set of patients in a, in a particular clinical trial that just happened last year and the FDA and the whole community is sort of buzzing about that. And I think um, generally what's done is these uh, vectors and the genes that they're being expressed are, are tested in animal models. They don't have to be a model of the disease for the safety issues. They can just be delivered to uh, primate models or other models to, to just look for toxicity integration to the genome and other things that could be toxic um, without having the underlying disease present. Um, and ultimately, as you know, all of, our, uh, all of clinical trials go through a phase one or slash phase one, two uh, a study uh, initially uh, to test in humans um, with the disease. Uh, what the what the toxicities are. I'm hoping that as a field, we are going to learn more and more about how to avert the general toxicities associated with um, viral delivery. And, and part of that is going to be just by reducing the dose, finding ways to make this more effective so that the amount of virus that we give to children with the rare disease uh, is, is less. Right now, we're using doses that are higher than the number of cells in the human body, which is kind of crazy. It's, uh, we, we have not figured out how to design the AAV vector to be the best possible vector that it can be. It's really designed to be a virus and not a vector. So I've been communicating a lot with um, parvovirus experts to try to figure out the best way forward in that regard. And one more audience question. Uh, what drives the renal dysfunction of the SPLIS deficiency? That is the $100 million question. We are, um, it is not an easy thing to answer. And we are trying to figure out whether it is circulating lipids that are causing the toxicity of the kidney or whether there is something specific in the cells of the kidney that require that enzyme. And, you know, as in many cases, um, the enzyme makes a, um, a chemotactic gradient of S1P that's very localized. So there may be uh, maybe very specific functions of the enzyme within the parenchyma of the kidney tissue. And I don't have the definitive uh, answer for that at this time. Uh, thank you. And another question, because I know you've been working on it. How do you get diagnostic companies to put like split screen a screening and who pays for it? How do hospitals decide? Is it like children with kidney disease were screened? Anything you can talk about that? Uh, I'll just echo what uh, Biren mentioned because it is it is a bit of you know the patients go through their diagnostic odyssey and on the other side we scientists and um, clinicians go through the other odyssey which is trying to figure out how to get to raise awareness for these diseases so that clinicians can diagnose the patients more readily. Not everybody can undergo next generation sequencing. Um, and there are many diagnostic tests um, that um, are kind of disease focused. So a doctor in a hospital can order uh, a, a genetic test to look for um, mutations in any of the genes. Maybe there's 35 genes that are known to cause monogenic uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, and we have to fight to get our genes on these tests. <laughs> we have to write letters to the heads of companies. We have to remind them every six months because these companies often only do a review on change their panels and the genes are, are added onto the panels maybe once every six months or once a year. So we have to you know, toot our horns 
talk to people, uh, network and um, finding patients. Um, I think AI is, is a great new opportunity that, um, that we're gonna have to really exploit. Um, but most of what I have been doing is writing research articles, uh, networking, um, uh, calling these companies, uh, and, and writing letters to um, medical pediatric societies, such as the Pediatric Neurology, Pediatric Nephrology Society to raise awareness. We're also very fortunate that the NIH, the, the NORD has a GARD website. And I just checked yesterday and um, we created a page about a, a couple of years ago uh, for SPLIS and uh, it's been visited by about 350 users. So we're getting the word out slowly, but AI presents a new and really powerful way to chart review and find patients who could then be tested by next generation sequencing. Thank you, because I think you got it like on the panel for with NVT, right? Yes. This testing, yes, you did. So I would just leave it with like a quick closing comment. Let's begin Dr. Khaled with anything you want to say as a quick closing comment. You're muted, Dr. Khalid. Thank you. So I will just uh, uh, reiterate that uh, it's, uh, uh, I think, a great platform going forward. We should have more collaboration, developing more bridges to provide quality care and developing uh, treatment for our patients. Thank you. And I really Thank appreciate everyone who, who has been uh, on, the, on today's conference. Thank you. Thank you. And Birin, sure. Sure, just a quick comment. Um, you know, there have been rapid advances, maybe not rapid, there have been advances in therapeutic options for these rare, ultra rare diseases in the past decade, maybe two decades, but patient finding still remains a challenge. So I think there are new opportunities, new frontiers to collaborate, partner with academia, um, amazing physicians like Dr. Clayton, and Dr. Sabah. Uh, to find more patients and make use of these therapies and advances that we have in our hands. Thank you. And Dr. Saba? Uh, well, I just want to first just send my, um, my, heart, <laughs> my heartfelt uh, thoughts and feelings out to the, the patients and their families because they're the caregivers who, who really do a tremendous and heroic job every single day. Uh, and then I just want to echo the, the need for us to find better ways to treat, uh, to use this genetic um, fulcrum that we have now to be able to treat ultra rare diseases. We, industry still is not, um, it's not easy to get people interested in an ultra rare disease where there are only a limited number of patients. We need to solve that problem. I don't know what the answer is, but we have to solve that problem so that we can use our tools to, to treat and cure every single child. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all your work and all the time and effort. And now I would like to introduce my uh, colleague, it's my pleasure to introduce Jenny Jancy. She has a PhD. She, she has a PhD in molecular and cellular biology from UC Berkeley, and is the program director for the diagnostics, digital health, and biotools tracks at Catalyst, and is also the director of the UCSF Blackstone Launch Pad that promotes student entrepreneurship. So take it away, Jenny. Great, thank you, Rupa. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Kingsmore, who is president and CEO of Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, where he leads a multidisciplinary team of scientists, physicians, and researchers who are pioneering the use of rapid whole genome sequencing to enable precise diagnoses of critically ill newborns. Among his achievements, Dr. Kingsmore holds a Guinness World Record for achieving the fastest molecular diagnosis using whole genome sequencing in just 19 and a half hours. So we are pleased to have him here today to discuss the state of the art diagnostics in rare diseases. Dr. Kingsmore, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, I apologize, I'm a little late. You're not gonna believe this. I'm on a cruise ship off the coast of Mexico. 
uh, I had a little difficulty getting online. But here I am, and I'm super excited to talk to you today. So let me go ahead and share my screen and let's get started. Can you all see that? Um, it's coming looks in. Good. Okay. It looks like it's coming. Oh, here it is. So it looks great. Super. So I'm going to talk about state of the art diagnostics. The focus is on rare childhood genetic diseases. So children do have non genetic rare diseases. But what's really different about pediatrics is that a huge component of healthcare expenditure goes on genetic diseases, monogenic conditions. I don't have a conflict of interest. Okay, we are living in an incredibly exciting time. We now know the molecular basis of 7,100 genetic diseases and that number changes every day. We can now diagnose a genetic condition by rapid whole genome sequencing in seven hours. Sadly, that is no longer my record. That's held by you and Ashley's group at Stanford. And also amazingly, we can decode a genome in a research setting for less than $400. These all come together to mean that we are entering a new era of instant diagnosis of genetic disease in children. So for the last decade, my team has focused on this problem, problem A, which was children in intensive care units who were suspected of having one of these genetic conditions. We're talking in total about 2% of the childhood population. And a, a characteristic about genetic diseases in children, which is different from adults, is that they have a much more rapid rate of progression. This is true in pediatrics generally, but especially in these diseases, and in particular, those that have newborn onset. And so there are literally sometimes only minutes or hours to make a diagnosis in time to save a life or save an organ. And so the goal with rapid diagnostical genome sequencing is to make that immediate diagnosis and minimize morbidity and mortality. This is a busy slide. If I'd shown this slide a decade ago, it would have just contained the middle line, which was the testing component. However, these days we realize that in order to achieve optimal outcomes in children, we actually need an entire healthcare delivery system in which doctors, nurses, ICU administrators, healthcare administrators, payors, as well as laboratorians are involved, also pediatric subspecialists. And if we all come together, we can actually do what I will show you in the next couple of slides. So this is a great case. It's a fairly recent case uh, from around the end of the year. A 14-year-old cheerleader in San Diego County finished her supper and then felt dizzy and fell on the floor and was pulseless. Mum started CPR. She was um, further resuscitated when the emergency medical services arrived, but they couldn't get a stable pulse. And what happens in one of these code blue situations is there's a formulaic approach where you go from intervention to intervention in a highly prescribed manner. And every doctor and every EMT knows this and is trained to provide it. So she goes all the way through this, uh, including five episodes of cardioversion. She's transported to an outside hospital. She still is not recovered. Um, this resuscitation continues. She's transported to Ready Children's Hospital. We are the subspecialist hospital for our part of California, mainly San Diego and Imperial counties, but also Southern Riverside County. Um, and she continues to be unstable and unable to maintain her blood pressure. So a difficult decision has to be made, which is, um, what do we do? She's put on a heart-lung bypass. It's called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, because she has refractory ventricular tachycardia. That buys her probably a week, maybe 10 days, to figure out what's wrong and to fix it. 
Now, she is positive for a viral infection. It's, it's a rhinovirus, common cold, that can cause viral myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle. So that is the clinical diagnosis. And the treatment for that is intravenous immunoglobulin and then possibly also adding corticosteroids. And typically this is a self-limited illness and the patient will recover over about a month. And her echocardiogram shows that her heart has essentially lost all pump function, however, a 3% ejection fraction versus a normal, which is 60 or 70 in, in somebody like this. So that treatment has started for the presumptive clinical diagnosis, but the astute physician also orders a genome. It turns out that indeed, this young lady does have a genetic illness. It's a dominant disorder. Uh, it occurred de novo in her, so it was not present in her mum or dad. And the affected gene is lamin. It's one of the structural proteins uh, for cardiac muscle. And so her ventricular arrhythmias are a result of dysfunction of lamin A in terms of controlling cardiac contract. This is a typical presentation. She's maybe a little bit young, so it typically presents in young adulthood. She's 14. And it may or may not be that the viral infection is what triggered this uh, very abrupt onset. So it may be contributing. We don't know. Why this is so important is intravenous immunoglobulin won't do her a button of good. And she's on an ECMO machine and she can't stay on that for long. Now, in a normal course of events, this would not have been ordered, this testing, until sometime down the course when she did not respond as per usual. If that had been the case, she probably would have died. Instead, that day, she's listed for cardiac transplant. She has it on day of life seven is extubated on day of life nine and goes home just a couple of weeks later. Um, that was about four months ago and she's doing just fine. She does not to have, appear to have any cognitive impairment and obviously with her newly transplanted heart, she no longer has that cardiomyopathy, nor will it recur. Heart transplant in her case is curative. This is the miracle that's occurring all over the world now, where hitherto fatal genetic diseases are fixable, provided you diagnose them in time. So, back to the paradigm. You've now understood how big of a problem this is uh, and how a rapid diagnosis leads to prompt initiation of treatment and thereby reduction in morbidity or mortality. There are now 31 published studies that come to the same conclusion, which is that overall about a third of children who receive a rapid genome or a rapid exome, uh, if they have a suspected genetic disease and if they're ill enough to be in an intensive care unit, on average 37% diagnosis, 29% change in management. So that's just about all of those who are diagnosed, 18% change in outcome. Those numbers, if you are a, if you're a doctor, are mind numbingly amazing. Uh, we are used to living with new interventions that maybe shave off 1%, in terms of outcome, half a percent, a tenth of a percent, an 18% change in outcome is completely unheralded. This is the diagnostic revolution. So over the last five years or so, we have really focused on moving this from being an experimental test performed in a research setting to becoming standard of care. And we started this in California with what was called Project Baby Bear, which has now been recapitulated in two other states. Let me just show you the results of this study. So this was an implementation uh, study. This was not research. Uh, it was funded by the legislature. 
And the goal was to see whether in real world practice, we could recapitulate what research studies had so richly shown. These are the zip codes of the uh, babies who were enrolled. They were all less than one year of age. And as you can see, Children's Hospital of Oakland was uh, one of the enrollment sites. And here's the results. And they really did recapitulate the clinical utility. So 43% rate of diagnosis and 31% change in management with a three-day turnaround time. So yes, indeed, in the Medicaid population, which is about 55 to 60%, of US newborns who are admitted to intensive care units. So it's not a small population. Uh, again, babies are a little bit different uh, than adults. So Medicaid is the dominant um, reimburser for bills of such infants. Um, this, this really works. The second thing that the legislature asked us was, how much will this cost California Medicaid or Medi-Cal? And so we did a cost analysis. Um, and as you can see on the left-hand side, we looked at three turnaround times. So we modeled this uh, using a sensitivity analysis. And for all of the turnaround times, there were cost savings during that first hospitalization. And they were maximized by um, time to result of three days. We didn't model any faster than that. At that point in time, that was about as fast as was possible. Now, cost savings in first hospitalization were not the only savings that were apparent. There were also savings in ongoing cost of care and savings for the family in terms of comorbidity, anxiety, depression, lost time from work, and so on. So that overall, this was highly cost saving for Medi-Cal. And as a result, we now have a policy in California uh, to make this standard of care. Unfortunately, that did not result in a change in payment. So the, the, the Department of Health uh, decided that this should be covered by the DRG, which of course is a ridiculous proposition since the DRG system only covers about 90% of the true cost of hospitalization. So adding a genome to that is not something that hospital administrators are going to permit. The good news, however, is that three other states have now joined suit. That's Oregon, uh, Minnesota, and Michigan. And Minnesota and Michigan's policies are more enlightened and actually provide a separate carve-out payment to reimburse for the actual test results. And the same is true of Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, both in California and nationally. This is changing very rapidly. So those two newer sites uh, of Oregon and um, Michigan, sorry, not Michigan, uh, Minnesota, just enacted those policies in the last month. Okay, so that's the state of the art for diagnosis, but I don't want to finish there. There's more to come. There's a second bottleneck, bottleneck B. What we have found as we have now um, implemented this nationwide in 80 children's hospitals is that doctors often don't know the management of these rare and ultra rare conditions. I have a new term for you. It's the therapeutic odyssey. We thought we were done with the problem with the diagnostic odyssey. Well, we're not quite. So we need a solution that upskills frontline MDs so that they actually become masters of rare disease management. Now, it's not their fault because the evidence supporting many of the treatments for these diseases is interspersed throughout the literature. And so a busy physician has to go online and do a PubMed search and read through articles if they're to find the most timely information about treatment. That's obviously not tenable in an intensive care unit. So um, with support from NIH, we put together a system that's not available 
uh, you, you can look it up on the internet called genome to treatment. And we followed uh, the so-called Delphi method to adjudicate every treatment for every genetic disease that we thought had an effective therapy. And we did this also by integrating 13 information resources that have valuable information sets that physicians want to know about their patients and, and may not be familiar with. And one of the examples is shown on the right, ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, which has about 10 different effective therapies. It's very unlikely that a pediatrician would know them all. And not only do they need to know what the treatments are, but what are the indications, what are the contraindications, how soon should you start the treatment after diagnosis, and then not only uh, is it efficacious, but how efficacious, and what's the evidence to support that? Is it just case reports? Are there any randomized studies? Has it been FDA approved? Physicians need to know all of this information so that they can weigh up the risk-benefit ratio for their individual patient. You know very clearly undertaking a heart transplant is not a decision that's considered lightly. Starting a dietary supplement is much simpler. So physicians need to know that context as they consider managing a patient acutely. Now, this is not to say we don't have subspecialists and super specialists who are the typical folk who manage these patients in the long run. The issue is there may be a time lag of days or weeks before you get that subspecialist consult. And in particular, as we get outside the major urban centers uh, and into more rural or uh, agricultural areas or, or less densely populated areas, where you may have to go hundreds of miles to see a subspecialist. So this is now completed. There's the URL for it. We screened uh, 563 diseases. We retained 421 as indeed having an effective therapy. We looked at 10,000 different possible treatments and retained 1527. And you can see their breakdown in terms of surgeries like transplant, dietary supplements, drugs, devices, and others. This is really exciting. We now have a one-two knockout punch. We have both rapid diagnosis and an ability to upskill frontline MDs so that they can practice like a super specialist in managing those critically ill children. But wait. For today only, I have a special offer. We have a third previously unannounced uh, focus. Um, and this is something that we started again with NIH a few years ago. There was a feasibility analysis of using genomic sequencing for newborn screening. Why am I so excited about this? Well, it's not a really good time to diagnose a child with a genetic disease when they're critically ill in an intensive care unit. The best time to diagnose their disease is before symptom onset, either at birth, if symptom onset is going to happen soon, or if indeed there's a treatment that can be started at birth that will completely prevent the disease, such as is the case with spinal muscular atrophy type one, or just waiting until symptom onset with careful screening to pick that up as early as possible. So we have now built this. We haven't really talked about it, but I wanted to give you a heads up. We'll look at it very briefly. On the bottom are the organizations who have joined us in building this system. So a couple of things uh, drove us to do this. First of all, we built out this system for diagnosis in a scalable manner. And we had built out this system for treatment guidance. Well, it turned out that we didn't need to do too much to translate that into a newborn screening system. It uses the same components, the same technologies. The difference is that now we are looking at a highly qualified subset of variants in a highly qualified subset of diseases only those that cause critical illness, only those where we understand the natural history, only those 
where we have an effective therapy and we know that starting the therapy early improves outcome. Those conditions meet the criteria established in, I believe it was 1968, uh, the so-called Wilson and Youngner criteria for newborn screening. We intend to uh, clinical trial this both in the NICU, but also in the newborn nursery. So I have two proofs of concept. We've just finished these in the last couple of weeks. The first was to examine it in the UK Biobank. This is an amazing resource. You can pay for access to this and we look at 30,000 known disease causing variants and we said what's our probable uh, positive rate in these adults and it was 0.7 percent that's too high that would give us a low uh, positive predictive value however by blocking only five variants and three risk factor disorders we got that down to 0.2%, which is in the range that we needed it to be to give us a positive predictive value of 50%. We also looked at 2,000 uh, or so diagnosed babies or babies who had received rapid whole genome sequencing in an ICU admission uh, who were suspected of having genetic disease. And we found that this very focused screen had a 55% sensitivity compared with diagnostic rapid whole genome sequencing. These results are good enough that we're now moving into the next phase, which is to set up uh, a clinical trial that's adequately powered to prove out both the clinical utility and the cost effectiveness like we did over the last few years for diagnostic rapid whole genome sequencing. So last slide. Diagnostic rapid whole genome sequencing is an effective first tier test for genetic disease diagnosis in hospitalized children with diseases of unknown etiology. It's revolutionary and it's starting to become widespread as it's reimbursed. Second of all, we've built a brand new system to bridge for frontline physicians, the gap in their knowledge so that not only can they order a genome-based test and get a result, but they can immediately translate that into effective individualized therapies, so precision medicines. This is well poised to be built upon as a new slew of drugs is developed, which I'm sure Tina talked about in her first talk. And lastly, also in light of this impending revolution in terms of genetic therapies, we are in the process now of building newborn screening by rapid whole genome sequencing as a new starting point to just eliminate the diagnostic odyssey for conditions for which an effective therapy is available. So I am on the pro looking for collaborators in order to accomplish what I just outlined will take a village and it requires all types of different skill sets and so I am very keen to have this be trialed in California obviously and to have representation from all of these groups. I haven't acknowledged everybody who contributed to this unfortunately but this is a good chunk of them and I also want to acknowledge support from NIH. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Kingsmore. Um, wow, that was amazing. A very compelling um, case study you had there too. I have a question, questions from the audience. Um, and the first one is, what are the reasons that um, newborn screening by this um, RWGS is 55% sensitive to known conditions? Are there changes that can be made to dried blood spot amount and handling that would increase that sensitivity? Or is it possible that a blood draw could become more of the standard of care that's much more sensitive? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, this it has not got anything really to do with the assay. It's got to do with the interpretation. So in uh, diagnostic sequencing, we can have a very broad search. Why? Because we have phenotypes. We have detailed phenotypes 
on the baby's actual symptoms, signs, and lab values. And so we can survey all 7,100 known genetic diseases, and we can also interpret variants of uncertain significance. In a screen, you got none of that. You've got an ostensibly healthy baby, and you have to have a bulletproof set of variants where you've culled out all those variants of uncertain significance because you have to have a high positive predictive value. That comes at a cost in terms of sensitivity, but the good news is with time, we're building this as a learning system, and with time, our knowledge of disease-causing variants is getting better and better. 55% is actually, to me, really good um, for now. Yeah, great. So as a follow-up question, um, someone said, it's very interesting about the phenotype. Do you think family history will be able to appreci appreciably increase the sensitivity for um, the whole genome? So he here, here's the really exciting thing. Once we have performed a genome at birth, it's not like we dump that data. We will have a system for keeping that data in your electronic health record. And that's where that, the answer to that question becomes, there'll be a secondary use case that if you and your doctor agree that you would like to look at the genome, let's say you start to get shortness of breath or anemia or liver dysfunction, you can get an interpretation of that genome or something pops up in a family history, you can get your genome reinterpreted. Uh, in a directed manner that's informed by your symptomatology. So that's a beautiful use case where no longer do we have that incredible rush to get a genome if you become critically ill. Your genome's on file. We just need to reinterpret it in light of the new symptoms. Yeah, great. I mean, it'd be good to have that information available. Um, so going back to your case study, um, how often is whole genome sequencing diagnosis done if a patient has a clinical diagnosis like the infection? Um, that's another really good question. And there is definitely a learning curve. What pediatricians are learning is that clinical diagnoses are just what they are, which is clinical diagnoses. You know, we as clinicians are really proud of our skills and our ability to formulate a differential diagnosis. What we're finding though is we need data-driven diagnosis, right? A genome, once it becomes reimbursed, is gonna be such a simple way of ruling in and ruling out some of those things that are lowered on on the differential diagnosis list because they're uncommon, but giving great peace of mind to the pediatrician and to the family that those rare treatable conditions have actually been evaluated. So it just wasn't possible hitherto. And so we're seeing increasingly that doctors are starting to become more critical of their clinical skills as they get familiar with the technology and are moving from genome being last tier test to being first tier test. Yeah, great. Um, as far as, actually, I have another question here. Um, so the whole genome sequencing is a large amount of data. How are you planning for portability of large amounts of data? Is this for the cloud? That's Do you have hopes great that question. Who will support financing this? Yeah, uh, so that's actually two questions. So we thought a lot about the data management system. So for this to work, we need every race and ethnicity and ancestral group to be represented in sufficient volume to know the allele frequencies. So we're really talking here about millions of genomes. So you need a very robust data management system. And I didn't have time to talk about it. I only had 30 minutes, but we have that. We've built it. It's called a sparse array data management system. And it makes use of the fact that 99.8% of the genome is reference. So in reality, we don't need to store 99.8% of the data. There's no value to it. So that's a solution that brings the cost, the incremental cost down to 6.6 .6 cents per new genome added, which is pretty good. And yes, it's on the cloud, it's on AWS. 
which also right. means the kind of data aggregation somewhat worldwide. Who will pay for it? We're trying to figure that out. It's a huge undertaking, but we've got a huge amount of interest from pharmaceutical companies who uh, are very invested, obviously, in getting their new uh, excellently effective therapies, particularly gene therapies for these diseases actually prescribed in children who need them. That's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. In the um, interest of time, we must move on. Um, perhaps I can pass along any further questions that I've received from, from our audience. By all means. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, my colleague, Nate Prorock. Um, he is a senior program manager of the Catalyst program and managing digital health projects, and also is the co-director of our UCSF Launchpad, supporting student innovation and entrepreneurship. He has a master's in health administration and has dedicated his career to improving global health, well-being, and education. This includes living in Peru as part of the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, where with local communities, he helped develop sustainable solutions um, in health and education. So Nate, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jenny. And for all participants, feel free to add all your questions in the Q&A. All right, now to our next presenter. Emil Kakis is a medical geneticist by training and a pioneer in the development and commercialization of treatments for rare diseases. He is the founder and CEO at Ultragenics, a biopharmaceutical company developing novel products for the treatment of rare and ultra rare diseases. Before founding Ultragenics in 2010, Dr. Kakis guided and contributed to the development of multiple approved rare disease products as Chief Medical Officer at Biomarin Pharmaceutical. Furthermore, Dr. Kakis recently published a book titled Saving Ryan on his journey to develop a first ever treatment for an ultra rare genetic disease called MPS. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kakis as he presents on the state of the art of rare disease treatments. Thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you uh, for ECSF and the program for inviting me today. I will share my screen. Hopefully that will work. There we go. So um, I'm, I'm here to talk today about the state of the art for rare disease treatments. It's, it's obviously a huge area, so I won't be able to really cover everything that's going on, but I'll try to give you a sense of it, uh, of the field and what, what's going on in the rare disease space. A little from my own perspective and a little bit about what I see um, is going forward, going to be uh, the challenges for us. The, um, I think if you had to summarize the whole story, it's there's been dramatic progress, but there are serious challenges and dramatic progress because there have been so many technologies now that are successfully treating diseases and in a very specific underlying cause way. I think that's the, the evolution of gene therapies, antisense oligonucleotides, siRNAs, enzymes, proteins, antibodies, small molecules, chaperones, all kinds of other approaches. And a lot of them are working and many of them approve. And I'll talk through some of them today. And the strategies are novel. The original, we talked about replacement therapies, but now we're seeing things that help manage a result that might otherwise thought to be impossible. And I think it's exciting to see so many first ever rare diseases getting studied and treated these days. But there have been a lot of challenges. And I think the world, for some reason, is becoming more difficult in terms of the regulatory and reimbursement world. There's more demands, more increasing demands as if there's an infinite amount of money when working on a disease that affects a rare disease. And I'll give you some examples of that, but I think it's been the number of demands from the number of regulatory agencies across the world has just dramatically increased the cost. And this really threatens the potential that we may not be able to use all the science we have to treat as many patients as we could. One of the key areas is not only the failure to accept, but the derision of biomarkers in rare diseases as being an appropriate way for treatment. And I would argue to you that many of the biomarkers are a more accurate way to measure disease activity than many clinical endpoints, which are highly confounded by very complex factors. And we need to change that story because I think there are many diseases and many of the ones that are rare now that are not getting treated are neurological diseases where 
the long-term timeframes, the complexity and variability and irreversibility will make it very hard to design and develop drugs using very slow and unresponsive clinical endpoints. And I'll give you some examples of why that is. But I think the last thing is, of course, cost and access and the concerns of these very expensive therapies is there are more and more of them. How are we going to be, how is it going to be sustainable? And if we build these drugs, will people be actually get treated? And we can talk a little about that at the end of the story. I do think these are all solvable problems. I think they're all within our sphere. The truth is the biology, the science is the impossible part that is now getting solved. And if we can't solve the other parts of regulation reimbursement, then that is of course a sad moment when it's really all within our hands and spheres to think through those solutions. So my own story and I, last time we spoke, which was five years ago now, which it seems like with the pandemic between, I think it, it seems like ages ago, but it was five years ago. I talked about you know, my own story in the beginning as a assistant professor in a bungalow and developing an enzyme replacement therapy, finding the money to do this and getting it finally through the process. It was incredibly challenging and had its own story about biomarkers initially accepted by the FDA, then rejected by the FDA and a complex randomized trial required, which in my view is not needed. But when you look at the um, program, I think for me, one of the most powerful things was I was considered myself an academic physician and doing research and basic science, getting grants. But when you're in the room with a family getting a first infusion ever, and I was able to do this with the first 10 families, it's a transformative moment when you can be there and press the button, start an infusion and open the door to uncertainty rather than certain death, the child now has a different possible future. And the story of Ryan took a great turn this last year because a 30-year journey came to fruition with him now married. I went to his wedding last year. He's been on enzyme therapy since 1998. And so, you know, 24 years on enzyme therapy, survived, grew up, and I was able to attend his wedding. And that was the story now put in Saving Ryan, which is available now, finally. It's a good story for, from the standpoint, it talks about the struggle to develop a treatment and work through the process. So any families trying to do this for themselves or startup companies, others can kind of look at that struggle and understand what it takes. I think the most important thing, though, is you can get through. And despite a series of, of very difficult uh, challenges throughout that, including getting acceptance of biomarker endpoints, um, we were able to get through and change Ryan's future. And that's what we always hope to do. Now, when you look at the state of the art for rare disease therapeutics, most people tend to credit the Orphan Drug Act with everything. Like the credit Orphan Drug Act is the cause of all improvement. And I think the Orphan Drug Act was quite important and it was a good start, but it really didn't move the needle yet. It was a starting place and it provides some incentive. But the truth is it still costs a lot of money to develop a drug and tax benefits don't really matter. And it specifically doesn't matter if there's no one else developing it. So in the end of the day, it actually isn't quite enough. If you look at the first 10 years of the Orphan Drug Act between 82 and 92, actually there weren't that many complex, sophisticated drugs. Most of the drugs developed were, you know, were um, like small molecules that were being repurposed. There were a few antibodies type drugs for cancer, and I don't think of cancer so much when I think about rare diseases, but you talk about complex uh, products for rare genetic disorders. There are really only a few. I put a couple here. The truth is there was a lot of things that were missing, complexity of technology, development strategy, and financial support because large investments for those type of products were involved. And it's highlighted my time at that, in those days, in 93, I was trying to get I went to a company called Orphan Medical. There was a company called Orphan Medical to work on orphan disease. And I had, I wanted to work on my MPS1 program. And they told me, no, your disease is too rare for Orphan Medical. And I thought, well, with Orphan Drug Act, doesn't that help? And the truth is, it takes far more money and Orphan Drug Act is nowhere near enough. So the question is, what, what has been happening and why have there been so many more programs? And if you look at the history, and this is a, the orphan drug approval, it's really, since around 2003, there's a period where the 
there's a rapid growth, both all drug, all orphan drug approvals, but a lot of the complex biologics, which is dark bar. You know, you might wonder what, what happened. And one of the things I believe that happened is in the late 90s, the, um, the work with Genzyme had with Ceridase, which was a drug treating only a few thousand people, but was very expensive, was generating enough income to actually justify the investment in other programs. That investment beginning in the 98 range, this is when Biomarin got started and where I was involved, and approval of Aldurazim was 2003. And from that point, there was a rising trend, you know, increasing the number of biologics uh, through to today. You know, when I look at what's going on then, what, what's the cause of this improvement? And I think people think about the drug legislation. I think it's had some effect and advanced technology definitely has opened the door to more treatments as well as how to do clinical development. But, you know, regulatory policy has changed somewhat, but in some ways, for example, with biomarkers, it's gotten maybe more difficult at times. It's highly variable whether you can get improvement here, but there have been some improvements and some acceptance of what's required of the requirements. I think the financial potential though has been helping create a situation where you can attract tens of millions of dollars of involvement required to take an ultra rare disease through. And if it wasn't there, it wouldn't happen. And I just want people to be really clear about that. And we're gonna come back to that as we talk about access as well, right? But without the financial potential, there's no way to get the kind of investment required to actually develop an effective drug and do it promptly. Now, the experience of some of the ones I've been involved with are shown here. So I've been through a lot of programs. All of them involve an academic scientist. And, and sometimes when I'm on Capitol Hill, they, they tell me that you know, all the scientists invented the drug, the company didn't do anything. And I think all these scientists developed an idea for a drug, but an idea that you treated a mouse with, it's not a drug. The difference between that and a, and a drug that's approved is dramatic. It's 10 to 100 times more money and dramatically more effort. And I think it's really important that the partnership between industry and academia is extremely important to this. But when I was a scientist, I came up with an idea for a drug, but to truly make a drug that is an approved product that is listed and available, meeting all the standards um, around the world is a far bigger task and involves a lot. And you know, this is true for one reason. People ask me, well, you know, that's just because, you know, what companies are doing, but Every year, there are thousands of patents, therapeutic patents out there, right? Thousands of them issued. But yet there's only, let's say, 30 to 50 approvals. So what is the difference between thousands of patents and 30 to 50 approvals? Why are there such a difference? That's what the industry does. The industry has to work through thousands of possible ideas for drugs, figure out which ones are plausible, do the development. And among some of those, they do succeed and you end up with a few drugs. But that difficulty of conversion, I think, is one challenge that is really part of the state of the art and the challenge we have. Can we make it more efficient? My original program was here with Dr. Neufeld, and she cloned the gene, and I worked with her in getting to the clinic. And I've told you that story before. It was quite, quite uh, looking back, I would say it would be impossible to do it again. I was very lucky with the way we were able to get through, but it was, it was at the edge of the cliff for many years. If you look after that, another program that we were able to develop, MPS-6 enzyme therapy, this is John Hopwood who invented the science. And this is an example where manufacturing was actually the difficult part. This enzyme was very difficult to make. And two companies started working on this and quit when they figured out how hard it was to make and how costly it was. They said it wasn't viable to make it now, Byron picked it up and we had developed a very complex perfusion culture process to make this thing, but it was quite expensive and the product is expensive. But because it was expensive, a lot us to do this costly thing. And over time, they helped manage the cost of manufacturing, but the product was, does work, is approved, and has really changed lives for more patients. I mean, excuse me, Maritola me patients. Now, another case example of update a little more nearer term in the last, in the last five years, the SLI syndrome, MPS7 enzyme replacement therapy. Now MPS7 
The big challenge for this one is there's only 20 patients in the whole United States. And because I had developed other MPS enzyme therapies, I was committed to trying to get this one done. In the picture here is Bill Sly standing next to me and Bill and his wife attending the first infusion of an MPS7 patient with a enzyme replacement therapy. This took every possible angle we could on biomarker endpoints, a complex novel clinical endpoint strategy, managing cost of manufacturing, and to try to develop a treatment that's going to have, it still has around 20 patients in the United States on treatment, but yet it's changing their lives. And this little boy who was in terrible situation, was really close to dying, is doing really well as a grown up. He's been on the enzyme therapy. Um, since 2013. So he's been on therapy nine years and he's done, done pretty well. He's still a physically uh, harmed child, but he has definitely done well. And we saved his life, no doubt, since he was on death's door. So you can do it, you can get through. Now, one of the other things that's happened, I think that's been exciting is sort of the, the change in the route, taking drugs we have and putting them a different way. And so one of those was just putting enzyme therapy in the spinal fluid when you're trying to treat the brain because getting into the brain has been always difficult. And the early work was done in around 99, 2000. And very soon there were a number of biologics, including antisense organonucleotides, enzymes, and antibodies and other things that people are putting in the intrathecal space to treat the brain. This program ultimately um, originally devised by Dr. Lobel. He wasn't a big fan of the intrathecal enzyme, but the gene therapy program actually failed, partly because you need a large amount of enzyme they couldn't get enough made. But when you do the enzyme replacement, you could give enough enzyme. And this is now approved and treating kids with late infant health Batten's disease. But again, solving a problem with a different way, but just changing the route administration and using an enzyme. But the idea was had, but it took a lot more work to get through and actually develop a successful treatment. Now, past the enzyme therapies, I worked on PKU, and in the last few years, there's been a new one, Paling Zinc, developed, which is an, uh, an alternative enzyme. Instead of replacing the missing enzyme, you're using another enzyme from bacteria that you've coated with plastic, essentially, and are using that to shunt off a toxic metabolite, phenylalanine. Kuvan is like a chaperone-type therapy, two different ways of, of working on the same problem and they work in different types of patients. But again, new types of technology and approaches to solving a medical problem. This is work from Dr. Scriber and Dr. Koch, and it was very pleasing for them to see the work become something. Pal and Zeke originally was thought to be, was planned to be an oral therapy, but it was not going to work. That was Charlie Scriber's idea. And it ended up needing to be an injectable, pegylated version, and that's what we came up with. So the idea helped start the program, but it ended up becoming a very different drug. More recently, um, we were able to get a product called Ojolvi approved. This is a, a, a triglyceride of, set of C7 fatty acids, and it's an, a clever engineering of metabolic pathways that are altered in patients with fatty acid oxidation defect. So it's a small molecule that actually restores the Krebs cycle and bypasses the genetic defect. Dr. Rowe, shown here, recently passed away, but he had spent 12 years studying patients clinically in his clinic, and no one would pick up the product and develop it because it was a weird-looking oil, and people thought they just didn't know what to do with it. We were able to pick up the program, get it developed. It's now approved in the U.S., in Canada, and Brazil. And around 300 kids in the United States now getting access and treatment. We heard about heart failure in the other kids. These kids also can potentially get terrible heart failure, but by providing a, um, this bypass um, and drug that restores the Krebs cycle, the patients can actually metabolize energy much better. It can re re reduce heart failure and prevent um, significant effects on a muscle function as well as um, hypoglycemia. So it's a, it's a way to engineer metabolism using a small molecule. Not everything has to be super fancy drug therapy to actually change the future for patients. Most recently, um, a recent approval 
is another strategy, and this is for a disease called achondroplasia. In the upper picture is Dr. Ray David Ramoyne. He passed away a few years ago now, but he was a big skeletal dysplasia person down at Cedar Sinai, and working with him on the right lower was Bill Wilcox. In this disease, there's a defect in a signaling, transmembrane signaling uh, protein, a receptor, and that defect turns that sig receptor is always on. And I looked at this disease myself and I would say, there's no, how are you gonna treat this? This is an intrinsic broken receptor. There's no way to do it. But Dr. Wilcox came up with an idea to use another hormone that created a, an ex equally opposite downstream signal. So instead of fixing the broken signal, you would stimulate another receptor that had an equal opposite downstream signal, just knowing the signaling pathways through ERK. And um, he showed that could work in cell culture. And so at, at Biomarin, they made a modified C nature peptide variant that was stable that could actually, once a day injectable, actually get to the cartilage and balance out the signal and improve the growth and bone structure of these kids with achondroplasia. Showing you another, what was impossible bone disease and finding a way forward by knowing the biology. And I think it's another example of how even impossible diseases can come up with solutions. We're working on another one like this now, Osteogenes Imperfecta, which has a defect in collagen. And we all thought, well, we have a defect in collagen, it's very hard to fix that and prevent the brittle bones. But it turns out if you simply um, look at these patients carefully, you figure out that they're actually over resorbing their bone. They're actually their own, they're making their bone weaker in a maladaptive response to the abnormal collagen. If by you simply turn on bone anabolism, you can balance out the bone and in animal models make their bones have normal strength, even though the collagen is defective. So it tells you, even though we think we know what's going on, when you get into therapeutics, sometimes you discover more. So let me talk, so again, this is another one, a gene therapy. And the, the great promise of gene therapy is that some of these completely impossible diseases like spinal muscular atrophy, which is due to neurons being lost in the spinal cord, can be successfully treated with an IV therapy that delivers a small amount of the protein. And that got approved on these data showing improvement in, in motor function using the CHOP in 10 score. A very exciting thing. And I had so many families SMA struggling before and to have something Moving, moving forward, I think is very exciting. It just shows how the door is open to treatment of disease that we couldn't treat before. We've done a work on glycogen storage disease. I'll skip through this. It was another enzyme therapy, but for a different, but for the liver, and that's in uh, entering clinical trial, phase three trials. sRNA and other nucleic acid therapies have shown incredible work. This is work of an sRNA to the liver and for acute um, intermittent porphyria, a disease which has these serious acute attacks, it was the cause of disease and the madness of King George. If you saw the movie of King George, it was a, a metabolic defect and the sRNA blocks the creation of a toxic intermediate with a, an incredible 90% reduction in TAC rate. This is an sRNA into a nucleic acid therapy. I think a very exciting piece of progress in the siRNA field. There have been a number of siRNA uh, improvements. The last thing I'll touch on from therapeutic development is the incredible progress on gene editing. Now, I think gene editing is still a ways off in vivo. Ex vivo, I think there's a lot more in control, but the first experiments in vivo, that is where using an LNP, a lipid nanoparticle, there was a delivery of a gene editing um, agent by the company Intelia and showed that they could chew on the TTR gene and knock down its expression. It's a protein that tends to form fibrils and cause a neurologic disease. And they were able to knock that down in humans using uh, the LNP. And I think very exciting work. And I think for the knockdown purposes of something produced in the liver, um, this seems like a, a really credible step forward whether you're gonna replace genes yet, I think that's a little further out, but I think it is exciting to see that something like this technology coming forth and actually being successful in the clinic. So a lot of great successes, but <clears throat> the downside of all this is costs and expectations, they are rising. The number of studies, the design type, 
everyone thinks you're doing large randomized studies for some reason all the time for everything, even when it's really unethical or impossible. The amount of work in Europe, for example, pediatric investigational plans, they're making us do juvenile talks for different age groups of animals. And the truth is that when it's been evaluated, those extra talk studies are useless. They do not predict anything. They just torture animals and waste money. But all of these extra requirements are just in case there's some tiny possibility of something. And that level of care just drives us into the, into the ground and takes a lot of the ultra rares off the table because it's so much more cost that it can't be done. And the number of requests for validating every single endpoint, well, when you're dealing with disease as like 20 people in the United States, it's really not possible to consider. And we need to have a lot more rational sense and it's being lost. And I would say to you that we need to get the ability to use alternative study designs and analyses and the ability to use reasonable disease activity biomarkers, that is biomarkers from the primary process, primary state of the process, not downstream markers. I think we need to be able to do this, particularly for the more difficult to treat diseases, which will not, won't get treated. And this is a policy change that needs to happen. It also about who's at FDA, who's at EMA, and what do they really want? What do we all want? Do we want to make it so difficult that only perfect things get through? Or do we want people to get their first shot at a first therapy that can lead to the medical evolution of better treatments? So we need to do more. Just to give you an idea, and most of you probably have never seen anything like this, we thought it'd be useful for you to see what a filing for approval takes. Uh, it will show you, particularly under yellow box, the MEPSEVI filing, which is for MPS7. I told you the 20 in the United States. This is a filing in the US for approval to treat 20 patients. As you can see, there were 77,000 pages in this application with 276,000 hyperlinks between different documents. All right, there were over a thousand individual documents in this filing. If you look at the Diljovi filing, you can see even more, 228,000 pages. The amount of work it takes to put this number of filings and documents together means an entire team. I showed you a picture earlier of this team. If you have that many people working, in the end, the costs are driven up and this just creates unnecessary complexity. It is way over past what's required. I think we need to re realign ourselves on what's really important. And right now it's, I think it's just, um, it's getting to an insane level of work and demands and expectations. So I'm getting close to the end here. I think we need more accelerated approval path. We need to also have reimbursers accept that accelerated approval is real approval. And we all as scientists among us need to start growing up and recognizing the disease activity biomarkers that look at actual active disease are actually a more powerful, more accurate way of looking at disease. And that clinical endpoints are highly confounded by a lot of variabilities and irreversibility. And so that irreversible disease makes it very hard. If we create too much difficulty for getting these treatments approved, we'll never get to newborn screening because it will not be implemented. We heard about those criteria. It will not get done because you don't have a treatment. And so right now we're looking at a lot of these complex neurologic diseases that are midway down their course, trying to get them approved on making someone better now with the hope we can actually treat them at the appropriate time. And unless we get to using primary disease by activity biomarkers to get comfortable, we won't be able to accelerate our development. And if you think about HIV and all those other diseases out there, um, you would be impossible to develop HIV treatment without a biomarker. You can't use opportunistic infections to study a drug to prevent AIDS. It would never work. You would never succeed in making a quad or highly active retroviral therapy. Because I'm kind of running a little short time, I'm gonna skip the next part. Um, the Doing the biomarker approvals has been incredibly difficult. I wrote this paper. I suggest you look at it at how hard it is to get a biomarker approved. This is a five-year period when I did the analysis and all of the products approved in that five-year period had already been approved using a biomarker or, or a different drug approved in the 1990s before they had a lot of rules. And so once it's been in, then they're grandfathered, but if there's something new, then it became difficult. And since then, I've had a couple that I've seen approved. I had one phenylalanine in, in 2007, but I can tell you it takes an incredible effort. 
and it shouldn't, it should be better. If we had that improvement, we could actually develop for a same billion investment. That's a straight through no failure type number. We could have three times as many drugs developed for the same amount of money if we were better at this. And a lot of those diseases are neurological. That doesn't mean we have a biomarker for every neurological disease, but if you think about how many there are, the benefit to the society being able to get many more products approved more efficiently will actually accelerate our ability to not just get the first treatment, but the second, the third, as people continue improvement. Now, one of the last things I'll touch on to close is um, one of the concerns people have is like these dramatic prices for things and how is that gonna work? And certainly Ultranx, we, our products are expensive, but we believe in responsible pricing. We've been moving more moderating our price point. And what we do is we basically guarantee in the US that patients will get treated if they're appropriate. If there's any financial reason they can't get treated, we'll, we'll make sure they get treated anyways. That's certainly our commitment and many companies do make that kind of commitment. But the question is, how are we gonna deal with $2 million price points? Um, so Genzma is a dramatic treatment. The effect is worth it, but how many people can we support with that kind of price point? And I think that's a challenge. And I think we're gonna see the other side of that challenge is what happened to Bluebird in Europe where the pricing was less than the cost of doing the therapy for them. And they actually pulled from the European market for this a treatment for thalassemia. Now in the US, just just this week, Bluebird got reviewed by ICER, who, who agreed to the $2 billion price point, which is, which is great. I think that that value is real, but the truth is it's still hard. How do we get access, equitable access across the world when we have $2 million therapies? I do think we have to work on getting better and better at it, but I, I believe that this is, a, this is gonna be a challenge for all the gene therapy field and how we deal with the true cost of these things and the true value and getting to a point of acceptance and equity. So my conclusions, look, there is a lot of excitement for how much is going on, but if we wanna keep this moving, we need to improve access to accelerated approval. And I'm, I'm coining the term primary disease activity biomarkers. These are markers that measure the beginning of disease, which I think are very accurate and are the way forward. And we need to start what I call the, met, the walk of medical evolution. You can't wait for the treatments to be perfect. You have to start the first one, get it approved, and then drive for better. If I showed you the story of HIV, when that drug was approved, the first drugs were approved on, by, on the accelerated approval, there was predictions that would ruin the whole field of, of drug development, that all this would be just junk. Instead, the opposite happened, and none of those people that wrote those reviews or were at FDA like will publicly remind us what they actually said. The truth was by opening the door to the biomarker, they started with one biomarker and then realized there's a better one and they moved to the better one. But in a 16 year period, they had 29 drugs and four combinations approved and achieved highly active retroviral therapy. We are just getting through a pandemic, but some of us remember in the late eighties, in the eighties, when the AIDS epidemic we thought was gonna take over the world. And yet we solved it, we solved it with a primary disease activity biomarker and the force of clinical um, development from a number of companies, we got through it. I think if you applied that to the rare disease world, you would see many more drugs approved and we'd start the medical evolution that is a first drug, then a second and a better one. So we have to modernize our view. And in the end, whatever we create, if we can reduce the cost of this, maybe that can reduce the return and we can lower the cost structure of this whole business. But access can't be optional. We as companies and others developing drugs have to build into our programs support for access, for equitable access for products. And it's not just an option, it's gotta be a requirement. So that, that's it for me. Um, and thank you um, for having me today. Wow, that was fantastic. Certainly, and no doubt about it, a landmark lecture. So thank you very much for your time today and for your incredible um, time and energy and everything that you have lent to society with all these fantastic treatments for rare diseases. In the interest of time, we're going to move on without questions, and I will pass it off to uh, the director of the UCSF Catalyst Program, Charles Hart. 
Hey, thank you very much, Nate. And yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kakas. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stan Crook. Um, next on the, the podium, Stan uh, is the founder, chairman, and CEO of the Enlorum Foundation, which is pioneering treatments uh, for ultra rare diseases. Some diseases that only have a single patient that have been I, identified. Uh, before Enlorum, uh, Stan founded uh, Ionis, over 30 years ago that have pioneered um, nucleic acid-based therapies. Uh, and before that, he ran research for Smith Klein Beecham and his uh, MD and PhD degrees are from the Baylor School of Medicine. So without further ado, I turn it over to Stan Crook. Thank you, Stan. Thanks, uh, uh, Charles, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, you folks to what we're doing at Enlorum. Let me just get the slides up here. So Enlorum is a nonprofit foundation that I initiated in January of 2020. So we're a bit more than, than two years of, of age. And um, our mission is to take advantage of the technology that was created and advanced and still advancing and validated under my leadership to discover, develop, manufacture and provide experimental ASO treatments to what I call nano rare patients. And to do that one patient at a time and to do all that for free for life. I'll just say that again, for free for life. Um, and uh, I do think that it's time to parse patient populations a little more precisely than we have, uh, but for the moment, let's just focus on the nano rare, what I'm calling the nano rare patient. This is the rarest of patient populations. Many of our patients uh, appear to be unique. That is based on what we know today, that patient and that patient alone has a mutation that produces a severe disease. Others are members of a very, very exclusive but not attractive club uh, that involve maybe as many as 30 patients around the world. Since these mutations are typically de novo, those patients are spread around the world. Uh, and because of extreme difficulties in making diagnosis, most of these patients, uh, when they're discovered, are at varying stages in these diseases. So these patients are the most isolated and, um, and severely ill, desperate patients that I've encountered. Um, and, and in addition to being severely ill, typically these uh, diseases may uh, manifest in multiple organs. And of course, uh, many of these mutations manifest in infancy. So about two thirds of our patients so far are, um, are children. And obviously in addition to the primary um, effects of the disease, we also have significant developmental overlays that complicate the clinical picture. Um, and in addition to all the other challenges that these patients have, um, because of delays in diagnosis, most of the time when we get patients, these patients are very far progressed. And in, in many cases, they are in urgent need of treatment. And I'll introduce you to a, a patient who, who, who qualifies for that description. The one uh, giant plus that we have in the nanorare patient is that the vast majority of these patients have an identifiable mutation in a single gene that is causal for the disease. And uh, uh, once we know the mutation, whether the disease has a name or not, it really doesn't make any difference because we have the information we need to go to work to make an ASO. So we are at Enlorum, I think, for the first time on an industrial scale practicing mutation-directed drug discovery and development. We are absolutely agnostic as to disease, really doesn't matter to us. Actually, the names of diseases are mostly archaic and many centuries old and probably should be discarded anyway. We have an actionable uh, event when we know that mutation. Now, um, I suspect to some of you, the idea of mounting a drug discovery and development program for a single patient and then giving the drug away uh, for life um, sounds impossible. It certainly did to me, uh, having uh, you know been responsible for leading about uh, perhaps 25 drugs on our market, including Spinraza, the drug I think 
uh, uh, led the way in 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 SMA. Um, but about five years ago, I, I realized that in principle, the technology we had developed could do this. And it was such a foreign concept to me that I, I spent a few months just checking my numbers and checking my sanity. But, but as I show you, it can be done. Uh, so um, this conceptual framework really is remarkable in itself in that um, I think it was unimaginable uh, before five years ago. Second component uh, that I think is critically important in this endeavor is that we are industrializing the process. This is drug discovery and development, and these are complex drugs. And so every step in the process has to be of highest quality, especially the identification of the optimal ASO. And, and as I'll show you, we've put in processes that allow us to do that and take advantage of three plus decades of experience. And even though each of these patients may be unique, we know now that there are millions of these patients in, in the world. And as more human genomes are sequenced, uh, that number is going to grow. So any solution um, can, uh, that you contemplate can't be just a solution for a single patient. It needs to be scalable. So industrialization of this process, I think, is, is critical. And we are uh, pioneering a, a new model. Um, uh, it, it is a nonprofit model, and I'll walk you through why I think that's essential. But that does mean that um, we are um, uh, trailblazing. Every step we take is a step into the unknown. And it also provides an extraordinary opportunity to learn. And I'm astonished at all the things I've learned in, in just these two years, and we're just beginning. And so we are committed to learning maximally from each patient and from the aggregate experience. We're entirely open access. We encourage our investigators to publish case reports. As I'll, I'll show you, uh, we plan to publish uh, uh, the results that we have annually and to share that uh, knowledge broadly. And there's just an extraordinary amount to be learned here. So uh, I guess the next question then is, what do you need to even think about doing this? Well, as Emil said, in the vast majority of developed economies, uh, healthcare funding, despite how much it is, is not sufficient to provide quality care for, for patients with common disease. And so uh, I think we must be aware of the economic realities of healthcare today. And, and for a single patient to add multiple millions of dollars just simply isn't on. We also need access to the patients, of course, but we need much more than that. We need that patient to be genotypically characterized and very, very thoroughly phenotypically characterized. We need an, a, 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 a research physician capable of caring for that patient while administering an experimental agent. And we need institutions that are willing and able uh, to do all that. Uh, uh, the third leg of this is obviously a supportive regulatory environment, and I'm pleased to say we have that, and I'll come back and describe that for you. And then, obviously, you have to have a technology that can do this, and ASO technology is, is a technology that can. Uh, so why a, nano, uh, a, a nonprofit approach? I mean, there's much to commend the commercial model. We, we know how to use it. <laughs> It, it's very straightforward. It may be overly costly and overly bureaucratic, but we know how to do it. However, uh, ASOs are supervised by the drug division. The drug division has historically been much more rigid than the, than, than the biologics division. And, but it's very clear there is no path to approval for these patients. Um, it, it is not possible to do a controlled clinical trial or two controlled clinical trials to meet commercial uh, requirements in a single patient, or even if you have 20 or 30 that are spread around the world. Um, probably equally importantly to me is if one were able to actually achieve commercial approval to make economic sense of it, as Emil just discussed, uh, we'd have to charge these patients and families many, many millions of dollars a year. Uh, and, I, and I think surely we can do better than that. So one of the objectives of Van Lorm is to make it economically uh, unjustifiable uh, to do that. Uh, we give the drugs away. Um, 
then patient access and access to the information we need. Early on in my thinking, I was introduced to the Undiagnosed Disease Network, and I imagine most of you are very familiar with it. But you know that it was initially an NIH intramural program and then was expanded um, to eight, ex I think, eight tertiary care centers and um, a central data hub and central facilities for gene functionalization and so on. And uh, so that was the first collaboration I did was to link up with, with the UDN. And the UDN, I think, has made very many important contributions. And among them, of course, just focusing on the undiagnosed disease patient. Um, and we know as a product of the work that UDN has done and, and our experience, that the vast majority of patients who have nanorare diseases are never diagnosed. They progress, succumb to their disease uh, without ever knowing uh, why their lives are shorter or less robust than the lives they see around them. So we know as we deal with the patients who are fortunate enough to make a diagnosis, that we're dealing with the tip of an enormous, enormous iceberg of misery and opportunity to learn. Um, interestingly, despite all the resources invested and pretty tight screening uh, processes, to date, only about a third of the patients accepted by the UDN, the UDN achieved a diagnosis. And I, again, I think that speaks to the need to learn more and, and, and to take every opportunity we have to drive um, a shine, a light into these spaces and, and, and learn from the light that's on them. Uh, for the lucky few who are diagnosed, average uh, time to diagnosis, uh, uh, UDN data is eight years. I would say our data so far would suggest it slightly shorter than that. Irrespective, uh, the journey to diagnosis is long and it's perilous. Almost all of these patients will have been misreferred, misdiagnosed, and frequently mistreated. Um, and finally, I think a key uh, plus that the UDN can claim, and, and justifiably so, is that it stimulated interest. And interestingly, uh, of the uh, about 150 cases now that we've had applications for, less than a third have come from UDN sites. Um, and that speaks to the growth of personalized medicine centers around the world, uh, which is great news for these patients. There's more people and more places to take care of them. So the UDN is, was a critical uh, component in what, what we're doing. Next is the regulatory process. Um, beginning in January of 2019, I wrote the senior leaders of the drug division um, and was astonished to get replies from all of them within 30 minutes that were positive, having been dealing with the FDA for almost 50 years. That was a first for me. Um, and importantly, the FDA, uh, at really light speed for the FDA, has completed issuing guidance for ASOs for the nanorare patients. This guidance is highly specific to ASOs. There is no other technology that has the guidance today. And it is also specific to the nonprofit provision of, of these drugs. And that's truly critical. Uh, we contributed multiple uh, proposals and I'm pleased to say a large fraction of them were incorporated into the guidance. We, uh, and we're still in discussions with the FTA. I think there are many things we can do to make these even more uh, efficient. But this is the rule book. And it allows us to go from, uh, from the gene to the patient uh, very expeditiously with very little preclinical information. Certainly nothing compared to a commercial drug. And again, that puts a higher and higher premium on doing each step as well as possible. But that's, that's the rule book and it provides uh, the rules that we and all the institutions and physicians who are working with us um, uh, depend on. And we applaud the FDA for the rapidity and, and the quality of the response that they provided. I'm now gonna focus on the technology and I'll be making some assertions in the next few slides. I don't have time to share the data, which makes me uncomfortable, but um, there have been a lot of reviews of the technology of late. There's a bunch that I've written, uh, but there are others as well. So if you want to learn more, you can, you can easily do that. 
uh, it's a long forgotten fact that um, when I founded Ionis in 1989, there were at least five, I think maybe six companies founded uh, by VCs to tackle the same opportunity. And of those, only Ionis succeeded. And I think there are a number of straightforward reasons to explain that. But certainly one of them is a set of decisions I made before founding Ionis. Uh, and, and, and this is germane to the nanorare patient. So I, I wanna walk you through it. Of course, I knew that we were to, if we were going to be successful, which seemed highly, highly unlikely, we'd have to take what was a blank piece of paper and, and write a textbook. And the first step in that, of course, is this is a, a chemically based discipline. And uh, before 1989, there had never been a medicinal chemistry effort in oligonucleotides. And so at Ionis, we built the largest and most successful. And, and our program at Ionis is um, oh, made and studied many thousands of different modifications and scores of different designs and so on. And that medicinal chemistry, of course, is the toolbox that's fueling uh, modern aptamers, CRISPR, siRNA, the, another form of ASOs, and so on. And, and it has led to the major classes of ASOs that are being used clinically today. We coupled that to massively parallel screening of target sites in RNA. Um, when we started, that was really almost impossible to do. Uh, as we look at it today, um, we've now screened many millions of ASOs in um, multiple systems and ever increasing numbers of human derived uh, cells. Uh, and that has generated, uh, I think, very sophisticated algorithms that support design of ASOs that are unique to us and automation that's unique. And, and it's that combination of experience and automation that makes the discovery of an optimal ASO for us almost um, a free. Uh, for an, a nanorare patient, an NLORM patient, we'll typically screen at least a thousand sites in the target RNA. And we do it because we know it's necessary. Uh, if you don't, you won't get the optimal ASO. And I like to say that to do that, we just put a couple of plates on the robot at night and come in in the morning and get the results. That's, that's a bit of hyperbole, but it is an extraordinarily efficient, extraordinarily inefficient, uh, inexpensive process for us. And then that, all of that was coupled to the work that I led over the years and still lead to understand the molecular mechanisms by which these agents produce the phenotypes that we observe. And it's that three plus decades of committed, integrated innovation that allows us uh, to do what we do. It's also important for me to uh, mention that Ionis uniquely um, has put together uh, um, integrated safety databases that integrate all the data from non-human primates through um, all the controlled clinical trials for each chemical class that we're doing. And since these agents just differ by sequence, um, by and large, you can predict what the next drug is going to do based on the 10 that you just, you just studied. And those databases are published on the first author on the first four, and they're available to regulatory agencies. And so armed with that, we know the dose, we have a good idea of the, of the frequency, the route, and we have a very good sense of what we should look for in terms of adverse events, which I think is the key to facilitating doing this and doing it well. And uh, once again, getting that, that optimal ASO is the critical step in this process. Uh, the technology is also much more versatile than people um, um, who aren't steeped in the technology realize. Of course, uh, RNSH1 has been an incredibly valuable pharmacological uh, mechanism, and we know and we understand it in detail, but we can use AGO2, you can use double strands or single strands if you have a, uh, if you have a stable phosphate that binds to the AGO2 AGO binding pocket. And thanks to understand, advances in understanding of um, RNA metabolism, 
We now know how to design ASOs to take advantage of a variety of other approaches that reduce the target RNA. And, and, and that's useful because on rare occasion, H1 is not the best mechanism until we have that versatility. More importantly, we've added um, a number of mechanisms now to driving alternative splicing, which we did in Spinraza for spinal muscular atrophy. Um, that allow us to selectively increase the production of proteins. And this is all driven by advances in understanding um, how mRNAs downregulate their own translation. About 50% of all the messages in human cells are downregulated by sequence or structural features in the, uh, in, in the mRNA. And in fact, the first UARF ASO um, that will go to the clinic will probably be um, uh, an NLARM patient. Um, um, since we discovered that mechanism, I'm very excited to see that one going into the clinic. We've also shown that we can administer these ASOs by essentially all routes of administration. And that, again, increases versatility. And, um, uh, and, and, um, and in addition, we have a lot of experience in all the various organs. So we are, there are limits, we can't fix null mutations. Uh, and certainly we look forward to the day when gene therapy can be industrialized to the place that it could tackle this. And we also choose to focus on only uh, five organs, three routes of deliveries. Why? Because these organs we know, we know we get great potency in these because the distribution is good. Uh, and so we have a really strong th therapeutic index and, and, and we think that's important given the limited preclinical data we have. So systemically sub-Q about once a month, but we can dose quarterly if we like. Um, for liver and kidney in the central nervous system, intrathecal every four months or, or thereabouts. These drugs are nice to give uh, as aerosol agents for uh, you know, lung uh, issues. And then we have more than three decades of experience with intravitreal administration, which today uh, we do every six months at most. Over on the right is the total annual dose for these patients. And um, smallest uh, run that we can do in a GMP facility is about 10 grams. These drugs are extremely stable as dry powders. So with a single manufacturing run, we can make enough drug to supply a patient for life. And so that, that part of free for life turns out to be not nearly as brazen as it may sound. And, and manufacturing is actually a relatively small component of the cost per patient. So I, I do wanna mention um, that NLARM has ambitions that go well beyond today. Of course, our first role is to treat the patients we can. And yes, there are patients we can't help. But I think what's important is the patients we can. That's a central dictum of therapeutics in my view. Treat today the people you can while you're working to make better treatments for more tomorrow. I think the quality systems that I'll describe for you are critical and we're hoping that others follow us as they consider entering this space. We know that this is a way too big a task for little old N. Lorem and I'm very pleased with the progress that we've made in putting a network of collaborators, donors, and partners. And I think, but and, and and I think in the end, it's going to take a city rather than a village. But we're on our way. We're committed to learning, and we're committed to sharing. We're an open access organization, uh, and we'd be delighted to share the data with you as we have them. Uh, I think it is obvious that that uh, as Emil said and others have said, treatment always is the tip of the spear. If you want to drive uh, advances in diagnosis, the best thing to do is to have some treatment. Certainly that was the case with, with uh, SMA. With Spinraza, we then had the opportunity to drive um, genetic testing for SMA into newborns. And we showed that if we treated these patients before they became symptomatic, most of these kids grew up like normal, healthy children, which is kind of hard to, to beat. Similarly here, uh, I think the opportunity to treat even a fraction of the patient will drive uh, progress. And the key step, as has been mentioned several times, 
is to introduce a, a genomic sequencing into newborn screening. It's actually happening in the UK. It, it's starting to happen in the UAE and in other countries. Um, th this is happening. So it, it will happen in America and treatment will drive the way. And then finally, as I mentioned, these patients are isolated. Uh, they have no one to talk to. And so we're working very hard to put a patient support system together that will both educate and give them a forum for, for their, voices, their voices to be heard. We'll, we'll, we'll introduce that a little later this year. Progress. While, we were, while I was setting up NLORM, we had the opportunity to help two investigators treat 14 patients. That experience was really valuable, uh, particularly because it anticipated the guidance from the FDA. By far the most informative are Neil Schneider's 11 FUS ALS patients. FUS ALS is uh, arguably the most aggressive form of ALS. And, um, and uh, typically I think of average lifespan after symptom onset is 16 months. This paper, if you haven't seen it, is worth reading. Very interesting. Um, a, a, a pair of identical twins, one of whom developed symptoms of a FUS AS, ALS when she was 16 and died promptly. And then her sister, identical twin, didn't become symptomatic until, until 25. This is one of the urgent cases we had. We, she was in hospice on a ventilator. Uh, so we really didn't think we'd be able to get the drug to her, but she was treated and she did get stronger. She did get out of the hospital and, and she's really uh, recently succumbed to the disease. Probably more informities are, are the other 11 patients that Neil has treated, all of whom are getting stronger and appear to be doing far better. Um, and our favorite is Anna, who's a, a teenager in Germany, um, who um, was in pretty desperate straits. She had a she had an obstruction from food and ended up getting uh, pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. And as Neil says, no one with FUS ALS ever gets better, except Anna and the other patients. She's now uh, able to walk unaided and is able to rise unaided, breathing on her own and going to school, which um, is hard to argue that that could be just a, a part of the natural progression of the disease. So Neil's putting a paper together describing all this and I recommend it to you. What about systems? I mentioned the system, the industrialized system is vital. Obviously, a great deal of work has to happen before we can do anything. And that's done in tertiary care, uh, personalized medicine centers. Uh, the patient must be fully genotypically characterized and phenotypically characterized as well. And we need to know uh, that uh, what the gene function is and that the mutation that's been identified is causal. All that comes, um, the, there, uh, what happens is a research physician, it does take that, and patient or parent complete an application on the NLORM website. Um, we then triage that, do all the literature work, understand the character and the prevalence of the disease. And then that patient is presented to a committee I put together called the Access to Treatment Committee, which is made up of all the expertises that we need to make these incredibly complex risk benefit judgments. These are sick patients with multi-organ manifestations and many have developmental overlays. It's a tough stuff. And then with their advice, then I make the final decision about who is the, who's the right kind of person to treat with ASOs. Um, once we make that decision, then we work with the um, physician to define primary, secondary and uh, exploratory treatment goals and clinical measures that we'll use during the 15 months or so that is currently taking, we hope to get that down, um, to get the ASO to the patient, we ask that they perform very careful natural history. And then we compare that to on treatment in the first year. Yes, it is true. There are uh, end of one trials uh, designs, but they're all crossovers. And that won't work here because these patients are too sick and the duration of effective ASOs is far too long. So we think this is the best solution to attempting to evaluate um, the performance. As I said, uh, 
uh, demand has exceeded my expectations by maybe 30 fold. We're now up to almost 150 applications. I think we've approved for treatment about 60. We just had our first pre-IND meeting with the cardio renal division. Uh, and that went extremely well. And, and that's a patient with renal amyloidosis. That's a very interesting case. And so the, the guidance is working. Um, and in response to the demand, of course, I've had to grow the place a lot more rapidly than I expected. And, and I'm very pleased with the team that we have been able to assemble. This is a, this is a galvanic idea and people want to be a part of it. Um, and, and I'm, 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 thrilled that the quality systems that we've put in place appear to be working well. I mentioned that we have a lot of collaborators and donors and partners. This is the list today. I expect by the end of the year not to be able to fit this on, on a single slide. What's compelling to me is a number of biotech companies, including uh, um, um, uh, Ultragenics, um, and every single vendor uh, and and provider in the industry has joined, and they're giving us tremendous discounts and 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 also cash donations, and that means that our cost per patient at steady state I project to be around six hundred to eight eight hundred thousand dollars per patient, all in, um, not millions, and, and of course that number makes it feasible. And these collaborations have allowed us to reduce the cost per patient by 40% in the first couple of years. We have more to do. So um, we are publishing here the papers so far for Men Lorem. Um, should you be interested, you can learn more about what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it in some of these papers. And so I'll conclude by saying the nanorare patient is the most isolated, desperate, and needy an underserved patient population I've encountered. I think we're off to a great start. I, I think by any measure, I'm pleased by where we are, but we know we're just beginning. And the next task for us is to demonstrate a nonprofit model is actually sustainable. Given the progress, I'm optimistic it will do that, but we're gonna need all the help we can get. And so anybody interested, just give me a call. I'll put you to work. Thank you. Well, Stan, uh, on behalf of everyone participating, thanks so much for that um, inspiring talk. I really appreciated the technical details around how ASOs works through so many different mechanisms to both increase expression and re, uh, reduce expression. Um, and congratulations on Enlorum and this nonprofit model to get these treatments into um, patients. Um, on basically a one by one basis. And I, it's amazing that you've gotten 130 requests from patients and patient families. Yeah, we should so with that. Now 150. <laughs> 150. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we're, and we're, you know, it's, it's, it's overwhelmed us, but thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Rupa Ramamurthy, who you've already met for the lunchtime session. Thank you, Rupa. Uh, thank you, Charles. And uh, so it is my great pleasure to uh, invite Sparsh Shah. He's an amazing 18-year-old singer, songwriter, inspirational speaker who has osteogenesis imperfecta. And as Dr. Karkis said, they're working on a treatment for osteogenesis imperfecta. And he's suffered from more than 140 fractures, but has risen above all of it, performed live, at Radio City Music Hall, at Madison Square Garden, and National Center for Performing Arts, and helped raise more than $1.5 million for various nonprofit organizations. And I asked him yesterday, and yes, he does like playing video games with his little brother, including Minecraft and Fortnite. And his favorite food is paneer burji with garlic naan. So with that, I'll bring on Sparsh to introduce his TED Talk. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you all are doing really well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupa, for having me and to everyone at USCF for um, bringing us here to this amazing virtual event. I am truly, truly happy 
and grateful to just bring my voice to this super important conversation of helping patients like me live with our rare diseases through effective diagnosis and treatment. And, you know, to me, I feel like this session's name, you know, Rare Voices, A Concert of Science, it shows me just how considerate all the organizers of this symposium are, including Dr. Rupa, because I feel like it's so great. It's great for us to talk all about physical treatments, right? Um, uh, we talked about, you know, treating all sorts of diseases, and I feel like that is a great part of it. But if we don't address not only physical treatment, but also mental, emotional, social, and even spiritual treatment, I think we're going to miss out on the true holistic treatment for rare disease, in my humble opinion. And that's why I was really, really excited um, when, you know, our last speaker, he mentioned, you know, making patient support groups for patients who are, you know, isolated and usually don't know other people outside of, you know, themselves who have the same condition as them so that they can pull each other through this and, and keep learning from each other. Um, I had the opportunity to do the same thing uh, a few years ago before the pandemic where I attended a international conference for people with OI and it really, really opened my eyes. So I'm really excited that this is being talked about more. And as a musician, I think that, you know, as part of that physical and mental, emotional, social and spiritual treatment, I really am convinced that music and really all of the arts are a significant part of that holistic treatment. But I think music does so much more than just heal us. Music has helped me grow into the fullness of my identity. I mean, music has helped me realize that I am more than just my rare disease. Music helped me understand what my parents meant when they told me that the only true limits in life are the ones that we impose on our minds. And music, in helping me destroy my limits, it also helped me begin to dream. I know that dreaming may sound fantastical to many of you, and a lot of the scientists in this room are like, okay, great, dreams are great, but how do you really, like, turn those into reality? Well, time and time again, I've seen my dreams come to fruition, and I'll give you a very concrete example. In my early childhood, my dad and I had a tradition of watching or listening to one TED Talk every day. And I would hear all these amazing speakers from that platform talking about everything from dinosaurs to learning to, you know, biotech to inspiration. And it really enriched my life. And one day, I think dad told me I was around like seven to nine years old. And that's when my father and I, we conceived of that dream. One day I was going to give my own speech on the TED platform. Six years later, I ended up giving a speech at TEDx Gateway called How a 13-Year-Old Changed Impossible to I'm Possible. You're going to see that speech as well as the associated performance in a few minutes. But it took a lot of hard work to do it. Years of learning to write, months of preparation with curators, weeks of practice on stage. But ultimately, the dream did come to fruition. Still, this was just the beginning for me. At the end of my TED talk, I mentioned some of my dreams and plans for my future. And since then, two of those dreams from that talk have already come to fruition. Plus, that speech and performance has become now the most viewed TEDx Gateway session ever, with over 25 million views across all social media platforms. And I've been blessed to be able to reappear on TEDx three more times afterwards. So what's my point? I never stopped dreaming. I truly believe that even more than the arts and the sciences, the ability to dream courageously, work effortfully to achieve those dreams, and to dream continuously even after achieving your first dreams is essential to the holistic treatment I talked about before. And I think when we come to think of it, aren't we all here because of our dreams? Because all of us, whether we're scientists, parents, or patients, 
we're dreaming of a brighter future for all people with rare diseases, right? Aren't we all dreaming of the day that people stop seeing us for who we're not and start seeing us for who we are and who we can become? I know the dreaming may sound fantastical to many of you, but if music has only taught me one thing in life, it is that dreams, when paired with the dedication necessary to fulfill them, can drive us to our destiny. And I hope that the TEDx talk that we're about to show you inspires you to witness the power of dreams for yourself. Thank you. Ultramicroscopic silicovolcanoconiosis, supercalifragilistic expialidocious, hippopotamonstrous sesquipedaliophobia, pseudo pseudo hyperparathyroidism, flox nas nihilopolification, anti disestablishmentarianism, ornery fecabili tudini tatibus, electroencephalographically, anti transubstantiationalist, disproportionableness, incomprehensibilities. So, what you just heard were some of the 11 longest words in the English dictionary. Such complex words, right? Well, just as these words are complex, so has my own life been. And although seemingly difficult things, such as memorizing long and complex words and numbers, are simple for me, seemingly simple things such as standing and bearing weight are impossible for me. That's because I wasn't like any other newborn baby. I was born with osteogenesis imperfecta, a rare, incurable genetic disorder that causes a person's bones to be extremely fragile. So I guess you can call me Mr. Glass now. During my birth, I had over 35 fractures and was taken immediately to the intensive care unit. And these were the sounds that used to resonate throughout the hospital as I was desperately clinging on to my life. The doctors gave me the very bleak prognosis that I'd only live for a day or two. But due to God's grace and the support of my parents and their never say die attitude, I survived. In fact, thank you, thank you. In fact, I've had 130 fractures so far in just the first 13 years of my life, and only God knows how many more will happen. I've also had multiple screws and rods placed in my body, so I guess you can call me Iron Man as well. <laughs> Ironic, am I right? <laughs> but anyways, no more sob stories, because that's not what I want to talk to you about today. So now, what do you see on the slide in the back? Can you tell me? Impossible. Impossible, right. Okay, good. Now what do you all see? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. And that's exactly what I want to share with you all today. How I turned the word impossible into I'm possible in my life by following four simple steps. Step one, find your passion. Now, despite the fact that I did live a very rough life for the first few years, God opened a new door to it that would become my passion and change my life forever. And that was music. Music has had a tremendous impact on me, both physically and emotionally. I started singing ever since I could speak and in fact, I even used to correct my parents when they were singing off key by saying, Mom, Dad, you're not singing right. At the tender age of six, my parents enrolled me into Indian classical vocal training. Much later on, I also started taking American vocal lessons, therefore helping to increase my versatility as a singer. 
But I found my true calling as an artist at the age of 10, when I wrote my first song, This Love Will Never Fade. Since then, I've written 11 more songs. Two, never hold yourself back. So one day I came across an amazing rap song many of you may have heard of, Not Afraid, by none other than Eminem, also known as Slim Shady. This song struck my chords and was so inspirational to me that I could not hold myself back. And I decided that I had to go out there and make a cover of it myself. <laughs> Who knew that the boy with slim chances of survival would go on to sing slim shady songs one day? But wait, there's more. I didn't just rap the song like any other person. First of all, I'm not a vena profanity, so I decided to make my rapper name Pure Rhythm. In other words, I'm clean, no curses, but I'm still all about the rhythm. <laughs> Thank you. I also added my own touch of Indian classical music to the song, which is part of a new music genre that I want to pioneer called Raga Rap, or the fusion of seemingly polar opposites, Indian classical music, and hip hop. I know right now, to some of you, the idea may sound completely crazy, but trust me, in the end, the result is beautiful. To my pleasant surprise, the cover blew up all over the internet, and it became a worldwide phenomenon. I received praises from some of the most famous celebrities out there, And to date, the cover has gotten over 55 million views and counting on all social media sites so far. Thank you. And because I decided that I would not hold myself back and instead decide out to go out and display my musical talent to the world, I was able to achieve these among many other achievements that I've been very blessed to have achieved to this day. Step three, help others. Now, I've been singing pro bono for various nonprofit organizations. And by now, I've helped to raise at least half a million dollars for them. Thank you. And yes, that is American dollars, by the way. Because <laughs> I know we're in India right now, so. But I believe that the biggest satisfaction for all of us is when we get to help change someone else's life for the better. Doesn't it give us such an immense amount of gratitude? For example, I was once contacted by a family who had a child with brittle bones just like me. He's about to go into surgery and was very nervous. But his parents, re parents reached out to me and we had a FaceTime call which went very well. And on the day of the surgery, his parents sent us this pic with a smiling Xavier going into the surgery without any fear. Thank you. And last but not least, dream big. None of this would have ever happened if I had not dreamt big. But my ultimate goal as a musician is still to one day perform in front of a billion. Yes, you heard me right. A billion people one day. I want to leave my footprints, or rather, track prints, into the sand of legacy so deep, not even a tsunami can erase it. And I firmly believe that every one of us here should strive for such big goals. I mean, don't you all want to be remembered when you leave this earth? I also have many plans for my life in the future, especially in my musical career. I want to join an online bachelor's degree course in music at the age of 13, come up with many original albums, win a Grammy Award one day, and most importantly, sparse everyone's hearts all over the world. Thank you. Aw, <laughs> thank you. But the, remember, this, it's still not over yet. <laughs>
promise you. Um, yeah, so where was I? Sparshing everyone's hearts, right? I want to spread the message that no matter what happens in your life, you should never, ever give up on your passion. Everyone in this world goes through struggles of some sort. And I know, because I, for one, have to deal with constant fractures and lots of pain. But I believe that if I can turn impossible into impossible in my life, you can too. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. And I firmly believe that if you push forward and have faith, you will make it big anywhere in life. Thank you so much. But wait up. Before you guys do a standing ovation, it's not over yet. Because I'd like to leave you all with a very special gift from me to you. This is my rendition of Raga Rap in Eminem's Not Afraid. Pure rhythm style. So thank you again. Nah. 
And Sparsh, oh, welcome back. And I think in the interest of time, we'll just have you close with the song you're sing going to sing. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, so this song is an original that um, it's a little bit more of a mainstream, like American pop kind of thing, a little less raga rap, but um, this is an original song that I wrote uh, quite a few years ago. It was the second one I ever wrote. And this is called There's Always Tomorrow. And it's basically just a song to brighten up your day. If you're ever feeling down or if you know, if you ever feel like, you know, there's not a lot of hope right now in the world. And I know that's something that we definitely need nowadays. Um, this is a song for you. And uh, it is out everywhere on all the streaming platforms, on YouTube, everything. So, and if you just want to check me out, like, later, and if you like what you hear, you know, www.sparshah.com is my name, S-P-A-R-S-H-S-H-A-H.com. And you can find everything there, and the songs there. And, well, yeah, I, enough advertising myself. I'm just going to share with you this awesome song, because I think you all will love it. Um, all right. Okay. Have you ever felt alone? Or maybe not at home? Did you want to give up? Cause maybe it was too much. Well, you might not have wings. But you can still fly and you can sing Because who you are Doesn't matter cause you're a superstar There's always tomorrow No need for the sorrow We will make it if we can Come back from where we began If you can believe it you can achieve it Life's a mountain With steep and bumpy edges Oh, and you have to push yourself All the way to the peak of the ledges Well, you might not have wings But you can still fly and you can sing Because who you are doesn't matter cause you're a superstar there's always tomorrow no need for the sorrow we will make it if we can come back from where we began if you can believe it you can achieve it you can clap with me so don't ever believe that what you have will go in vain You can still follow your dreams No matter how much the pain There's always tomorrow No need for the sorrow We will make it if we can Come back from where if you can believe it, you can achieve it, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sparsh. Thank you. You're amazing, inspirational, absolutely fabulous, and really appreciate your time with us today. And in the interest of time, we'll go on to a couple of poems by Michael D. I'd conducted a poetry workshop for, uh, and he's an 18 year old kid with aplastic anemia. So I will share screen and play that one. Okay. Thanks again, Sparsh.
Aplastic Anemia by Michael D. Aplastic Anemia by Michael D. Blood is so accessible and yet I lack its cells. If only people knew the struggle that this disease entails. I've been laughed at, called names, and even called a liar, but nothing is worse than when you lose your fire. That beautiful fan that blows gently on your flame was taken away from me, but do not dismay. I plan to come back brighter. Blood is so accessible and yet I lack its cells. If only people knew the struggle that this disease entails. I've been laughed at, called names, and even called a liar, but nothing is worse than when you lose your fire. That beautiful fan that blows gently on your flame was taken away from me, but do not dismay. I plan to come back brighter. I just share one more poem of his and then we'll go to the next program. Or in the interest of time, let's just move on. Uh, so Jenny Jansi will come on and introduce the next speaker. Great, thank you. Yes, that was um, truly an inspirational lunch hour. Um, thank you so much. I know I'm ready to continue to try to dream bigger and follow passions. Um, I think it's an inspiration to all of us to do that. Um, but I'd like to turn our attention to um, our afternoon hour or hours, which um, starts with um, looking at sickle cell disease. And I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Marsha Treadwell. She's a professor of pediatrics at UCSF in the Division of Hematology and is a Jordan Fun Endowed Chair at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. She's also co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Anti-Racism Council for the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals. She's co-PI and regional director for the Pacific Sickle Cell Regional Collaborative, and is also co-PI and director for a sickle cell disease implementation consortium site funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Her research integrates physical, behavioral, and psychological processes, allowing for the identification of risk and resiliency factors and, and the development of more effective interventions for populations made vulnerable by systems in both high and low resource settings. She received her doctorate in clinical child psychology from the University of Washington and advanced training in clinical research from UCSF. Dr. Treadwell, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thanks for the uh, wonderful music and poetry at the lunch hour. I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce a video that was made in 2021 and featured in uh, UCSF Chancellor Hoggood's State of the University Address titled Catalyst. The video about sickle cell disease and other videos featured members of the UCSF community reflecting on how we moved and remained motivated throughout the course of the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and racialized violence. Featured in uh, the sickle cell video is uh, Brooklyn. I met her and her family when she was two months old, and that was almost 30 years ago. She was diagnosed with sickle cell disease on newborn screening, and I was a member of the comprehensive multidisciplinary team that cared for her. As a young adult, she still receives her outpatient care at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland uh, at our Lifespan Center. I've seen Brooklyn through her many accomplishments graduations, college attendance, her jobs, despite the challenges that she's faced living with sickle cell disease. I will also highlight hers and others' experiences of pain and challenges with treatment as adults in the healthcare system in my presentation. But Brooklyn's resilience in the face of medical traumas, the trauma of pain and structural racism have been inspiring and sustaining to so many of the people who care for them and do research 
to um, really ensure that they have the best quality of life. So I hope to honor her and other individuals with sickle cell disease in my own work. And right now we'll turn it back to Jenny to play the video. I first realized that I had sickle cell. I was five years old. I would never think that I would be this strong at 26 with a terminal disease. I'm not just speaking for myself. I'm speaking for other patients who have sickle cell that are just like me all over the world um, that do live in pain every day. And finding a cure means finding a future and finding a path that we can walk on that's pain-free. Sickle cell disease is a hereditary red blood cell disorder. It's present at birth and extends lifelong, but its hallmark is pain. And it's caused when the red blood cells that are misshapen and damaged block the flow of oxygen and fluids into the smallest blood vessels in the body. That causes pain. So a, a lot of the treatment goes into treating the pain, preventing the pain. How do we lessen these painful episodes and the progressive organ damage that leads to early death? Sickle cell disease was identified in Western medicine over 100 years ago, and it has taken up until now, really, for people to have access to cure and even to disease-modifying therapies. The reason for that really lies in structural racism. There are disparities in funding, and that's really the crux of why we haven't gotten to a cure yet. We've had partnerships with the community and with people with sickle cell disease at Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland for decades, but it's time now to really continue with the promise where we listen to the voices of people who are affected by the disease and we really attend to the quality of life. I have been a part of UCSF since I was two months old and I'm forever grateful for my nurses and doctors at Children's Hospital. The most challenging part for me in this disease is definitely the pain. Getting out of bed every day is definitely a struggle. Working a job for me has been the hardest thing because it literally feels like my bones are breaking. When I feel a pain crisis coming on, I try to get my pain before it gets me with my meds. When we tell you we are in pain, we are in pain. And we deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. It's only recently in this awakening regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, and how that affects the practice of medicine that we've begun to get the resources we need to develop a new therapy. CRISPR therapy is one of the most exciting innovations that is out there right now. And it began with scientists at UC Berkeley and the Innovative Genomics Institute that's led by Jennifer Dabna and a gifted postdoc in the laboratory, Mark DeWitt, who finalized and optimized the reagents that you need to correct the sickle mutation. Our approach is targeted. We're actually going specifically to the location in the genome where the sickle mutation is located and correcting it, and then reinfuse a sufficient number of corrected stem cells to actually eliminate the disease in every person who's inherited it. With UCSF, UCLA, the UC Berkeley Consortium, we have expertise in manufacturing, in gene editing, in cell biology, and hematology to be able to bring this safely to a clinical trial ready to enroll patients now. This is something that should have happened years ago, and I'm, I'm so pleased that here at UCSF and in the University of California system, we, we, we've embraced the challenge. We have to really put resources towards people with sickle cell disease who have so long lacked adequate resources to just get the basic care. 
and a cure can really revolutionize and change everyone's life. Persons who inherit sickle cell disease are now called sickle cell disease warriors. And the warriors, because they're resilient, they're not giving up, and so neither will we. I would love to see a cure in sickle cell. I want to be like a normal young adult. I want to be responsible. I want to have my own money. I want to work a job. I want to be active and hang out with our friends and family. We want to live just like everybody else. Wonderful. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Walters, and he is the Jordan Family Director of Bone Marrow Transplantation at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland, and Professor of Pediatrics at UCSF School of Medicine. He's also Program Director of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine Alpha Stem Cell Clinic at UCSF. He has devoted his research career to pursuing curative therapies for hemoglobin disorders with an overarching goal of expanding this treatment more broadly to affected individuals. He received his medical degree from UC San Diego, completed pediatric residency training at the University of Washington in hemat and hematology oncology fellowship training at the University of Washington at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Dr. Walters, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, giving, sharing some background about readiness and preparing for participation in a curative therapy, gene therapy trial, and then, and then finish with some of the details about the particular project that we introduced in, in the video with Brooklyn Haynes. So <clears throat> sickle cell disease, as the uh, video introduced, is a, is a disorder that, that affects virtually every board, organ in the body, and that's because it can adversely affect the flow of fluids, nutrients, and, and red blood cells to those organs. And the hallmark is, is pain, uh, which is caused by the disruption of blood flow to bones and muscle where uh, a painful stimulus can be elicited. But virtually every organ, as I, as I mentioned in the body, can be affected as depicted here. And together, the damage to the organ and, uh, is cumulative and shortens lifespan but also the quality of life and, and the unpredictability of the painful episodes uh, uh, it, it can impair the quality of life significantly as well. And the, the quantity of life, which is uh, shown in, in this particular graph, a, a recent experience, which um, is illustrated by this Kaplan-Meier probability curve, where on the, on the y-axis here is percentage, and then on the uh, x-axis here is the uh, is the years um, of age. And this is a group of, of adults who received care at Vanderbilt and University of North Carolina on the East Coast. And the, the curve begins at 20 years of age where all of the children who are now adults are transitioned to this adult program. And what's interesting about it is, is, um, is this incredible disparity in lifespan. So the average lifespan varies from the uh, upper 40s to mid 50s, depending on the particular genotype that's inherited represents a 30-year decrement in lifespan compared to African-Americans who don't inherit sickle cell disease. So right away, there's a disparity in which um, Marcia Treadwell correctly assigns to problems with uh, a disparity in, in research dollars, in access to health care, and structural racism. So when we consider, uh, uh, when we meet with a family or a, a particular individual who's interested in acute therapy, it begins with a uh, a clear and hopefully transparent discussion of the clinical benefits that is living without sickle cell disease and the risks involved with, with getting to that destination. And so um, first we try to identify who might most benefit from transplant. They tend to be persons who are already having significant complications of the underlying disease. And we ask this question of, 
should we transplant now, uh, uh, either before or after the complications have, have occurred, um, which is often tailored by the clinical trial that we're considering. And how do we consider a period of therapy in terms of its clinical benefit in the context of uh, now having newer supportive disease modifying therapies available that are recently FDA approved? The, um, the risk assessment has, has is personalized. So what risks are is a particular individual willing to accept? And how do the sickle cell disease related comorbidities, that is existing organ damage, affect whether or not a particular risk will, will occur? And then is there uh, adequate psychosocial support, which is also a key component to making a decision about uh, whether to offer and, what, and whether to pursue a curative therapy. And so the, the decision is often organized in this type of way. It, it might begin with evaluations for organ damage, and we focus in particular on the heart, lungs, kidney, liver, and in the central nervous system. And, and there are ways for us to do that with clinical screening. Um, we also have to be cognizant and supportive of the pain management program that the patient begin, begin, brings to the, to the particular curative therapy and, and how might we expand or modify this in a way that will support them through the curative therapy. Um, have they already instituted optimized disease modification therapies? And uh, sometimes we use these in preparation for the curative therapy. And then uh, again, terribly important is this psychosocial evaluation. Um, is there adequate transportation to the, to the clinic and the hospital? Is there access to pharmacy? Is there a caretaker who's, who's willing to um, assist 24 seven in the recovery period? And, and what are the financial issues? Are there, is, is there a suitable support uh, to get through this safely or will the treatment cause financial harm and therefore not really be suitable for pursuing? And, and finally, uh, we have to be able to give red blood cell and other transfusions to get through transplant safely. So we often do a screen to make sure that we can accomplish that um, and, and other evaluations as well. So that's some background around the considerations that, that go into introducing patient and their family to the possibility of participating in a, in a curative therapy trial. And I'm just going to spend the rest of this uh, talk uh, showing some of the preclinical work that we've done in preparation for applying the CRISPR technology to, to sickle cell disease. So why, why even consider this if we already have a curative treatment, which is a bone marrow transplant from a well-matched brother or sister as the donor? Well, as it turns out, only 18% of the families who we, we meet will have a, a, a child or, or, or an adult with an HLA identical sibling donor. And when we do an unrelated donor search looking for a volunteer who might be willing to to donate their bone marrow if their HLA type, if their transplant type matches up, we can only increase that by another 19%. So even if I wanted to treat everyone who, who came to me wishing to have a bone marrow transplant, I could only do so about a third of the time. And moreover, the treatment itself carries risks. There's a complication called graft versus host disease where the immune system of the donor uh, attacks the recipient's body in, in the same way it might attack a germ. So that can cause a risk of dying. And clinicians and, and participants considering this, this kind of uh, treatment uh, often decline because of these risks. And so until recently, transplant is largely, has been largely restricted to children and even there apply very sparingly. So, so if, if we can't find donors, can we modify a person's own autologous cells for clinical benefit? And that's the question we're asking with the CRISPR technology. And then if we're able to do that, this needs to go hand in hand. In parallel, can we ensure if we establish a curative benefit that's, that's now broadly available, can we ensure access that's equitable to the novel curative therapy? And the, the uh, NASAM um, took on this, this question and um, came up in this 2020 publication with some, some interesting uh, recommendations. So first they thought that, um, that the gene therapy approaches, including CRISPR technology, um, should involve shared decision-making for patients considering the novel therapies and, and the HHS should encourage and reimburse this practice of shared decision-making. And then in addition, to go through the, the clinical therapy and the, and the medical treatment that, um, that 
the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and state Medicaid programs should explore novel payment models that encourage and pay for coordinated care through um, developing and then instituting and offering uh, the cost of curative therapies. So this is um, a novel approach and, and one that I think would um, help us pursue this uh, both more aggressively and, and, and more broadly. Um, so what are, what are the patients saying about um, about these new therapies. And this is a, uh, a recent publication and I, I captured some of the statements. So one, one patient said, uh, I'd never allow it to happen being leery of bone marrow transplant because, uh, and wouldn't consider an option to me, or I don't want no bone marrow transplant because you could die from it. And then uh, one parent said about her son, it's getting to the point where he's kind of sick of the pain. He wants to do a bone marrow transplant at some point without knowing that it's gonna be 100% successful then I would only choose it if I had to. But that's if other options failed, like hydroxyurea wasn't working. And he was very, very sick and blood transfusions were just starting to take over his, his whole life. So here, that's one end of the spectrum. Uh, I, another thing to consider, it's risk could be like exchanging something you know versus something you don't know. One participant expressed concern that if you don't want to get rid of sickle cell disease and end up with something worse. And then finally, another Another patient said, I'm all for it if there's, some, if there's some strong risk to it and it's not the easiest process, but I mean, it's, I believe it's still better. It's a great opportunity for patients with sickle cell. And another uh, adult patient highlighted the risk of mortality with sickle cell disease itself saying, even if it's about BMT, life-threatening, I would take the chance because either way it goes, living with sickle cell, eventually life is, it is life-threatening. So, these are, these are just some of the views, um, pro and con, that, that need to be aired out in considering participation in these kind of trials. And the, the, goal, the goal that we're pursuing is this so-called ideal cell therapy profile, which would protect from the sickle cell disease-related complications, both, both, both the symptoms and the subclinical damage to the vital organs, it, uh, display an acceptable toxicity profile, both in the short and long term, it should be accessible and available to most patients, safe and children and adults, and rely on a comparative clinical trial design that shows benefit curative therapy compared with uh, the existing disease modifying therapies, both in the short term and long term. So, so one of the risks that, that came to the fore in the last uh, year and a half or so what, what were these two observations of acute model, myelogenous leukemia that occurred in two participants among 43 who, who received an enteroviral gene therapy uh, drug product. So these were cells that were modified in a way, stem cells, to make an anti-cyclin hemoglobin in three to five years after the treatment. And, and these were one of the, two of the first patients enrolled. They developed acute myelogenous leukemia that developed as a consequence of uh, these um, driver mutations that we know can cause or uh, amplify the AML uh, initiating event. In one case, the leukemia cells had no lentiviral vector in them. So this is the first case. And this case was judged a consequence of receiving the high-dose chemotherapy as a leukemogenic agent in preparation for the treatment. But in the second patient, the, the, the vector, the lentiviral vector was present in the leukemia cells, but it, it integrated near a, a gene that doesn't cause leukemia called vamp 4 So in both cases, it's possible that the treatment in ways that we might or might not understand appear to accelerate and amplify this risk of developing acute knowledge leukemia. So it's something we need to be aware of as we plan and design uh, our own CRISPR trial in the future. So the, I begin with a description of the reagents that were developed. So uh, depicted here is um, uh, the, the the single-stranded DNA oligonucleotide that uh, has the corrected template from which um, a healthy copy of the beta globin gene would be produced. And in red, the sequence where the guide RNA brings that nuclease, the Cas9 enzyme that makes the double-stranded cut at this uh, red triangle. And from this location extends the strand so that when it reaches the sickle cell disease, causing valine amino acid, it changes it back to glutamic acid. 
And once we've once this reaction has occurred, we change the sequence also so that the the enzymes can't cut the DNA again after the correction has occurred. So I just show these details because I I'll refer back to them a, a bit later. And um, and this reaction um, isn't going to correct every sickle cell mutation in every stem cell, but our experience in bone marrow transplant, that is using a healthy donor to cure the disease, showed that uh, some of the time mixed donor host hematopoietic chimerism develops. And, and in fact, with as few as 20% of the healthy donors blood cells growing in the bone marrow, that's sufficient to cure sickle cell disease. And it, this phenomenon occurs because those healthy, uh, corrected, healthy, normal uh, uh, donor erythrocytes have a normal lifespan and they outlast the sickle cell disease blood cells in circulation. So based on this observation, that's very um, uh, significant. If we can cure at least, if we can correct at least one sickle mutation, in 20% of the engrafted stem cells, we should have a curative effect. And in fact, that's what we've been observing. These are uh, two manufacturing runs that were conducted by the team at UCLA. And after uh, we put the human cells in the mouse and then collected the bone marrow, 20 weeks later, we were able to count the number of stem cells that form a colony in, in a in vitro uh, test. And when we do the DNA sequence, we, we observe that 40% of the colonies have, uh, so these are 40% of the stem cells, have at least one copy of the correct allele, with the remainder either uh, being uncorrected, that is unmodified, still sickle cell disease in green, or, and, and this is an interesting uh, problem that we'll have to overcome, in, in another 30% of the time, we've introduced, uh, uh, after correcting the double-stranded break in the DNA, a new mutation that causes thalassemia, which is a, which is a, a genotype that doesn't produce any beta globin. So, but because 40% of the stem cells are corrected, these would be dominant and, and should lead to a curative outcome. And in fact, uh, the team at UCLA led by Don Cohn has now run six uh, manufacturing runs using the optimized protocol for the gene editing procedure, three small scale runs in, in sickle cell disease, stem cells and three clinical scale from healthy uh, adult volunteers who gave a clinical dose of, of stem cells. and we've. They, they, these uh, cells after the manufacturing pass the release criteria, they would be suitable to, to use in a clinical trial. And, and, and our average correction occurs 26% of the time, which is above our, our threshold for uh, what we predict would be a cure. But there's still this problem that I've highlighted here of the insertion deletion. So these are gonna be thalassemia containing uh, alleles that, that must be balanced by uh, a sufficient number of corrected alleles. So this is one of the, the critical uh, observations we'll need to make in the trial and that we'll have to disclose to participations, participants in the trial. So it begins with uh, um, a, a procedure to uh, collect the stem cells from the bloodstream. In the laboratory, we isolate the stem cells, we introduce the gene editing reagents, and then that uh, those cells are frozen. And if they meet the release criteria, they're shipped to uh, the transplant center for thawing and infusion. And this is a picture of the, of the GMP lab uh, personnel at UCLA. And so and another depiction is uh, beginning with the patient, we do the stem cell harvest, we ship the cells to UCLA where they undergo this electroporation where the gene editing reagents are introduced into the stem cells. Once they're edited, they're frozen, and then we'll, we'll give the patient cytos chemotherapy to destroy the sickle producing blood cells in the body and replace those with these gene edited modified stem cells given in the same way as a blood transfusion. They'll migrate to the bone marrow and, and hopefully over time take over uh, blood production and elimination of the sickle cell disease. So we uh, successfully filed for an IND um, a year and a half ago. Uh, we procured funding that was released in December 2021. Uh, our first patient will probably enroll not this year, but early next year. And then we're following a staggered enrollment so that a data uh, safety monitoring board will, will review results after the first three patients and then after the first six patients. So uh, we'll probably begin a pediatric enrollment in, in 2024. So in summary, uh, patients, families, and referring physicians have concerns about myeloblation, particularly the risk of developing leukemia uh, from, from these therapies that must be mitigated and, and disclosed. Um, 
we don't yet have any experience with the long-term effects of these gene modification treatments. There was there was a patient with uh, another blood disease called thalassemia who had been free of red cell transfusions but resumed them 10 years after the treatment. That's something that uh, we'll need to monitor. Is there a risk of developing uh, what we call clonal hematopoiesis, which is a, a precursor of leukemia? Um, and will there? And we don't yet have long-term safety information that we'll need to gather. And finally, maybe most importantly, will the cost and complexity of this treatment restrict access to care? So, so we're we're asking now the question: How do we ensure broad availability versus versus limited availability availability in, in a small number of, of centers? So, so those are some of the considerations I wanted to share today, and and, and thank you for for your attention. Great, thank you, Dr. Walters. Um, we can open. Uh, the floor up for a few questions now, but we'll also have um, Dr. Treadwell come back on and um, talk about health disparities, and then we can open it up for our panel discussion as well. But I do have one question here that people, um, someone asked, is why do you irradiate the patients if you don't need complete replace, replacement of bone marrow cells? Right, that's, um, that's, that's an important point that I, I failed to make, and it, it, we actually don't irradiate the cells. We, but we give high dose chemotherapy to accomplish the same. And the idea is that if, if we've only edited 25% of those stem cells, we, we want to start with a slate where that 25% of cells has a, has a good chance of engrafting and taking over. So if you dilute those uh, by giving a, a lower dose of radiation or chemotherapy with unmodified cells, you'll lose the impact of that clinical effect. Of, so we're, we're trying to avoid diluting those modified cells because that would lessen the benefit, if that makes sense. Yeah, great. Um, and you mentioned that you have these insertion and deletion um, mutations, but can you select out for those? Yeah, I, um, I, I, yeah, I, wish, I wish we could. And um, unfortunately, we just don't have the technology to sort cell by cell, stem by stem cell by stem cell, uh, whether or not they have the, the right uh, alteration, excluding those that don't. Um, there, are, there are ways maybe to, to use a selectable marker to amplify the survival of those stem cells, but unfortunately that probably wouldn't be safe in that we already know there's this propensity to develop leukemia, and we might just be selecting for a proliferative population or clone or clones that that would harbor then some other mutation that would lead to leukemia. So uh, unfortunately for safety and uh, technological reasons, it's just not possible to select out only the cells that you wanna deliver. Got it. Okay, great. Well, like I said, let's um, turn it over to Dr. Treadwell at this point and we will come back together as a panel. And again, attendees, feel free to put um, your questions in the Q and A and we will get to those later. Um, but uh, Dr. Treadwell will be discussing um, uh, health, uh, understanding and addressing health disparities in sickle cell disease. Oops, I think you are still muted. Okay. And I just need to find my slides. All right. So thank you again uh, for this opportunity. And um, we heard this morning about how um, expensive, time consuming and lacking in sustainability, the development of treatments for rare diseases can be. Sickle cell disease faces all of these barriers, but also is embedded in the context of structural racism in the US. So I'm going to talk to you today about understanding and addressing some of these sickle cell disease healthcare disparities. I have nothing to disclose, and my objectives are to um, understand disparities in health resources and outcomes for the population with sickle cell disease. And I'd like to give you some familiarity with strategies for addressing health disparities and achieving health equity for the population with sickle cell disease. <clears throat> so this quote from the National Academy of Medicine um, was almost exactly <laughs> what I wanted. Um, so it says, improving health equity requires a holistic approach and change is needed everywhere. 
I added from the bench to the bedside, to the boardroom, to how payers pay for care and to health policy changes. So we really do need a, a holistic approach in order to address um, some of the challenges with treatments for rare diseases, but again, particularly those characterized by health equity, um, health inequities and health disparities. So you saw this slide um, that Dr. Walters um, presented that just really points out the impact of sickle cell disease across the life course uh, because blood flows everywhere. Every uh, organ has a potential for, for damage and ultimate failure. But this slide really points out as well how social determinants of health can impact people with sickle cell disease because people with sickle cell disease are primarily Blacks and African Americans in the US. So they've been made vulnerable by systems of inequity and um, these social determinants of health or um, the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age are uh, disparately uh, apportioned across uh, populations within the US. And so particularly for uh, Black and African Americans, um, people, um, there's a real complex interplay between education, wealth, the justice system, employment, and health. Looking a little bit closer at sickle cell disease, um, disparities in health outcomes and health resources, uh, first in looking at disparities in health outcomes. And these just um, would include that the average life expectancy for people with sickle cell disease, particularly hemoglobin SS or the most severe form is a full 30 years shorter than that for people without sickle cell disease. Uh, people with sickle cell disease have the highest rate of 30-day uh, readmissions compared to other conditions. And you heard about the, the tremendous uh, vulnerability to uh, complications, including stroke, infection, anemia, and, and pain, which I'll talk to about a little bit more shortly. In terms of health resource disparities, um, the majority of people with sickle cell disease in the US are Medicaid beneficiaries, Medi-Cal in uh, California, and physicians can make the choice to not accept these patients. And then further, uh, healthcare providers uh, inaccurately but too often perceive people with sickle cell disease as drug seekers rather than as people seeking relief from pain. So as a result, um, study after study has shown that people with sickle cell disease experience longer wait times to see a physician and to get that first pain medicine when they uh, visit the emergency room. And then the number of physicians, particularly the number of physicians available to treat adults with sickle cell disease is, is very limited still. So the roots of these disparities uh, are in um, funding. And uh, what I'll talk about is how um, funding really, uh, not having adequate funding really hampers those moves uh, from the bench through to the place where uh, uh, treatment is available widely. So if we compare sickle cell disease with cystic fibrosis, there are about 100,000 people with sickle cell disease uh, in the US and about 30,000 people with cystic fibrosis that primarily affects um, whites. Um, so then we look at funding from the National Institutes of Health, and this analysis was published in 2020. It was done in 2018. So these are recent figures. So uh, you, see, you see a problem right here. Sickle cell disease gets less than half of the amount of funding compared with cystic fibrosis, even though it affects many more people. And then when we look at philanthropic funding, the disparity is even more stark so that uh, people with the cystic fibrosis population gets tremendously more philanthropic funding compared with those with sickle cell disease. So that the average funding per affected person um, is less than $1,000 for people with sickle cell disease and about $10,000 for people with cystic fibrosis. And what this leads to is um, what we faced over the last decades where um, sickle cell had only one disease modifying therapy for like 20 years, and then one or two more were added. There are more in the pipeline now, but it's still, again, a, a major problem. 
So again, these uh, disproportionate funding levels do lie in the system of structural racism in the US. Sickle cell disease was identified in Western medicine in 1910 and was coined the first molecular disease by Linus Pauling in 1949. But there were many discoveries and advancements that were associated with molecular medicine and, and really none, if limited, um, improved the quality of life and quality of care for people with sickle cell disease. So racism is a system that assigns value based on how an individual looks or the color of their skin. It unfairly advantages some and unfairly disadvantages others, but it hurts the health of everyone by preventing some people from attaining their highest level of health. And uh, racism can be intentional or not so that it can affect health in many ways from a, an individual provider's implicit bias to unfair policies, practices, and resource allocation, as you've seen with sickle cell disease. So the first holistic approach to improving sickle cell disease care uh, and, that, and that addresses this firmly rooted context of structural racism came with the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was founded on one of the campuses of the Vanioff Children's Hospital Oakland. At the time, it was Merrick College, Merrick Community College. And the pillars of the Black Panther Party included the health of the community, uh, and they adopted sickle cell disease as reflecting the unrecognized pain and suffering of the Black community. So their voices as activists, combined with the voices of Black community physicians, both here in the Bay Area, as well as across the United States, to ultimately pressure the federal government to put funding into sickle cell disease care and research. So the Sickle Cell Anemia Control Act was signed into law in 1972 and 10 comprehensive sickle cell centers that focused on research, clinical care, education and the community were established across the United States. So we were one of the first of those, oops, we were one of those first 10 uh, sickle cell centers. And it was a UCSF Cross Bay Collaborative, the Northern California Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center. Uh, Bert Lubin was the initial head and Elliot Paczynski assumed the leadership in 1978. And many of these, uh, the comprehensive sickle cell centers were established in pediatric programs and they were successful in that mortality in the pediatric years decreased by 3% um, per year. But Treatment of adults uh, was, is considered, was considered a community benefit program. And here in the Bay Area in 1999, the community hospital that was caring for adults with sickle cell disease abruptly closed. And the adult care was displaced to end up here at uh, Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland. So we have a lifespan uh, outpatient program, but it, it poses uh, complications for our, our adults because they can't be admitted here um, and go to the emergency room and uh, inpatient admissions in the community uh, where they face lack of knowledge about their care uh, as well as discrimination and stigmatization. We relied heavily on that funding from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, but the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute abruptly ceased funding for the comprehensive sickle cell centers in 2007. And, and we had again relied on that funding given that public funding still uh, is inadequate and access to care certainly remains inadequate. And so where things have improved for children due to newborn screening uh, advancements, mortality in adult years has increased every year since the 1970s. And of course, bias, discrimination and stigmatization are significant issues. So I'm gonna to turn to pain and sickle cell disease. Um, it is different from almost all other pain syndromes with its onset in infancy and exposure of individuals to opioids early on. And this and other reasons uh, lead to providers overestimating the risk of addiction for patients with sickle cell disease compared with other chronic pain syndromes in the absence of, of evidence to the contrary. And so as a result, individuals with sickle cell disease and their families consistently report that they're discriminated against, misbelieve and mistreated within the healthcare system. And sometimes this leads to people avoiding necessary care. 
So how do we mitigate some of these healthcare disparities? For clinicians, um, a, a, a philosophy can be to approach patients with sickle cell disease with the understanding that they want and deserve optimal pain relief and the best quality of life. And in the acute setting, it's important to listen to patients and respect their self-reports. There is only self-report that's available in terms of pain assessment. Outpatient, Providers should co-create pain plans based on trust and patient family-centered communication. And then uh, decisions about pain assessment need to be made based on the patient's history, not on looking at the patient and trying to decide how much pain you think they're in, but by listening to them, understanding, their, getting their understanding about what works for them and minimizing side effects. And the available guidelines do recommend individualized pain plans or sickle cell disease specific pain management protocols. And not only for providers, but for researchers as well, um, culture humility um, is an approach that can really change things for people with sickle cell disease. And cultural humility was first introduced again here at uh, Children's Hospital in Oakland by Melanie, Melanie Turvalon and Jan Murray Garcia. And it was distilled into these five R's. And so again, thinking as researchers about cultural humility, you know, what are the research questions that we choose to study? How do we choose to approach people who we are trying to enroll in clinical trials? If we use this approach, um, we might have um, success in partnership with the community. So first, uh, reflection. Approach every encounter with humility and understand that we can learn something from everyone. Respect. Treating every person with uh, respect and striving to preserve their dignity always. And so again, our young people, Brooklyn in the film talked about um, when they go to the emergency room, their dignity is not preserved when they're uh, labeled drug seekers, when uh, they have to um, change perhaps a stoic approach to their pain management in order to get the provider to pay attention to them. And so if we hold every person in highest regard uh, while being aware of our own unconscious biases, uh, that's an important third step. And understanding and expecting that cultural humility is relevant every, to every patient in every encounter and avoid that labeling of frequent flyers and sicklers. And then finally, resilience can be um, in fostered in all of us, not just uh, the people with sickle cell disease and families that we serve. Uh, because it can really enhance our own uh, globally focused compassion and our compassion with ourself. So uh, Dr. Walters alluded to this when he talked about the um, National uh, Academy of Science and Medicine uh, report, but there are national efforts as well. So re remember at the beginning, I really talked about the importance of holistic approaches. And so these national efforts are holistic. First, um, a sickle cell disease coalition, which is actually global, and again, represents multiple sectors from pharma to clinical to, to uh, uh, researchers, individuals with sickle cell disease, community-based organizations, and so on. Uh, and the Cure Sickle Cell uh, Initiative at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute um, is really focused on um, curing, but as well as understanding um, people with sickle cell disease. Um, again, the NASM report uh, is a provides a strategic plan and blueprint for action. And the Sickle Cell Disease Implementation Consortium is also funded by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And it's a consortium of eight centers around the country that look to lessen that gap between discovery and practice. And within California, we um, I can talk uh, proudly about an effective partnership that we put together. So in 2018, we brought together clinicians, again, researchers, people with sickle cell disease, their family members, experts in policy, epidemiologists. And this is all over the state of California. We came together, uh, about 50, 52 of us, uh, in Sacramento to discuss and craft a sickle cell action plan for the state of California. And uh, 
the highest uh, priority that was put forward was the need for better care for adults with sickle cell disease. Um, so we, over the course of a year, worked together in multiple meetings to complete our California Sickle Cell Action Plan. And then our colleagues uh, in Southern California introduced the Sickle Cell Action Plan to the assembly. Uh, it was approved without funding, but the amazing thing was that in the governor's budget, funding was allocated for this program called Networking California for Sickle Cell Care. And uh, so 10 new sickle cell programs for adult care have been established across California to this date over the last about two and a half years. Well, some existing programs have been strengthened with this funding and some um, new ones created. So we aren't out of the woods yet, but this is a great start. And we're hoping, hoping that this funding will be reallocated uh, for the next three years. And here at UCSF, um, we, our initial Northern California Comprehensive Sickle Cell Center was Cross Bay. And, you know, due to limited resources, uh, that was not sustained, but we're revitalizing it now. So in, in fiscal year 21, um, about 400, over 400 pediatric adult patients with sickle cell disease have been cared for. We've educated providers and community members. Um, we've specifically trained providers in strategies to mitigate implicit bias. And then our, the original pillars of the comprehensive sickle cell program are uh, a part of our priorities, clinical care, education and training, research, and community. And we've added a focus on health equity and inclusion and really continuing to address policy to ensure equitable access as well as disparities in patient experiences. And uh, another tool I'll leave you with is uh, the anti-racism framework. So currently our UCSF presidential chair is Dr. Kamara Jones. And she put forward this anti-racism framework when she was the president of the American Public Health Association. And she had been at the CDC as well. So she, the, the framework really, um, the first step is to acknowledge that racism exists and to understand that it is a system and it saps the strength of all. And as a system, we have to recognize and rectify historical injustices. And of course, sickle cell disease is a prime example of that. So resources need to be provided according to need. And as Dr. Walters uh, pointed out, while deploying curative therapies, we can't lose sight of, of the cost of those therapies, but we also need to make sure that we don't lose sight of the lack of access to quality care for so many people with sickle cell disease. And then within our UCSF system and within the US, we can act together to dismantle racism in structures and policies, as well as by taking personal responsibility. So I'm, I'm gonna close by pointing out that sickle cell disease is a rare disease in the US, but it is not a rare disease on the African continent. So uh, with un the 100,000 people in the U.S. affected by sickle cell disease, more than 300,000 babies are born with sickle cell disease every year in sub-Saharan Africa, and um, many will die before their fifth birthday. So an approach to addressing this, uh, the Human Hereditary and Health in Africa Consortium is an NIH Common Fund initiative. And so it's not just about research, but about um, improving care. Um, sickle cell isn't the only disease that they're focused on, but um, it's an important one given its common, com commonality on the African continent. And the other aspect of the Human Heredity and Health in Africa Consortium is the focus on improving capacity of researchers and clinicians on the African continent. And so a, a project that I co-led um, looked at was a partnership between uh, community elders, the healthcare system, clinicians, and local researchers, where we gathered perspectives of stakeholders. Uh, just like, again, Dr. Walters showed, it's important to look at what are people's views and opinions about um, 
uh, you know, treatments that we want to deploy. And, and we asked, uh, particularly in this case, about newborn screening, as well as about disease modifying therapies, and, and found similar barriers, uh, poverty, uh, distance from centers for care and research, um, and as well, the necessity of aligning interventions with cultural norms. So with that, I'd like to thank you, and I believe we'll be coming together for a panel discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Treadwell. Um, yes, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Walters back in and, uh, and again, open up to the floor, but I do have a few related questions that have kind of come in around this um, global um, situation as far as how, what's, one of the questions is about what the prevalence is um, of sickle cell disease in African Americans versus people from the African continent, um, and you know, and, and how that relates. Um, okay. And then, oh, and on top of that, no, and on top of that, it basically, I guess, what's being done to address the disparities in you know and diagnosis and treatments in in the african continent instead as well oh okay so uh, one in 12 african americans uh have a sickle cell trait um i think it's about one in is it 400 mark yep. <laughs> uh, uh, uh one in 400 african americans will have a, a child uh with sickle cell disease or that's the prevalence and then uh Hispanic ethnicity or Latinx populations in this country are uh, also uh, have a higher prevalence of sickle cell disease. And in, in California, there are about 9,000 people who have, um, who have been identified with sickle cell disease, not just on newborn screening, but through a CDC surveillance program. Um, and again, about 12% of those are Hispanic ethnicity or Latinx. So, um, on the African continent, this uh, Human Heredity and Health in Africa uh, consortium has a number of components. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, sickle cell, um, the, the initials are SPARCO, which I, I don't ever remember <laughs> acronyms, I'm sorry. But anyway, there's uh, a, um, a consortium that's focused on care. And uh, so they're developing uh, clinical practice guidelines. Um, they have started a registry and that's a big challenge in the US that we don't have a national registry. And so different countries in um, Africa are attempting to create uh, national registries. Um, and so, you know, it's, that's so important to know where people are and where they, you know, you should be deploying these um, uh, treatments. So um, that's one of the things. And again, the, the research uh, in terms of uh, actually a very big um, uh, grant from NIH uh, went to one of my colleagues, Solomon Ofori Akwa at the West African Genetics Medicine Center uh, to map uh, the genome related to sickle cell disease in West Africa. So, uh, so there are a number of initiatives that are happening across the African continent. Great. Um, I guess what is being done as far as, um, you know, is there a place for continuous monitoring diagnosis? Um, are there preventative measures that can be taken um, to moderate the disease as well? Do you want, <laughs> did you want to answer that, uh, Mark? Or should... no, I, was, I was looking at the question in the, in the chat about why are we focusing on on uh, curative therapies for this disease in the U.S. when mo most of the affected individuals don't don't live here at all? And and I think that's a it's a fair question. And um, and I I um, we we do spend a lot of time thinking about how how we could could um, adapt these curative therapies for, for application in Africa. A lot of it has to do with the high cost of the manufacturing. Uh, and, but there are ideas about how to use closed systems and automation to bring down that cost. And I think the cost of the reagents also will come down as these therapies get, get developed further. Um, but it, it all rests on having a foundation of, of registry and knowing where the patients are and, and making sure they have access to regular supportive care. So the, 
So that work that's being done now in partnership with some some U.S. groups like the Sparco that um, that the Marsha mentioned are, are are a precursor to that. So um, the reason why we're not talking about it today is that it's in a very nascent phase of development and in um, in application, but we haven't forgotten. Great. Again, going back to the question, is there is there a place where perhaps curative therapies aren't available, but there's some sort of, um, where does um, perhaps somewhere in between there having this kind of continuous monitoring of, of um, <clears throat> you know, uh, sickle cell disease state and is, are there any preventative measures that people could take dealing with the disease without a curative therapy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um... And it begins with newborn screening and making the diagnosis as soon as possible. Because um, with the advent of, of regular supportive care, that's um, uh, comprehensive care and education about the disease, using prophylactic antibiotics to prevent life-threatening infections, and understanding some of the signs and symptoms of the, of the more difficult complications that occur. Lifespan to age 20 is, in some states, um, the same as it is in those who don't inherit sickle cell disease. So, um, so that has been instituted and with disease modifying therapies that are coming online that were recently FDA approved, I, I suspect that will only, only get better. The challenge is what, what happens to adults and maybe, maybe Dr. Treadwell can amplify this better than I can, but, it, um, but, but in, in, in the current context, uh, many of our patients tend to disappear for lack of access to care, having competent physicians to deliver the care, um, being in places where cultural competency might or might not exist. And, and, and so um, how do we extend the successes in early childhood to lifespan? It's really, it's really the challenge for us, um, I think, in the next decade. And, and I'm going to pass the baton to Marshall on that one. Sure. Yeah. So uh, another disparity that I touched on, but is uh, pretty stark uh, within sickle cell disease is the age disparity. So, so again, there was a lot of success with newborn screening and with, um, you know, uh, screening for stroke and uh, prophylactic penicillin and so on for the new in the newborn period. But there is actually an increase in morbidity and mortality as individuals transition from pediatric to adult care. So the adolescent to young adult years is uh, an enormous challenge in terms of people uh, falling out of care and, um, uh, you know, again, use, uh, having over reliance on the emergency department because they don't have uh, individuals who are uh, providers who really know how to take care of them or who are, are willing to take care of them. Um, and again, then the uh, lifespan is, is still in, in the 40s in some places in the U.S., so or the late 40s. And, um, you know, that's pretty egregious that in, in the U.S. that um, a population is, is living that is falling that far short of, um, you know, national um, national, uh, life or lifespans. So, um, so yeah, the age disparities are, uh, pretty stark in sickle cell disease and it's just really important to, you know, there are, uh, self management strategies that people can be taught, but it's so important to have providers that, um, you know, are willing and able to take care of the young adults and the adults. And, um, you know, again, in response to the question of why even talk about sickle cell in the U.S., given that it's rare in the U.S., well, you know, the, the cost to people with sickle cell disease in the U.S. in terms of their quality of life and quality of care should not be ignored. Um, the impact of structural racism that people saw um, more starkly again with COVID-19 it's been there for sickle cell disease in the U.S. It needs to be corrected. And um, there do need to be uh, interventions on the African continent, but there need to be interventions right here in the U.S. to improve that. Yeah, absolutely. So Mark, I have a question for you on um, how the gene therapy approach complements other approaches like um, global blood therapeutic small molecule drug. Right, so 
So in the short term, the, the small, small molecule approach is, is safer, has immediate benefit for a lot of the persons who take it, but, but it's only effective if, if you take it every day and you have to take it for decades and decades. And, and, and that's the hallmark of a, of a chronic illness. It's only well managed as long as you manage it well, and, and then it falls apart. And you know the option of a one-time curative therapy, ideally delivered early in life, would accomplish a couple of things. First, you don't have to remember to take the pill every day because, um, because you've, you've completed the definitive therapy. And, and the second thing is that it, it should, if it's effective, prevent organ damage from accruing over time. So it should translate into a longer lifespan with, with better quality of life. So that's, that's really, uh, but, but um, you know, deciding to do a treatment that you could die of in the short term and, or that you could develop a, a life-threatening, if not fatal form of leukemia from is daunting. And so um, that's why it takes a lot of careful discussion and time to, to reach at the right decision. So the decision making is, is time consuming and, um, and and important and and that's what's kind of unique about this disorder I think uh, that 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 that's so important to accomplish. Thank you. And a follow up um, question on the um, kind of gene therapy approach is um, how could a another approach be um, in comparison of re-expressing a fetal hemoglobin. Yeah, so that's a, um, another idea that, that also has been enormously successful. So there, it, as it turns out, if the fetal hemoglobin, which is made before a baby's born in the womb, it, because it, it, it binds the oxygen more tightly than the adult hemoglobin, so it's a way to transfer oxygen from the maternal blood circulation to the fetal circulation, if that fetal hemoglobin persists, persists after birth for any of a number of reasons, some of, some of them are hereditary, that if it's co-inherited with sickle cell disease, it ameliorates the, 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 the severity of sickle cell disease. In fact, it makes it much more like sickle cell traits. So, so there's a way to manipulate the genome such that the, the fetal hemoglobin is turned back on. And there've been a couple of clinical trials that have shown a significant clinical benefit for persons with sickle cell disease have gone through that treatment. So that's, um, that's a complementary approach to what we're proposing. The difference is that if for any reason that fetal hemoglobin were to shut off again after that, after that modification, they still have sickle cell disease, so, so it would come back. Whereas in our approach, which we find advantageous, um, but it is an, you know, an alternative approach, the sickle mutation is permanently corrected. So, um, so those are the, an important difference between the two, but both appear to have uh, significant clinical benefit uh, in small numbers of patients that have been treated so far. Yeah, great. Well, we look forward to more data on that. Um, I have another question here. Um, is, is there a genetic difference seen in sub-Saharan Africa versus that seen in the U.S. of sickle cell disease? Well, I'm, I'm not a geneticist. I'm a psychologist. <laughs> Um, and I know that um, yeah, there, there definitely are differences. So for example, in Ghana, uh, there is a higher prevalence of SC disease uh, compared with SS. And uh, it also varies um, from country to country where you might see more SS or S beta zero or S beta plus. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm a psychologist, so I don't know, Mark, if you have <laughs> yeah, the only, uh, insight into that. Yeah, I, I really don't. I mean, the only the only um, literature I'm aware of has to do with um, there, there are uh, associations with the level of fetal hemoglobin again that's um, that's co-expressed with the sickle cell anemia that seems to follow regions in Africa. And it just depends on migration patterns and, and how genomes were established in those in those regions. Some are more severe than others. So the higher the F, the milder the disease. Um, and but in Central Africa. Uh, it has one of the most severe genotypes with very low fetal hemoglobin. So, but but that's all I can say about the difference between Africa and and U.S. Um, severity. And and most of the migration follows the pattern that was present in Africa. So was, there's nothing specific to um, uh, sickle cell disease in North America that I'm aware of. Our next question um, is. 
what was the level of off-target mutation in CRISPR stem cells? And is this a concern and how will it be dealt with? I'm assuming this is in addition to the insertion and deletion. Yeah, so the, the gene editing um, reagents are, are, are really efficient. So we get uh, targeting on, on target modifications in 80 to 90% of the of stem cells. So, and the ratio appears to be about uh, 60, 40, 60% indel or 50% indel 20 to 30% HDR. So, so, so what we're exploring now in our manufacturing protocols, how do, how do we change that ratio from more indels HDR to more equal numbers? Because that should make it safer and more effective. But, but that's a critical issue. And unfortunately our, our animal models are in vitro testing. None of them are, are sufficient or satisfactory in predicting what the clinical outcome might be when you balance those two, uh, one positive, one negative factor in. So I, I think until we get the clinical trial, we're, we're not gonna know how, how safe and effective this is ultimately, which is, kind of, which is scary because um, you'd like to have confidence going into clinical trial that, that it will be beneficial, but that's um, not always the case. So that's why we always build into to any clinical trial stopping rule. So if it looks like it's unsafe, we stop the trial, we go back to the drawing board and come up with a better approach. Right. So next question is some of the early CRISPR therapeutic approaches have focused on cycles that have focused on cycle cell. I've looked at um, is one of the more promising. What are, what are some of the, sorry, what are, reading this. Um, it's looked at as the most promising um, applications of this technology. What are some of the non-scientific challenges for this? I'm assuming a, a curative their CRISPR approach. Uh, uh, well, I, um, I don't know if this answers the question, but one thing we've, we've run into that's very interesting is that um, particularly in, in the adults with sickle cell disease that, that, that having that disorder is part of their identity. And, um, and, and they've learned how to cope and be resilient and, 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 and run their lives around this disease. And then if we've cured it and they're no longer uh, dealing with those facets of life, it's a part of their identity has shifted or even gone away. And there's really uh, can be a strong reaction to that because they, they're sickle cell disease warriors, right? This is, this is their identity. And, and, and we worry that we've seen that some cases we take away that identity. So, so that has to be considered and, and discussed and supported as they go through that transition because it can cause depression and um, other reactions that are untoward. I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. No, I, I'm not sure either. Yeah, not only respecting their decision, but you know, the support going forward if, if they do get a curative therapy. Yeah. Yeah, I can add to that a little bit as well, that um, there, the challenges for people psychologically, again, if that's the focus of the question, um, can be a survivor's guilt, because at, at this time, um, still the ac access to this is quite limited. And so people know that many of their, their peers or colleagues are, aren't going to have access to, um, to these uh, you know, trials and, and ultimate therapies. And then the impact on the family as well, um, so that they're, uh, no matter how much the, the trial, um, you know, supports individuals from a financial standpoint, they sometimes have to move away from their um, home and, and the family is living, you know, uh, in a family house, and, and, but they have to, you know, it's expensive, it, there's an expense to it. So, um, so those costs, uh, we, we just had a meeting recently with people with sickle cell disease who both had had um, uh, participated in gene therapy and others who uh, had not or and would not be able to as of now. And these were some of the things they brought up besides the identity, also isolation, depression, um, and then a financial cost that can be hidden. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things that were brought up. Yeah, makes sense. Um, another question here says, we have known of, genus, of the genes associated with sickle cell for decades. What are the barriers to finding a cure? I'm gonna add on top of that. I mean, I think all, you know, there's difficulties in, in curing all genetic diseases, but is there something specific about sickle cell that makes it most, more difficult? 
Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something we grapple with all the time. And we have, I mean, we have a cure. You know, we have a bone marrow transplant, mm -hmm. but it's arduous, it's risky. Uh, you could die of the bone marrow transplant. So what, what we really need is that, that slide that I showed with the ideal cell therapy profile, that's safe, effective, available to everybody, and effective in adults and children. And we, we just aren't there. So, so why aren't we there? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. And, and uh, some of it's for all the reasons that, that Marsha alluded to in her talk and some of it has to do with where we are with advancing the science technology. The, the CRISPR technology is exciting because it's so efficient and potentially um, inexpensive. So that's, that's kind of where we are. I hope it'll go faster in the future, but um, it's a fair question. Why don't we have a cure for everybody? Um, it's uh, weighs heavy on us. I think that that is our questions that have come from the audience. I'd like to, you know, take this moment to have you um, say any closing remarks, any um, thoughts of where, you know, people can take action or any words of hope. I, thanks for having me. That's all, that's all I have to add. <laughs> Um, well, I'll say um, words of hope again in this uh, meeting that uh, we had at the beginning of uh, 2022. Um, the individuals who had gone through um, uh, the the gene um, clinical gene therapy clinical trials, they they did talk about the challenges, uh, like the pain didn't go away right away, and um, they had to plan uh, for. Um, uh, having children later, they had to plan in advance. Um, but every single one of them said they would do it again. So, and, they, and it was more than it was quite a few people there. And every single one said they would definitely do it again, that uh, they grappled with the identity, you know, the hidden financial costs for their families and so on. But uh, they, they definitely said this is hope for people with sickle cell disease. And they embraced that for their own lives and their own futures. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to both uh, Dr. Treadwell and uh, Dr. Walters for joining us and discussing sickle cell disease. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. And I will now turn it over to my colleague, uh, Nate Prorock. Great. Thank you very much, Jenny. And thank you to both Dr. Treadwell and Dr. Walters for shedding fantastic light on the sickle cell disease. All right, now for our next speaker. Amrit Ray is a globally experienced industry leader, physician researcher, and biopharmaceuticals expert. His passion is advancing medical breakthroughs and championing healthcare access for patients. Dr. Ray has served as global president of R&D at Pfizer, as chief medical officer at Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals, and was part of the executive leadership team at Pfizer Upjohn, overseeing all aspects of R&D worldwide and was the company's most senior decision maker on patient matters. He has led large and diverse teams to advance pipelines and access for innovative medicines in oncology, neuroscience, and cardiometabolism. Dr. Ray is currently Chief Patient Officer at Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, and his presentation today is titled Defining a New Future for People with Rare Diseases. Welcome, Dr. Ray. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And um, let me just say good afternoon to everyone. I am uh, on the East Coast, so already getting into evening here. And um, I am uh, thrilled to be part of this discussion. I've had the chance to listen to a lot of the great speakers. I've had a chance to uh, enjoy uh, some of the music from our um, lunchtime performance. And I'm also very conscious that uh, we have been through hundreds of slides today. And for that reason, uh, I think it would be helpful if we uh, ended this uh, conference with a conversation. I am gonna offer a few remarks and then uh, we'll absolutely allow time for questions and answers. So let me just begin by saying uh, thank you very much to 
uh, UCSF and to the Catalyst Program. Thanks to Dr. Hart. And uh, thank you also to uh, Foundation Ibsen for the incredible work that has been done on diagnosing, on treating, and on highlighting the needs of uh, patients with rare diseases. I'd like to give a special thanks to um, Dr. Levine, who I've had the privilege of learning from for the last uh, three decades and uh, continue to do so each time we have the opportunity to interact. So uh, as Nate said, I have the privilege of serving as Chief Patient Officer at Biohaven. Uh, Biohaven is a commercial state pharmaceutical company that is involved in neuroinnovation. It is focused on neurological diseases and neuropsychiatric diseases. Um, I also so you have the privilege of wearing uh, a number of other hats. Uh, I'm a physician researcher. Uh, I also serve as uh, a rare advocate and serve on the board of the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases and a lot of the policy shaping work that they do. Uh, I'm also a rare parent. So I hope as we wrap up this meeting, I can give you uh, a few different perspectives from these different parents. Now, um, to begin, I would just like to offer uh, a little bit of a taking stock because we've heard lots of different perspectives throughout the day and I'd like to bring them all together to say where are we because I think that that deeply informs how we go forward and then I'd like to offer three suggestions on the roadmap for the future and three principles that I think can help to guide us to making the most impact for rare patients and rare families in the future. So where are we today? We've heard a lot of facts and figures. We've heard a lot of different perspectives on the human toll, the public health toll, the financial toll. And when we step back from all of that, the way that I would summarize all of that is to say that today we have a public health crisis in rare diseases. If you look at the facts and figures, it is startling. And just to pick a few that uh, some have been mentioned in the day, some are available in the media and in public domain. Uh, but if you string them all together, it is quite startling. The current uh, incidence and current prevalence add up to one in 10 Americans being afflicted with rare disease. So 25 to 30 million Americans, 400 million patients worldwide being afflicted with rare diseases. And just to put that in perspective, if you look in the United States, that is more than cancer, that is more than uh, HIV put together. Okay. So rare turns out not to be so rare. And when you look at uh, the, the prevalence a little further, half of those instances are in children. And of the children, when you step back and look at some of the um, very difficult data to see, what we see is that three of 10 of children afflicted with rare diseases do not make it to their fifth birthdays. Okay. Now, beyond that, you have a situation where uh, if you look at some of the recent studies on the burden of rare diseases, you can see that the cost in the United States, in a recent publication that was supported by the Every Life Foundation, the cost exceeds a trillion dollars. Okay. And 60% of that burden is borne by families when you start thinking through the direct and indirect costs of that. So uh, from all perspectives, we have a public health crisis. Now, despite all of that, uh, for more than 95% of rare diseases today, the 7,000 plus rare diseases today, we do not have a single approved FDA therapy. Staggering facts, but that is why we must come together. And that is why I think all of us are at this conference, and that is why I think we must all work together as we go forward. I'm actually very thankful to be with a community of people who are uh, eager to share their knowledge, to learn from each other, and to participate in shaping the future. So with that said, and with that context setting, 
let me move to the roadmap for the future. Uh, we've heard some terrific specifics in the course of the day. Uh, I've been taking a lot of notes, uh, a lot of learning from uh, esteemed, very distinguished speakers. Um, but I'd like to focus on three things that I think are uh, not specific to any particular rare disease, but are overarching principles that will be helpful as we navigate the, the, uh, the next few years across all rare diseases. Let me begin with the first pillar, which relates to continuing to open doors to research. Now, this is something which, as a drug developer, when you look at rare diseases, can initially be very daunting because of the limited patient numbers, because of the typical statistical and operational challenges that we encounter in clinical trials. It can be um, quite challenging to think through how to study rare diseases, but there's been a lot of work on the science of small trials, um, uh, a lot of uh, effort put into how can we open the doors. And I'd like to highlight a few best practices that I've seen that I think could be very impactful, again, going across the wide range of rare diseases. The first thing is to be uh, very deliberate about uh, identifying patients. And we heard some uh, great efforts today. Uh, we've uh, heard some comments on newborn screening. We've heard a lot of good feedback on that. But I think that has to be a very deliberate process in reaching out to patients, engaging them very often in partnership with uh, patient advocacy groups to alert them and engage them in the clinical trials process. The second is also to think very deliberately about enrollment criteria. Um, this is an area where it's very easy to be a conservative, it's very easy to be um, uh, quite restrictive inadvertently, but uh, it's also an area where if we're thoughtful, we can make some uh, specific, quite deliberate changes that open the doors to much wider groups of patients. A third um, area in terms of opening the doors relates to uh, taking advantage of decentralized trials. And this is, a, this is something which uh, has become very current in recent months because of the pandemic. Uh, as some of you have seen, many of the trials that were conducted during the pandemic were forced to use decentralized and virtual technologies and many different stages of trial conduct. And in fact, that has turned out to be a very positive trend. Um, the pandemic has brought us to a place where I was looking uh, recently at some of the uh, feedback on some of the some, some of the analysis sorry on um, trials planned for 2022 uh, global data had published and there are 1300 trials that are planned for 2022 that are using decentralized or virtual technologies in order to increase trial reach and to affect trial conduct now to put that in perspective that's about 28 uh, percent more than the number of trials that were using decentralized technologies just a year ago. And I hope that that isn't a transient blip during the pandemic, but that's something that can be enduring and that we can use to take forward. A fourth area that I think has been uh, very uh, practical and been very impactful can on the surface seem small, but turns out to be large in real life is the use of patient concierge services. And using concierge services, which make trials that are often uh, difficult to access, difficult to reach, uh, not all steps of the trial can be undertaken virtually, but makes these trials accessible and reachable. And to give you an example, you know, we were looking at some of uh, Biohaven's work recently in our spinal cerebellar ataxia trials and looked at the phase two, phase three studies and took a very simple step of rather than having patients come into trial centers for um, uh, the, the taking of specimens and samples, we put in place a team of mobile phlebotomists, uh, nurses that could go out and uh, take samples at the patient's home. Now that may seem a very small step, but in real life, um, that can be the difference between being able to participate practically or not the hours drive, the mobility, the reaching uh, a clinical trial site safely. 
taking all of those things off the table and actually making something uh, reachable for patients. And I hope that that's just one example. There are many, many hundreds of others, but I hope that's something that we as trialists can be very deliberate about as we go forward. Finally, uh, the, the other thing that I think has been quite illuminating about the last several months has been with respect to um, how decentralized trials impact minority populations. And I'd just like to read you all um, a quotation from, um, from uh, the president of the Black Women's Health Imperative, which is Linda Gola Blount. She says, African Americans and Latinos die disproportionately from rare diseases. Blacks have higher death rates than whites for 12 of the 15 leading causes of death in the United States and almost all rare diseases. This is important in the context of decentralized trials because some of the publications just in the last two to three months have been prominent publications in JAMA, in the New England Journal of Medicine, about the impact of decentralized trials and specifically how decentralized trials have increased the accessibility of trial participation to minority populations. So um, we have some great possibilities there. And that's just a, a very quick summary, but I hope that gives uh, some examples of the steps that we can take to open the doors to more patients to participate in the research process. That's the first point. The second pillar that uh, I would like to suggest relates to standing up together. Now, to change the status quo, uh, we live in a complex environment and it's very clear that uh, we will have to come together as disparate, sometimes competing stakeholders in some forums. But to give an example of that, um, if you look at you know, one, some of the stakeholders that we've had today, uh, I really have to you know, uh, applaud the Catalyst Program for bringing together such a, a diverse group of different voices. We often see the FDA having you know, very thoughtful perspectives on patient-focused drug development and others drawing many others in. It was the same for the NIH. It's wonderful to see that. Uh, thank you to Dr. Irv at the beginning. And uh, we've seen patient groups you know, a third group, a lot of large industry and small industry, neither academic and research groups, scientific and academic societies, and also philanthropic groups. And that's probably not a complete list, but you have there a lot of stakeholders that need to come together. And I think that we need to be very deliberate about finding forums and always asking ourselves, you know, um, could I do this more quickly? Could I do this more effectively? You know, could we make a greater impact if we were able to come together and collaborate? Um, it's almost like a twist on the age-old proverb about uh, going fast alone versus going far together. I think for rare diseases, we need fast and far. And uh, I think together increases the chances of that actually for rare diseases. I want to just leave you with one example of that that I think has been a very positive light and I'd really like to encourage as a pillar for the future. That example relates to master protocols. You know, if you look in oncology, uh, master protocols have been in place for over a decade with some of the early iSPY trials being um, initiated in uh, 2010. For rare diseases, that has come much later. And just for uh, just to explain in simple terms, in case anyone is not familiar, we typically conduct clinical trials in a linear, longitudinal fashion. What master protocols do is try to bring together multiple agents, typically, into one protocol. So it can often involve many sponsors, and master protocols take various different forms you can have uh, platform trials or uh, umbrella trials, basket trials, but they try to bring together typically multiple uh, investigational agents and sometimes multiple indications. The impact of master trials, though, can be very significant. 
Um, some of the data reading out from the oncology master protocols that have been deployed over recent years have shown that um, there can be quite a significant reduction in cost, 12 to 15 percent, uh, reductions in timeline, 15 to 18 percent, and then um, reductions in risk, uh, which affect the ability to invest in protocols too. So that, that's a very simplified version, but if you look at some of the results, uh, it is intriguing and I think it presents great potential. In rare disease, we've started to see master protocols being deployed more. Uh, some of the early, um, early protocols just in the last couple of years, one of, I mean, in, in my own case, one of um, Biohaven's protocols for uh, Veridiperstat, which is an ALS investigational agent, uh, was introduced into uh, a master protocol that was being led by uh, the Healy and AMG Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. It kicked off last year. And um, I think, you know, it takes courage to participate in a master protocol, but it is very often the best way to meet patients' needs. So um, that's something that I think holds a lot of potential for the future. Final pillar. Um, the final pillar, I think, uh, is something that relates to being very deliberate about uh, building transparency and trust. And to comment on this, I'd like to step back a little bit from rare diseases and say that you know, many of the people uh, it, at this summit, uh, many of the people who are participating in rare diseases are scientists. Okay? We've talked about the multiple stakeholders, but uh, one of the, the macro trends that we've seen in society in the last several months has related to trust in science. And despite the vaccine, despite, you know, hopefully it's all pulling out of the pandemic, unfortunately a decline in the trust in science. And um, for those of you who track these things, some of the uh, Pew Trust, for example, readings from the last few months in February of this year, the trust of the public in medical scientists to do what is right for the public. Okay? The trust was at a level of 29%. Okay? Now that sounds low, but if you put that in the context of where it was last November, it was at 40%. So it's not only that it is unacceptably low, but that it has fallen even in recent months as vaccines and the pandemic have made such a positive impact in society. And I raise that because for the rare disease population in particular, um, I think we have to see the connection between public trust and public policy. And public policy has a very disproportionate effect on rare diseases because of the numerous steps of the, the um, process that we have all talked about today. We're starting with newborn screening and public policies in that arena, uh, also relating to accelerated approval and the policy in that area, also related to access, reimbursement, and the policy in that area. So across the spectrum, the importance of public trust is extremely high. And I raise that because there are many steps that all of us in the rare disease process can take. Um, depending on which hat one wears, it could relate to you know, trial integrity or publications or uh, independent scientific decision making or uh, transparency in communicating you know, information to the public, uh, whatever it may be. But I think all of us have to step back and say that we have a responsibility not only in the particular rare disease that we are working in, and not only in the rare disease community at large, but also in the science community at large. And that responsibility is one where we, you know, we have made tremendous advancements in science, some advancements in social values, but the moral values and the ethical perspective that is something that I think in the rare community, we have to stand up and take leadership on. So um, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much for the chance to share some reflections uh, after so many distinguished speakers. Um, those three pillars are valuable as we pave the roadmap for the future. And the, the 
possibilities of science are boundless. And we've seen that through some incredible examples today. Uh, we, I'm sure we'll continue seeing that. But the roadmap only works if we keep patients absolutely at the center of everything that we do. And I think all of us are the uh, dreams. Uh, but, you know, the future is shaped not only by the dreamers, but uh, by the people with the courage to act. So uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some reflections. And uh, I look forward very much to collaborating and acting together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. That was fantastic. I, I really appreciate the three different pillars that you shared with us. Continuing to open doors to research, standing up together, and building transparency and trust. So for those who are still on the call, feel free to drop any questions that you have for Dr. Ray in the Q&A. And while people are putting their questions in, you know, there's, when I was listening to your words, they came off as, you know, incredibly positive and optimistic, which I certainly really appreciated when there's all these, you know, staggering facts and figures as a view, as you acknowledge, you know, from, you know, the new diseases that are discovered every year to the relative small amount of approvals that we have every year, the regulatory hurdles, the financial burdens, and all those hurdles. So if, if I am assuming this correctly, that you do share a spark of optimism, um, please, if you wouldn't mind chiming in a little bit on the case for optimism in the rare disease space. Well, uh, thank you. First, Nate, thank you. I mean, I, I listened very carefully to many of the presentations today. Uh, they're humbling. Um, there is a tremendous amount to learn. But I think, um, you know, when you step back and go into the real world, the, the figures can be startling. Okay? The figures can, if you start comparing, you know, disease by disease, um, they can appear pessimistic. But when I look at the reasons for optimism, it usually comes from uh, a few sources. Um, one is, um, I just look in my own lifetime, uh, the breakthroughs that have happened. Okay, and I look at that in you know, disease after disease and you know, population after population. And, um, you know, when I, when I look at that, you know, it, it's easy to actually put the numbers behind you and just look at the impact at a very human level. Um, that I always find to be extremely inspiring. The second thing that I found to be you know, incredibly inspiring is that uh, when we put together uh, opportunities to collaborate, like this summit, okay, when we put together you know, a Rare Disease Week, the Every Life Foundation puts together in Washington DC every year. You go there, you are able to see, you know, the sheer strength of spirit that exists. And for me, um, that is what takes us forward. You know, being in a community together, uh, being, uh, being clear that we have the power to shape the future together. So uh, I'm always lifted up by, um, seeing rare advocates, seeing rare families, seeing rare patients, and seeing what's possible. Yeah, that's great. That spark, that spirit is very compelling. Can you speak for a moment to the methodology to internationalize this challenge? For example, how do we do something like a massive internal databases that would be shared and transparent across, across the industries uh, and academia, governments even? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, um, we, we have shared uh, some of the steps that have been taken, you know, in the US and have uh, focused on that in legislation, in clinical trials methodology. Um, but uh, the positive news here is that many of those steps are also being emulated around the world. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Um, in Europe, uh, conditional approvals have actually been in place for uh, 
quite a, a long time and have been implemented in a number of different therapeutic areas, including, including in rare diseases. And um, that has been, I think, a very positive step. Uh, more interesting, though, recently, if you look in China, where there are you know 1.4 billion people, so mathematically we can uh, we can do some of the epidemiology and what that translates to in rare diseases. In 2019, China published their first national level rare disease list, and this was a list of um, if I recall it was 121 conditions that were highlighted for accelerated regulatory approval and for reimbursement to support access. It was a very positive step. And in 2022, um, the, um, the, the Chinese list is being updated to reflect uh, you know, uh, more current prevalence numbers, more current uh, conditions that have been highlighted. And my sense is that uh, that list will only grow with time. So whether it is in you know, North America or Europe or Asia, what we're seeing is more commonality in policies. And that also leads you know, to the last part of your question on data sharing, a lot of opportunities to share, for example, baseline data, prevalence data, control data. You know, uh, some of the real world evidence studies in place are using synthetic controls. Those synthetic controls often rely on uh, published data or background data. And what is happening uh, is that you know that data is becoming more available as regulators encourage you know, rare disease research globally. So um, positive trends, not there yet, but uh, certainly positive trends. Yeah, we're we're definitely getting there, and you know we like to think that events like this, talks like yours, really help us to get there. With as you said, keeping the patient at the center of all this. I also really appreciated that thought. And we heard music earlier today. How do patients best make their voices heard? That's a great question. I enjoyed the music too. And uh, I think that um, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities for patients now that um, I think we can also play a very important role in supporting. So um, patients, very, I think, you know, if you look at a number of the groups that have spoken today, they're uh, incredibly thoughtful, welcoming, inclusive groups, uh, patient advocacy groups. And I think participating in a patient advocacy group is a very uh, natural step. I think it's a, a step which can bring a lot of um, mutual positive to both the community and to um, the participant. But what's also been interesting as well is um, seeing the rise of uh, patient voices in social media. And I particularly have been very impressed by that to see that there are uh, forums, you know, uh, like the Mighty or, uh, you know, a number of the, the typical uh, social media platforms that we use that have very dedicated groups that offer patients a channel to communicate their experiences, communicate their suggestions, uh, share knowledge with each other and broad education with the public. And I think that I think that's very positive. It gives a voice to the unheard in many ways. And um, I think our role very often is to um, you know, not let that voice go unreciprocated, but to chime in, you know, to comment and uh, you know add your own thoughts so that it is more of a dialogue than a monologue. Um, so I, I I think that that's something we can very easily do. Uh, it creates a very net positive effect. Yeah, that's great. Once again, on behalf of the Catalyst Program, behalf of UCSF, Foundation Ibsen, and this Rare Disease Symposium, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your thoughts, for being in conversation with me, and for all of your great contributions to society on behalf of patients and their families with rare diseases. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. All right, now I will be passing on to Charles Hart for some concluding remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Nate. And like you just said, 
on behalf of UCSF and the UCSF Kettles program. I want to thank um, all the speakers, you know, the, the scientists and the um, company founders and physician psychologists and the patients as well, whose um, stories we heard. And um, it was, really was a very informative and, you know, moving experience for me today, listening to a lot of the talks and just thinking about the, the situation of the parents and the caregivers and the, the patients themselves. I also want to thank the Catalyst program, um, Nate and Rupa and Jenny, for everything they've done to pull this together today. And finally, I too want to thank uh, Foundation Ipsen for their sponsorship of today's uh, event. And I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Jim Levine, the president of Foundation Ipsen. So take it over, Jim. Well, um, um, this has just um, been a fantastic day, um, spanning the, the voice of the patient all the way through science, through clinical research, through entrepreneurship, to futurism. And um, what's clear to me is that there are hundreds of millions of patients whose voices need to be heard. And I think events like this that will be um, broken down and distributed through social media channels to hundreds of millions of people, uh, through to tens of millions of people, these kind of events make a difference in the sense that we can't do anything that we don't know about. And so putting the patient at the center of the village is the key. And I think through collaborative international action will help. So on behalf of Foundation Ibsen, thank you to everybody. And with that, I'll close the meeting. <laughs>